Good morning. Welcome to KGUA in Wallala 88.3 FM. We are streaming online at kgua.org and we are live on YouTube today because today is a special day. We are bringing you programming that we have been working on for over eight a long time, many months. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today. This is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. And we have several guests today who are going to uh, be joining us from around the country. This is being brought to you by the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study, Scott and Tree Mercer. And this is going to be broadcast again at Later this uh, afternoon, too, we're going from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And we have up as our first guest, the board chair at the Center for Whale Research and board president of Orca Network, Howard Garrett. And Howard grew up in Northern California. He studied sociology at the University of New Mexico and UC Berkeley before graduating from Colorado College. In 1995, he helped launch a campaign to return the captive southern resident Orca Tokatai to her native habitat in the Salish Sea. His primary focus is the sophisticated cultural capabilities demonstrated by Orcanus Orca. In 1980, his brother Ken Balcom invited Howard to assist with his Orca survey photo ID research on San Juan Island. From his first encounters with orcas, he knew he had found his life's work. In the summer of 2022, he joined the Center for Whale Research as VP, then became board chair when his brother Ken, who was the founder and senior scientist, passed away that December. Fortunately, his brother left him with a skilled, experienced, and committed team of professionals who know what is required to maintain and build on the Center for Whale Research's 47-year foundation. Thank you for joining us today, Howard, and uh, welcome to the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. Thank you, Leanne. I'm honored to be invited back to the Ocean Life Symposium. Uh, today, I'd like to uh, talk about Toki, Tokitai. Uh, she, uh, unexpectedly passed away uh, August 18th uh, and her life tells us a lot and even the events surrounding her sudden death mm -hmm. uh, tell us a lot about orcas so she's sort of a window into the species or sinus orca uh, so with that uh, shall I commence to screen share and uh, begin the show that would be great, Howie. I just want to let our listeners know, too, that we're going to be today talking about whales like the North Atlantic right whales, Dungeness crab entanglement efforts, reducing ship strikes, crabs on the move, uh, and the longest running shore-based citizen science gray whale project in the world. And of course, now we're excited to see your presentation. So take it away, Howie. Okay. Um Somehow the button that says optimize for video clip will not check. So I hope it's okay. Uh, but anyway, I will. And everybody, this. we are live on YouTube so you can see this presentation. Thanks for listening to KJ. Hide floating meeting controls. And there we are. Do we have the portrait of Toki in front of us? You do. I hope it is that far. Okay. Uh, all systems up and running, I hope. Well, this is my favorite photo of Toki, one of my favorites anyway, because she's eagerly looking for oh, companionship. Oh, okay. That really, that just, are we hearing other voices? Okay. Okay, I'm so sorry. Okay. I'm not sure what the other voices are. I guess we're okay. <laughs> All right. Um, this is Toki, and this to me illustrates how she always seemed to want to 
to reach out, to engage, to become involved, to interact with someone. It may be playful. It may be just uh, time, quality time together. But she always seemed to want to to interact and be a part of the social setting of, of whatever is going on around her. So that's why this photo uh, makes a lot of sense to me. And this was her life most of the time, at least in the first 10 years, when she was there with uh, her tank mate Hugo, also captured from the Southern resident community. So they were uh, related in some way in the same clan. Uh, and that's Dr. White inspecting the stitches from when he stitched back Hugo's rostrum, the tip of his rostrum, because he had banged through a five inch thick plexiglass window and broke it and drained half the pool and cut the front of his rostrum off. So Dr. White had to go in and uh, stitch it back on and uh, the stitches did hold but Hugo died of a brain aneurysm shortly after that, leaving Toki, as everybody called her, as that's the name she she hears and goes by, uh, to live out her life in that little pool. And that's it. 80 feet by 35 feet to the trainer's island there. And then another 20 feet back. Uh, and it's only 20 feet deep in the deepest part, it's a bathtub shaped pool. Uh, and she was over 20 feet long and then 12 feet deep back in the back. It was only 18 feet in the first 10 years or so that she was in there. And then they beefed up the walls a little bit and uh, added two more feet to make it at least 20 feet. But that was her entire environment for 53 years from 1970 when she was captured and we don't need to go into the details of the brutal capture and until uh, she passed away August 18th, that was her entire environment. So things started to happen. Uh, it really was in the doldrums until August of 2021. Uh, we did everything we could, we demonstrated, We we got media, we, we did every way that we knew how to draw attention to her and to make the case, the biological case, that she would thrive back in her native habitat, that she could be returned. And that was, was true until almost the day she died. So this uh, big company based in Mexico that owns uh, many other parks, I think 23 other dolphinariums, but no orcas, uh, bought the sequarium, or they announced that they were buying the sequarium in August of 2021. And shortly thereafter, this report was released from the USDA talking about the terrible conditions there, the really poor care, as if there was just no management. It was just kind of a, of a, a uh, anarchist, uh, everybody do what you want, and nobody was in control. So uh, the people that were supposed to take care of her were not doing a very good job, giving her poor fish, and the place stank, and you couldn't see the bottom, and, and uh, it just sounded really horrible. And that prompted uh, some help to come to at least fund improvements to her pool. Uh, and that was uh, Pritam Singh, a wealthy benefactor from South Florida. Uh, and he announced, along with the mayor of Miami-Dade County, because the property is on, on land owned by the county, uh, and Charles Vinnick, who is uh, director of the Whale Sanctuary Project. And they announced that uh, he would put a million dollars on the table right then to start making improvements to the pool. And uh, there was Mayor Kava having a moment, a quality moment with Toki. Again, she reaches out and touches people silently, but somehow effectively with her eyes, uh, maybe brain waves. I don't know, but people just seem drawn into her when she comes to you to, to have a moment with you. 
she really does connect with people. It's amazing how people and, and a wide range of people who have had these experiences have told me that she, uh, she seems to understand you. She seems to look right into your heart and soul when she looks at you. It's, it's amazing how that uh, seems to affect people. So this was the team that gathered in early 2023, actually. Uh, the owner of the park, Eduardo Albor, the commissioner for that district, Raquel Regalado, uh, Charles Vinick, the uh, uh, director of Whale well, Sanctuary Project, but also a member of the board of uh, the Friends of Toki, which was formed by Pritam Singh and then Mayor Kava, and then Jim Ursay, who is the owner of the Indianapolis Colts, who stepped up in January to begin with of 2023 and said, uh, she's going home and I'm going to foot the bill. And uh, he had about three and a half billion dollars in the bank. So he was able to do that and say right up front that he'll spend 20 million to get her home if that's what it takes and probably more. And Pritam Singh and on the right is Raynell Morris, Squilehila in her Lummi name, who was on the board and was a tremendous and really uh, kind of a, a overwhelming transcendental influence because she brought tribal culture. She brought heritage, tradition, and knowledge of Toki as a family member, as, as a relative who she and her tribe, the Lummi tribe, were, were dedicated, had a sacred obligation to return Toki to her native waters, to rejoin her family. So she was a powerful, powerful influence on the board. And she brought her traditions to the board and to the whole campaign and let people know that Toki was a person. The name of orcas in the Lummi language is Kweltomachin, which means the people who live under the waves. So that's how they viewed them. And when you think about it, for thousands and thousands of years, the Lummi people and all the indigenous coastal Salish peoples traveled by canoe on these waters. And they would meet up with those orcas, with the Southern residents, with the ancestors of the Southern resident community on the water. And they developed relationships and they got to know each other for generations. As they grew up, they would understand each other as people. And that was interwoven into the traditions and the beliefs of the Southern residents. And that's what Raynell Morris brought to the table uh, at the Friends of Toki. And she went to see Toki several times and uh, sang to her and drummed to her and interacted with her and, and uh, made that connection. And I think that had a tremendously positive effect on Toki herself as well as all of us. So in March of 2022, to back up a little bit, the USDA granted a license to the Dolphin Company, but excluding the Whale Stadium. This was unprecedented that they, they licensed the park, all the other dolphin shows and the sea lions and everything else in the park, but not the Whale Stadium or the Whale. Toki in there, or the Pacific white-sided dolphin named Lee, who is also in the uh, whale bowl with Toki. So they were outside the realm of the USDA and the Animal Welfare Act. They were basically just being warehoused without any government oversight in the park, starting in March of 2022. So now I'd like to take just a little detour into ORCA 101, just to give us a little bit of appreciation for what kind of an animal she was. 
and what orcas are in general, uh, because this is this is about her as well as every other orca. And that is they've got these huge brains, basketball sized brains, five times the size of ours with dramatic jurification, which is an indication of brain activity. And you know, whales don't sleep. They have to stay awake 24 hours a day uh, because they have to breathe. So they have to rise up to breathe. So they're at least partially awake all the time. And those brains are at work. And they have this extra lobe, the paralimbic lobe, that humans don't have or don't have uh, developed in any sense. But it is thought to help to control thoughts and judgment and empathy and awareness and memory and emotions and language, real high order capabilities. Uh, and of course, she had all of those capabilities and demonstrated them. And that paralimbic lobe is unique in odontocetes. And this is the manifestation of those incredible cognitive capabilities is culture in whales and dolphins. I can't believe this paper is now 22 years old, uh, but I still quote it often because that quote, the complex and stable vocal and behavioral cultures of sympatric groups of killer whales or sinus orca appear to have no parallel outside humans and represent an independent evolution of cultural faculties. The strongest evidence lies in the vocal dialects of resident pods. And when an animal has that capacity for culture to that degree to develop these very intricate, complex cultural traditions that each individual in the culture is, is bound to and, and obeys basically, uh, you know, uh, conforms to the prescribed behavior, then they become different. You know, just like humans have that capability and you can see how weird and wonderful and strange and horrific and, and unusual uh, human cultures can be. And that same capability is present in orca cultures. They can be anything and do anything. And so we see however many cultural communities there are, a couple of dozen, we don't know, uh, 30 or 40, 50, we haven't uh, gotten a good uh, overview of all of the cultures. We're still finding orcas around the world that we don't know where they come from. Uh, so there are many, many cultural communities of orcas around the world, and each one is completely different. And that is who Toki is. She's a member of the Southern Resident Orca community. That's how she was born and raised brought up to learn how to be an orca by her family, her Southern resident elders. And this is where they grew up. This is the habitat, the primary habitat. Yes, K and L pods have gone down to Monterey, California, and they do go up as far as Ketchikan, Alaska and Southeast, but uh, their primary habitat is right here in the inland waters of Washington State. That's called the Salish Sea. And that's how it looks on a, a day when you can see the surface when it's not foggy and rainy. Uh, so this, this was her essential habitat right there. So now to bring us back to her story. Uh, on March 30, 2023, this historic deal was announced. It was never actually shown. We never saw what the deal was exactly, but the publicity said that it was an agreement by the Dolphin Company, which still owned her right up through her death, uh, and the Friends of Toki. And it was basically a deal to take care of Toki, to bring in people, to um, add 
filters to the water and chillers to the water to improve the, the quality of the water, the quality of her care, of her feeding, her medical care. She had five veterinarians, uh, maybe six veterinarians. Uh, she had a complete staff uh, of people who really cared about her uh, increasingly, but not until really early 2023. And then this deal was announced to sort of formalize that, but we don't really know all of the details of the deal. And it generated a lot of publicity. Suddenly, everybody in the world was hearing that Tokyo was coming home. Beloved Orca will return to, well, not really Seattle, to the Sailor Sea after performing for not really 50, but 53 years. So she was uh, going, going to come home. Everybody heard it. The word was out that she was definitely coming home. And this was a man who was going to make it happen, Jim Ursay. He posted in back in July, he posted these photos uh, that showed the location. And it doesn't say the location, but from around here, we know roughly where that was. It's an island on the east side of the San Juan Islands. And it was a perfect little location. And this other photo that he took when he was at the Sequarium, apparently. Uh, so he guaranteed it. So we had the care staff, we had the, the funding, everything was in place. So how was her health? Well, here is an indication of her health. This is Dr. Tom Reederson, who had a long career at SeaWorld in San Diego, keeping all of those orcas healthy. He was known as, as just about the best orca doctor in the business. And then he started his own consulting firm and was hired to watch over Toki. So here is the senior veterinarian talking about Toki. I've had the pleasure of working with five of the veterinarians with Toki over the past two years. Three are with Miami Sea Aquarium, two with friends of, friends of Toki. We've had our ups and downs. She was quite sick in October of 22 and recovered quickly. She had a slight setback about a month ago and again, recovered very quickly. All of her parameters are near normal. We continue to monitor the cells that come out of her blow, out of her chuff or, 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 or uh, blowhole, looking for inflammatory cells that could indicate that things are worse. Things are looking really good. Her blood work continues to be stable and look nice. And she is, is in as good a clinical condition as I've ever seen her. I believe that once she is conditioned by the great work that's being done by the trainers, she'll be ready. So that's a pretty resounding endorsement. She's ready. Things are looking really good, he said. She's in as good a clinical condition as I've ever seen her. Once she is conditioned, which means when she uh, is uh, desensitized to swim into the stretcher. I believe she would have known exactly what to do and that wasn't a problem. So essentially once the, he's saying the trainers uh, sign off, she is ready to go home. So uh, now we have the same basic sentiments from Jeff Foster, who is pretty much in charge of her care. I was recently sent this this video of Toki and Lee interacting outside a session from the Miami Sea Aquarium. I was down there uh, at the end of June and uh, we were pushing really hard to, to uh, develop more of an enrichment program and more of an exercise program. And she, both animals seem to be responding very, very well to this. You can see how active and, and alert they are. And again, this is a play session. You can see uh, Lee riding on, on the bow wave sometimes with Toki. They, they, you know, it's amazing to see these animals move this fast in such a small pool. And she, they know every square inch of it. And, and when they are doing something like this, it's very impressive. You can just see how crisp and robust both animals are. They're both real healthy right now. And it's, we're, we're getting ready for the next step. And it's really exciting for all of us.
So you could hear that. It's another resounding endorsement that she is ready to go. And it's very, very exciting. She is so healthy. And that, as he said, was a play session, meaning nobody told them to do that. That's just them working out, having a good time because they feel like it. They have that energy. So she was so energetic. That was end of June. Dr. Reederson was in July. Uh, I was recently oops, sent this. And then this happened in August. And it wasn't until Tuesday, August 15th, that she was acting off. She wasn't energetic, but her blood work looked okay. So there were concerns starting Tuesday. Wednesday, August 16, she lost appetite. Usually she eats about 120 pounds. She only ate 80 pounds that day. The next day, Thursday, no appetite at all. Nauseous, regurgitated food. So they dropped the pool level to try to see what was wrong. They gave her anti-nausea drugs. They, they gave her saline fluids and norepinephrine. And then they refilled the pool partially thinking, well, maybe now that she's uh, been treated, she'll, she'll pick up again and start to swim around. She didn't. She was unable to swim. She was listing. So they dropped the pool level again and wrapped her in her travel stretcher because she couldn't move. And now I'm going to play a video. This is a 19 minute video. I'm not sure we'll have time for all of it, but this is a document. This was taken from a stationary camera on that lighthouse, the Lime Kiln Lighthouse on August 17, the day before Toki died, but she was in extremis. She was very, very sick. She was unable to move, could not eat, uh, getting tended to by many, many people, but was not recovering at all, was having a very difficult time breathing. And meanwhile, at exactly that same time, when she was struggling so hard just to stay alive, her family came in from the Pacific to the west side of San Juan Island. And this is the heart of their former traditional range. They now don't spend much time there, but before about 10, 12 years ago, they used to come in every summer and spend most of the summer right there. That's where the salmon tumble into the 20 mile side of San Juan Island. And it's the perfect happy hunting grounds. It's, it's uh, where they foraged for days and days and days every summer. That's where she grew up. That's the familiar heart of the Southern resident uh, habitat is right there. And that's where they came in that day. And you can see in their behavior, I think I can narrate during the behavior, that this is extremely unusual. They were not foraging. They were not traveling. They were not doing the kind of socializing we often see. We knew nothing about her condition in Miami at that time. But many, many people saw this live, and I did too. And I was perplexed. This didn't make sense. What kind of behavior is this? We've never seen this kind of, it looked not exactly chaotic, but not organized, not ritualistic kind of agitated. I don't know. I don't want to overinterpret it because I don't know what was going on, but I will keep quiet and let us just watch this very strange behavior for at least a few minutes. And you're listening to KPUA in Waller 88.3 FM. This is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium that is playing on YouTube right now. And it's important to watch this interaction.
Kelly, can you describe for our listeners what's happening? Well, to the best of my ability, but this was K and L pods. Well, J K and L pod. Um, at least most of of them. So we're talking roughly seventy whales were gathered around the lime kiln lighthouse for the most part. They did sometimes in that day go up and down, but this was for at least an hour. And this is a compilation, so this is a uh, 19 minutes of that whole hour, and it really was more than an hour, that they were virtually stationary. Now, that's highly unusual to be in one place. Orcas tend to travel, whether they're foraging, socializing, whatever they're doing, they tend to move around a lot. They were stationary in that one spot doing this really unusual kind of writhing around and by hopping and a few breaches and tail lobs kind of rolling around each other there's one scene coming up where one is pushing the other with his dorsal fin in the notch of her flute and pushing the other along and it's very hard to describe um, and yet they were silent. Is the president of Orkin Network and board chair of the Center for Whale Research Board. And we're watching this. And Howard, where exactly is this location? This is San Juan Island, in the, in the middle of the San Juan Islands, uh, north of Seattle, uh, in the Salish Sea. And, and, and this can you, can you lower the audio on this because it's not okay right sorry yeah, it's yeah okay i'm sorry yeah so there's I'm... a lot of ambient background there yes uh thank you we will i'll pick it up at about seven and a half minutes when there is some uh calls and then i'll take it back down uh even this lower is, audio would be great for, on the sound of the ocean. For anyone who is uh, a veteran orca watcher, they'll look at this and say, what's going on here? Which a lot of people did. And of course, they knew nothing about Toki in Miami at this very minute that this was filmed in trouble, struggling to live. In fact, hours from her death. And they came to where, where she grew up, basically, to the heart of their habitat. But they weren't there for fish. This is not foraging behavior. When they're foraging, they spread out. They're in small groups. But they're all kind of trending one direction or another and moving around in their habitat. These whales were staying in the same place. Yes, anything that you can say about the behavior for our radio listeners? Well, they're, they're moving around but in all directions and not really leaving that location. And they're exhaling, they're blowing, you can see that. They're coming up, moving in different directions. So they're not really going anywhere. When they pop up, they're, they're not very well synchronized. Uh, there's some going the same direction there are tails and flukes and dorsal fins uh, up in the air. Sometimes they swim upside down. Yeah, it was the only time they had all gathered uh, it's called a super pod when they do that, but this was not a typical super pod because in a typical super pod, there's a lot of 
of uh, greeting and a lot of calling and is very noisy uh, underwater. If you have hydrophones and you're listening in, this was virtually silent until we get to, uh, well, I will turn the volume up when we get to the point in a few seconds here that there are calls. Okay. And this is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. You're listening to Howard Gale. You can faintly hear the call. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that was a call. Pretty unusual. How much longer are they doing this, Howard? Well, uh, this would go on for another 10 minutes, but I can cut it off at any time uh, because we want to finish at 9.50. So, and I've got a few more slides after this, so uh, we'll we'll cut it off in a few minutes, just a, about another minute. Yeah, we just have radio listeners like in their car, and they can't. Yeah, see. right. Well, uh, it's just a, an astounding scene for anyone who is, uh, you know, has watched orca behavior. You know, for from any vantage point, scientifically or recreationally, or because they uh, gain a, a certain peace of mind and enjoyment, it makes people happy to see whales. Uh, whale magic um, is really a, a effective uh, therapy, I think, for a lot of people. Um, and yet, this is different. This is not typical orca behavior. This is a kind of, a, uh, I don't know. I, you know, I, I don't want to overinterpret it because it is completely novel. It's just, it's never occurred before in this way. Uh, and I've talked to a lot of veteran observers and they tell me the same thing, that this is really unusual behavior. The way they are moving around in one place. They're they're going back and forth and back and forth and and coming up. And remember, this is a stationary camera, so uh, they're right under the camera, which is based on the side of a lighthouse. Uh, and it, it can be operated, zoomed in and and panned around, but uh, the whales never leave that location. The entire time and that's just totally unheard of and i think it would be good to lower the sound again we did hear okay. them. that was really good Great. i'm happy to okay yeah thank you um there's a breach uh, or a partial breach uh there you can see they're coming up moving every which way a spy hop uh there's uh more surface activity, just a lot of surface activity, but, and there is one who seems to be trembling, who comes up kind of arched and shakes. What's that about? This is just unheard of behavior, very, very strange. And this was back in and August of this year. That that was August 17, and it was exactly synchronous at exactly the same time, those very minutes, Toki was in Miami, in that pool, struggling to stay alive in her very last hours of life. And there is a whale with its rostrum up in the air, mouth open. What is this? Hmm. What is this? 
It's not a normal spy hop. It doesn't look like looking around. It's just almost impossible. I recommend to all radio viewers that they look at the archive of this so that they can see this visual because it is a really strange and amazing visual, especially anyone who is familiar with orca behavior. So anyone there are who probably is probably 10 or 15 orcas that are at the surface right now and they're all each one doing something different, going different directions, spy hopping, tail lobbing, rolling around, uh, slapping their pectoral fin, uh, doing all kinds of strange things. Well, okay, I'm going to bail out of this now so, so that we can... Listeners, listeners if you have been hearing this and you'd like to see it, just go to the YouTube channel and type in KGUA. And then you will go to the channel and you'll find the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium, which we are doing now. And this is the president of the Orca Network, Howard Garrett, who has been speaking with us. Continue on, Howard. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, and then the next day, she had the high creatinine levels, and that indicates a kidney failure or renal failure. She's resting in the sling. She tail lobbed a couple of times and breathed her last breath, and her heart stopped at about 4.10 p.m., and she was lifted out of the tank at 6 p.m., and at that exact time, the Center for Whale Research drone studies were going on. And again, this is a visual, so I'll try to describe it for radio listeners. Uh, but this was uh, from a drone. This is a, a one minute video. Um, and uh, you're looking down on members of LPOD. And at the same time, And what's the difference between the L pod and the other? Well, these are pods which are families, uh, are uh, they're matrial lines, which is the mother or grandmother, the elder female, uh, with her family arrayed around her. And orcas are, are highly unusual, if not unique, in that the male and female offspring stay with their mothers their entire lives. So these are lifetime bonded families that stay together always. Uh, this is, uh, I, I don't know the individuals or the pods uh, in the drone video that we're watching here, but it's L-Pod. And at the same time, um, Katie Jones, who was a member of this research team out there, uh, wrote this later. On our August 18 orca encounter, while watching the L-12s, we received the tragic news that Skali Chaktanat, that's the lummy name for Topitai, had died earlier in the afternoon. It was not lost on us that we were in the company of the L-12s and L-25, who is the eldest of all of the southern resident orcas at somewhere around 90 years old, give or take a few years. Uh, and she was right there. She was the last survivor uh, from the 1970 when Toki, Tokitai was captured. She is the only remaining one who knew Toki before she was captured and she was present. And they were doing some unusual behavior. It wasn't quite as agitated, I guess, as what we just saw from the ones at the lighthouse, but they were doing unusual behavior. Um, so I better just go on because uh, we've got about six minutes left. Um, so that's all the videos, but this was the announcement, a short tweet from Eduardo Albor, the uh, owner of the tank, of the uh, park rather, and the tank, uh, saying with a broken heart, we announced the departure of Lolita. That was her stage name, her publicity name. Uh, and uh, we will wait for more information. Uh, and then they talk about what heroes they were. Well, I don't know about that. That is, uh, 
L25, she was off by herself. And there are Lummi tribal traditions where in mourning, the elder females or the elders will very often go off by themselves and they're given that time to mourn and grieve by themselves. So again, how would they know? I have no idea, but the synchronicity is just impossible to deny. Mm -hmm. They were in this very strange, unusual behavior at exactly the same time that 3,000 miles away in Miami, their, their relative was dying. And that is yet to be explained. Um, they say from a renal condition, but that was just the initial uh, blood work. And she was by 6 p.m., died at 4 p.m., after 4, and by 6 p.m., she was in the truck and being taken up to Georgia, to the University of Georgia Veterinary School for the necropsy. And, oh, I don't know what happened here. Uh, there should be, ah, there it is. Um, this was, this just came out yesterday, in fact, that uh, from NOAA, uh, on the NOAA Facebook page, that the cause of death has been found. The necropsy was performed, uh, but uh, NOAA will not release it because it is owned by the Miami Seaquarium and they are not required to release it. And this so we may Tokitai, never know the cause right. of death. This is Tokitai. This is Tokitai. Yeah, she died uh, August 18th. There was a necropsy at University of Georgia and uh, we do not have the results and uh, they are under no legal obligation to ever release those results. Hmm. Uh, we don't know what the cause of death was. Uh, this was our Orca Network statement with heavy hearts and tears in our eyes. Orca Network shares the news that Okutai Scali Chaktanat passed away Friday, August 18 at the Sequarium around 4 p.m. And goes on to say, one thing that brings us comfort is knowing that yesterday, as Toki began struggling and was on her journey home to the next world, her entire family was off the west side of San Juan Island in what these days is a rare gathering, with all three pods swimming up and down the island, socializing in a super pod. And the L-12s are still there today. This was Saturday. Uh, the 19th. This is often a cultural social ritual to mark a significant event in their community. And we believe that they were welcoming her home. Um, and the Center for Whale Research offered their condolences as well. Uh, and she was treated with utmost dignity and honor uh, at a funeral home uh, in Bellingham. And this is uh, a photo of Raynell Morris uh, grieving for her relative. And that is a, a literal definition of how the Lummi traditions feel about their Orca relatives, that they are their relations. And she's grieving over the death of Tokitai. And that brings us to the last slide. And we are continuing by honoring her with what we're calling Toki's legacy, which is to focus on not only captivity issues, obviously to object to any captivity for whales or dolphins anywhere as she would wish, as we did in her on her behalf all those years, but also to help her family to help to restore habitat for her family, for the salmon that her family depends on. That means dam removals. The Snake River dams have to be removed. Every other kind of restoration, every other kind of water quality improvement, noise abatement, every other way we can to take care of Toki's family. That is Toki's legacy. So with that,
I will turn the mic over to Scott or Leanne. All right. And uh, just go ahead and end the sharing, if you would, Howie. And Howie, it's a, such an honor to have you here on our station. This is KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM. For all of our listeners out there, this is the voice of Howard Garrett, and he is the president of Orca Network. He's also the board chair at the Center for Whale Research. You have extensive knowledge about these things. We we are really honored to have you here at the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today, and everyone, you can watch this on YouTube anytime. It's live right now, but it will be there on KGUA's YouTube channel. And right now, I would like to also introduce, to do a little Q&A with Howie, the producers and creators of this symposium, and that's Scott and Tree Mercer of the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study. Mm -hmm. And... They are right next door to us in uh, the, what we call the recording studio. And I'm going to switch us back to gallery view here. I'm both engineer, host, and everything here. So welcome, Scott Mercer. I'm going to introduce more about you in just a few minutes as you're going to do the next presentation. But right now, why don't you give a little summary, a recap of what Midanoma Whale and Sea Study, SEAL Study is? For our audience. Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, first, thank you, Howard, for that great talk. Um, as I said in um, Monterey, I was mixed up with Mendocino, as I said in Monterey five symposiums ago, I followed you with my talk, uh, one of your talks, and I said nobody wants to follow Howard because it's very uh, emotional, educational, and inspirational, an awful lot to think about out afterwards. So thank you for yet another great presentation, Howard. Mm -hmm. And thank you for showing you. up for I'm all honored. five of these. <laughs> and thank you for showing up uh, for all five of these. The first one was quite an experience right. for you. Yeah. Um, Truly. I was wondering, there was some, I may not have heard everything you said, but I probably didn't. Um, the area where all of that um, erratic behavior was taking place, how far was that from where Toki was originally um, kidnapped? Well, I would say about 25 to 30 miles, uh, basically in the same Salish Sea. Uh, and the, the catcher boats uh, herded the entire community, again, JK and L pods, that day in August 1970, around Whidbey Island and up the inland water east of Whidbey Island. Um, and so, you know, I as as the boat travels it would probably be about 50 miles but they were directly on the east side of Whidbey Island at the time in Penn Cove when that when she was captured hmm. in um orca space that's kind of, kind of a, a, one elbow away so that's uh, very very close. Right. yeah right yeah they can move that far in no time yeah yeah, yeah some of us have seen that um okay well um is what, there, what do you guys have, I have up there? Oh, good. I have a quick question. How is it scientifically explained, or have you? What are the scientists thinking about this connection that they that they all share? What what what? Are I, you well, I think that what we have just witnessed and is documented uh, indicates a connection that is not explained that I have not heard any scientist really go out on that limb and try to explain. But this isn't the only incidence of that. Uh, there have been several other times when something was happening that was a very uh, emotional event about orcas, and they appeared. They came to it. Uh, and there... I, well, the last, well, two years ago for my talk for Ocean Life Symposium, I talked about how when J-57 was born, September 5th, uh, that k and L pods were way out in the Pacific Ocean, and yet they came 50 miles in. They came a-running to greet the new baby. I mean, that's all we can say. That was the big event uh, in their lives, and they were not there for foraging. They were having this... Uh, 
very uh, animated, frolicsome kind of super pot event. And then they left the next day and they all went back out to the Pacific. But, you know, how did they know from way out in the Pacific that a new baby had just been born that morning? Uh, you know, and that's only one of so many anecdotes like that, that they add up to data. We have a pattern. <laughs> you know, we have something that is happening that is not well explained. And, uh, you know, I mean, I can hypothesize that the physics of it, the brain waves, you know, the electromagnetic pulses that may travel in realms that we cannot see that are not measured, but they seem to be tuned in. Uh, and are able to know when that's happening, they certainly behaved as if they knew just what was happening in Miami. Well, it's I don't interesting. Know how. Well, I'm a horsewoman, and I've been studying for a documentary I'm producing the connection between horses and humans because there is a great deal of energy or inner, you know, energy type. Uh, connection and their responses to us and what we're feeling at the moment. So I I get it on that level, but this is like thousands of miles away. <laughs> and Scott and Tree yeah. Mercer, you're you've been studying whales most of your lives. You've been teaching them, and you've studied along both coasts here in the United States. Give us some of your thoughts on this topic. Well, I've been trying to figure that out with baleen whales for uh, 25, 30 years. How you can be in an ocean and we look around, you can't see a blow anywhere. And then the tide changes or a current picks up and suddenly you have 30 feeding humpback, humpback whales around you. And um, I'm sure there's no oceanographic reason for that, but it's still, still pretty phenomenal to watch. But what Howard described um, earlier was just uh, mind boggling, really, to think about and to watch, especially to watch. It was the first time I'd seen that, that video. And uh, I haven't seen that on the ocean with anything in, in uh, all these decades especially a group of uh, whales like that, when an old member of the family has died so far away, a continent away, um, it's very hard to, it's very hard to even um, <laughs> sit around and think about, you know, come up with any conclusion. Are there any other unusual behaviors that you have detected over the years, like that are difficult to explain why with whales or seals? Well, as Howard knows, with whales, just about everything they do. <laughs> so, Howard, anything else? Well, I could uh, just give you one other example. And this was uh, when the Secretary of State, uh, uh, Ralph Monroe, held a memorial service for an orca, J6, who was named Ralph in his honor. And he died in 1998. And so Ralph, the Secretary of State, uh, was very moved by that and wanted to hold a sort of a ceremony, a memorial on San Juan Island. And so he set the time and the date and it was at 1.30 and uh, there were no whales in the neighborhood until that morning. And uh, they came around from the south end of San Juan Island and they arrived. And the way Ralph tells the story, as he shakes his head, he said it was not at 131 and it was not at 129 it was at 130 <laughs> that they arrived at exactly that location and stopped and began breaching and uh, doing all sorts of uh, surface active activity uh right when ralph monroe was prepared to give a speech but he couldn't give his speech because everybody was looking at the whales so, I mean, that was just one incidence, and and he reflects on that. We've got the video recording. I could play it, but uh, where he says, I, in my heart, know they knew what we were doing there that day. So how did they know? Um, and that's not the only When Mike Big, the originator of the photo identification study back in 1971, 72, um, when he died, in the early 90s, there was a, a sort of a service for him in the northern resident orca uh, habitat at the rubbing rocks, and which is a tradition that they have of rubbing on the rocks. Um, so it's a sort of a culturally important place. And when his service was being held, here come the whales. And they gathered around and they basically attended the service. Um, so. 
you know, there are, there are other incidents too, but you know, how do they know when something is going on that is in their honor or about them? I, you know, they tune into things we can't see. That's all I can say. Thank you so much for that, Howard. Thank you for joining us today on the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. We're we're up at the 10 o'clock hour now. It, it flew past. Thank you for being here. And Howard, again, is the board chair at the Center for Whale Research, and he's the board president of Orca Network. Now, uh, is that the board president of Orca Network? That's, that's the one that you sit on, Howard? Yes. Okay. Yes, well, well both. So you have a lifetime of experience as well. And um, thank you for joining us here today. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host and a filmmaker, voice producer in the Sea Ranch. We are located in the studios of KGUA in Walala or Gualala, California, on the southern Mendocino coast. The ocean is right here, front and center, and we are talking about our neighbors today and those that live within it. And we're going to be here with you until 3 p.m. today. And we're going to say goodbye to Howie now on YouTube. You. We're, we're on YouTube too. Bye, <laughs> Howard. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's been an honor. All right. And now we're Good going to move us. into the next hour. And we're going to have Scott continue with us. Now, I'm going to give a little background on you, Scott, before you get going. Mm -hmm. And because I want to let our listeners know what you have been doing all these years. And Tree, there with you. Thank you so much for everything you've been doing, too. But Scott began studying marine mammals in 1974 in Monterey Bay with an extended study of the feeding ecology of sea otters. After relocating to his native New England in 1978, Scott founded New England Whale Watch, Inc., and that was to offer firsthand ocean life education to the public and to collect data on the whales being observed. He was recently interviewed for his role as a pioneer in Atlantic Coast whale watching by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, that's NOAA, as part of a history of the whale watching industry in New England. He also co-founded the Breer Island Ocean Study, a research station in Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia, where my brother lives, as a matter of fact. He has led offshore and overnight excursions to the Atlantic Outer Continental Shelf in the Caribbean, Nova Scotia, and Newfoundland. In 1982, Scott co-authored The Great Whale Book, and for 14 years, he taught a marine mammal class for the University of New Hampshire's continuing education, as well as science classes for the Southern Maine Community college. He and his wife sitting next to him, Tree Mercer, recently appeared in the documentary shown this year at the Mendocino Film Festival, which we were all at, called Watch, Washed Ashore, Washed Ashore by co-director, co-producer Cameron Nielsen, who was a UC Berkeley Graduate School of Journalism and co-director, co-producer Leigh Heimgartner. That was quite the experience that you both went through in the production of that documentary. So thank you for bringing us the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium to KGUA. Thank you, Leanne. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. So I'm yeah. going to let you take it away here, Scott, for the next hour. I wish I okay. could see it. I don't see my share screen. <laughs> ah, okay. So it's not on your Zoom. You should have share screen at the bottom. Okay. Of it. So if you scroll over, let me see if I can ask you to share. No, I can't ask you to share, but you can scroll over the bottom of your Zoom and be able to share screen. Okay, so what do we do in this instance? All right, usually on Zoom, if, are you on a Mac? It may be at the top because uh, I'm on a Mac though too and it's at the bottom. Okay. So uh -huh. I'm not sure what's going on. Let me see if I can do something else. Okay, let me uh, see also. Can... How about if I make you co-host? I wonder if that will do it. Try that. Okay. So I've made you co-host and we can see if you can start. We practiced this the other day. Yeah, and it, it worked just fine. fine. 
Okay, well, I can, let's see, why don't you end the meeting? I'll keep talking for a little okay. bit. Okay. And then you come back on and we'll see if it will work then. Let's just okay. like a reboot. Okay. In the meantime, I'll just explain to listeners who had just been on the show. Howard Garrett is one of the most incredible people in the um, ocean network of, of, of speakers and scientists. And uh, he has he grew up in Northern California. He studied sociology at the University of New Mexico and UC Berkeley before graduating from Colorado College. And in 1995, he helped launch the campaign to return Totokai. And that was uh, a captive Southern resident orca. And his primary focus has been sophisticated cultural capabilities demonstrated by organist orca. And in 1980, his brother, Ken Balcom, invited him to assist with his ORCA survey of photo ID research on San Juan Island. And then let's see, let me ask you to start your video and see if that will help. So now you should have a share screen at the bottom. Um, up, Leanne. Okay. All right. Well, all right. Let me try something else again. I'm okay. going to try a different link. Okay. Uh, we we just wanted to bring this Ocean Life Symposium to you again this year, both on radio and on YouTube. Uh, it's also streaming on our website, kgua.org. We just click listen live at the top of the page. I'm Leanne Lindsay, and we're going to be doing this until 3 p.m. today. And I'm sure we'll get this presentation underway in just a moment. And we'll find out what is happening there. But Scott and Tree Mercer come on the show once a month to give us an update on the life within our oceans and the data of what's happening up and down the coast with the whales and what what the amount of whales are traveling, when they're traveling, and they will track that data and share it with NOAA and many of the other uh, firms that are in the ocean industry tracking this data. And it was interesting when Howard was talking about Todakai that they noticed some behavior, odd behavior around August 15th, 17th of this year. And they tried several things to be able to uh, restorate uh, Todakai, but eventually um, this orca passed away and there was some really unusual behavior that was demonstrated by the family of orcas far away. And let's see, we've got Tree Mercer back. Still no screen. screen. Um, you are on Zoom. Okay, I was. Everybody that gets on Zoom has the uh, the bar down below with a mute, stop video, security participants. How about hovering over the bottom or at the top? Okay. See if anything happens. Uh, all right, let me. I, I tell you what we're going to do. We're probably going to. I got it. I got it. You did. Great. We made Sorry. it. That's okay. okay. Well, these things happen. You know, we went through a lot through the pandemic when we a lot of us were learning to do this remotely. And now we are going to start the presentation with Scott Mercer of the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Leanne. Are we actually on? Yeah, okay. you're on. And we can see your presentation. Thank you. Right. Okay, these are North Atlantic gray whales. I'm sorry, right whales. <laughs> We're looking at gray whales for, for a while here. Uh, these are North Atlantic right whales. And they're only about, uh, at the most, maybe 350 North Atlantic right whales surviving. They were hunted uh, nearly to extinction for, for over se several centuries. And the reason was they were considered the right whale to kill. They have an extra thick layer of blubber. They're very slow moving. And because of that thick layer of blubber, they tend to be quite buoyant. And so they floated when they were dead. And with the old wind-driven ships that were not nearly as big as ships today, uh, if you had one or two of these tied to the side of the boat, a, a 40 or 45 ton animal to the side of the boat, it could take the boat down with it. So those are three advantages to the whalers right there, especially the profit motive from uh, 
the amount of blubber that they carried around. Oops, we don't seem to be advancing now. It's all Jack's fault. It's not advancing. Okay. You're listening to the voice of Scott Mercer of Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study that is bringing you this fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. And now we're back with Scott. Hey, thank you. Um, I'm going to dedicate this uh, presentation. I think this... Uh, symposium to uh, two individuals now. One is uh, Ken Balcom, uh, who is Howard's brother. You heard Howard mention Ken a number of times. Uh, I first met Ken back in the late 70s, and he had an influence on anybody who was in the same room with him, and um, a real giant. And we can thank um, the gains we've made with the preservation of the Southern residents and the Northern residents, for that matter, but especially the highly endangered Southern residents, to Ken's work and um, John Ford and Michael Biggs as well. At the same time, you, three of them are real pioneers, especially Ken, who carried on. I remember Ken saying once um, recently, he said, um, he's talking about the Southern residents, he said, they may go extinct while we're alive, but I'm not going to stand here and watch it happen. So that was always, always Ken's attitude. Try this button. I made a nice noise. Hit that. Just keep hitting that. Okay, and the second scientist I um, want to um, commemorate is Roger Payne, who many of you I know have heard of. He recorded the first humpback whale songs off of Bermuda um, in the early 70s, and, and the songs of the humpback whale were a hit album at the time, as um, they had the good sense to make those uh, widely available to the public. So the public could understand what, what was going on under the ocean as well with these incredible animals. I want to read a um, quote from Roger. Uh, uh, he, he made very, um, I'm very close to when he died. As my time runs out, I am possessed with the hope that humans worldwide are smart enough and adaptable enough to put the savings, saving of our species where it belongs at the top of the list of our most important jobs I believe that science can help us survive our folly. So the loss of Ken and Roger um, in the last few months is uh, going to be a hit to the scientific community and uh, to our knowledge. And you wonder how much um, how much these guys knew that we don't know. Um, we're going to have to work a little harder to catch up. Okay, we'll try this again. Okay, North Atlantic right whales. Um, the uh, Eubalina is derived from the Greek meaning, Eubalina is their name, which means the true baleen whale, although there is another species of baleen whale, the bowhead, which has much longer baleen, but these are considered the true or, or true whale, and the right whale, specific name Glacialis, means icy. Uh, this group, the uh, Mysticetus, you'll be hearing a little more about that from our buddy Zach coming up, but um, Mysticetus actually translates to mustache whale in reference to the, the baleen. So C just means whale, and the uh, mist, mista uh, translates to mustache in reference to the baleen that hangs down from their mouths. You'll be seeing that in some coming slides here. Hey, along the uh, North Atlantic right, along the North Atlantic coast, right whales migrate from um, New England in the Gulf of Maine, which I was hoping to show you on here. Um, I'm sorry, I have to ask a question. Is that tab that you have to be there? Yeah. All right, thank you. I may like looking at myself, but it's better to show this. Um, the, um, the Gulf of Maine is that little enclosure up there that has the blue dots around it right now, showing the summer and fall grounds for the right whale. Uh, the Gulf of Maine extends from the Bay of Fundy up in New uh, uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, over, roughly over to one side of Nova Scotia, of uh, New Brunswick, and down to Cape Cod, Provincetown, Massachusetts, and along the coastlines of New Hampshire and Maine, and obviously Massachusetts. Um, so that's the Gulf of Maine right there, which is warming faster than many other bodies of water. And the right whales feed up there in the summertime, and the spring, summer, and fall. They begin arriving off of Cape Cod in April. 
Um, you can have large numbers of, of um, right whales just off the beaches along Provincetown, Race Point, those of you familiar with the Cape Cod shoreline, um, Coast Guard Beach, you have large numbers of uh, right whales. If there's several dozen, when there's only about 350 left, and you have 60 or 65 of um, skim feeding while you're standing on the beach and they're only yards away from you, is quite a sight. Um, that's that's the summer grounds, and then the feeding ground, uh, the wintering grounds. The well, summer grounds are the feeding grounds where they feed on a little critter called the copepods, primarily, which we'll highlight here coming up. And the um, this species winters down in uh, off of no, some of them winter down off of Florida and Georgia and the Carolinas. When I began working with right whales um, in '78, in fact, the first whale watch trip I ever led was. The first whales we saw were two right whales, which I consider to be a good sign. Uh, but well, more importantly than that was, we saw those we saw these two females off the, uh, we didn't know at the time they were females, but we saw them off the coast of New Hampshire. And four months later, you know, four months later, they were recited by um, Georgia Department of Natural Resources before there was widespread whale watching. Um, off the coast of Georgia, and they had calves. So uh, those two that we saw off the coast of New Hampshire in October were pregnant and were on a migration that we had uh, always thought took that way from some of the um, um, evidence, anecdotal evidence over the, over the uh, decades, going back to the 1930s, that there were large whales down there with calves. Um, so the... Uh, the ones that go down there in the winter time are primarily the females, pregnant females, and uh, some whales remain feeding up in the in Gulf of Maine, especially off of uh, Cape Cod. But uh, mystery is where many of the other right whales go, and um, that still hasn't been figured out. And that may be actually the legendary um, mating grounds for right whales. Uh, there's still lots to be known about many of these species, including these. Um, right whales, and we hope uh, uh, that they can survive long enough, uh, survive um, forever, but uh, survive especially long enough in enough numbers for us to really uh, find out a lot about them. Uh, okay, another look at a little more color of the uh, area we're just talking about. Hopefully this cursor works. Uh, here's the coast, the southeast coast of the United States, where a lot of us um, well, several of us from the New England area did aerial surveys over a number of years over the Carolinas. When I started doing them in 84 with the New England Aquarium, we were the only entity down there. So we had the whole area to ourselves to fly over, uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and into Florida. And we did find a lot of mother and calf pairs showing that that was indeed the calving ground. And uh, boat work that was done down there, we'd um, cruise along the coast here watching for mothers and calves. Now, the identifying shot for a, a right whale is to take a photograph of the face and the head uh, because of these uh, large growths around the face and head, which we'll be seeing here close up. And those are, those are the callosities, and they're found in a different location on each right whale's head. See anything else here? A couple of spots. Um, these are the areas that are warming up. And once, the reason the, the right whales congregate up here in the summer again is to feed on copepods. This area is warming up very quickly. And with that, the copepods are fleeing. And incidentally, so are the, the lobsters, which is made Maine famous. They're also heading into, into colder waters. Okay, the fourth four threats facing the North Atlantic right whale. Well, the two that uh, are the most lethal right now are vessel strikes and um, entanglements. Uh, vessel strikes are, excuse me, can be done by any size vessel, but the most lethal, uh, we think, are obviously those the big uh, ships, cargo vessels, and uh, um, even big, large commercial fishing vessels, and in, um, entanglements by fishing gear. And all of these, um, well, ocean noise is obviously human produced, and um, climate change, and climate change is causing. Um, changes in migration habits of many different marine animals, of thousands, thousands of marine animals, and uh, climate change is also causing disruptions in the food production and food chains. 
But entanglements um, are caused by ropes, nets, um, buoy lines, mooring lines, anything. A friend of ours who um, has disentangled thousands of animals uh, down in Provincetown um, has told us that um, any vertical line will eventually end up somewhere, somehow, with a, an entanglement. It's entanglements in virtual lines. It's Scott Landry. It's the Center for Coastal Studies. And... Um, it said that uh, you have an you have a vertical line, you're going to have an entanglement, and unfortunately, sea turtles, birds, whales, seals, just about anybody in there is um, at a risk of that. Okay. It's a, a video that will illustrate entanglements. And Scott, you can lower and raise the video audio when you want to make a comment oh, okay. and this is kgua in malala why don't you explain what we're seeing here not for our radio audience north atlantic right whales um, as i mentioned they became extinct and size matters it's the current circulation. The North Atlantic is one of the most rapidly changing ocean regions as a result of climate change. What that means for North Atlantic right whales is that how much food they have available is changing. Maybe even more importantly, the location and distribution of that prey is changing really rapidly. They're now moving into areas where people don't expect to see them. They're much more vulnerable to those direct impacts like entanglements, like ship strikes, Vessel traffic, lots of fishing activity, noise, climate change are probably contributing to the reduced birth rates. The New England Aquarium has been collecting photo identification data on individual whales since the 1980s. We essentially know for almost every female whale in the population how often she's given birth, when she's given birth, how many calves she's produced, we can start to ask really interesting questions about what's driving reproduction, how often are they reproducing. So we paired that reproductive data set with an aerial photogrammetry data set, which is essentially a, a fancy way of saying that we flew over the whales and we took pictures of them. We have photos of individual whales that we can use to measure how long whales are, how healthy they are, how fat they are. A fat whale is a, a happy, healthy whale. A skinny whale is not doing so well. We can combine these two data sets to look at how things like size and body condition are influencing reproduction in this population. The first thing we were interested in is what has happened to growth rates of these whales over time. What we found was really striking. A North Atlantic right whale born today is expected to reach a maximum length about a meter shorter than a whale born 30 or 40 years ago. What does that mean? Is it a big deal that these huge whales are a little bit shorter than they used to be? What we found is that smaller females produce fewer calves over their reproductive years. The bigger you are, the more calves you can produce. If you're a short whale, you've got fewer sort of total energetic reserves where you store all your energies in your blubber, you are just packing on less blubber overall because you're shorter. We see that manifesting in longer recovery periods between pregnancies. If you think about the reproductive cycle of a whale, the first thing you need to do is pack on a lot of weight prior to giving birth. Then you get pregnant, you give birth, and you use a lot of those reserves to nurse your calf, make sure that it grows big and strong. You have to build those reserves back up before you can reproduce, give birth, and nurse another calf. For these smaller whales, that recovery time is quite a bit longer than for much larger whales. That sort of adds up over their lifespan of, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, a shorter whale is going to give birth to many fewer calves than a larger whale. Mom's condition and size also influence the calf's condition and size. So these shorter and skinnier whales are also probably giving birth to shorter and skinnier calves. And when you only have a few hundred of these whales left, every individual becomes very important. If they're all stunted and 
smaller and have reduced birth rates because of that, it becomes a big deal. If you're entangled in fishing gear, you're going to be stunted in your growth rates and you're going to end up shorter than a whale that isn't entangled. In order to make the population more resilient, it would be very helpful if we could reduce or eliminate some of these impacts like entanglements and ship strikes. It's definitely difficult. It's not easy to you know, prevent these impacts or reverse a major decline of a population like this, but I hope that this actually gives sort of actionable targets to help recover the species. Okay, that was Josh Stewart narrating from um, the group NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, here's a, coming up here now is a- um, uh, Scott, can I interrupt you just one second? Uh, could you just recount a little bit of that video that was playing while he was talking? Because the people on YouTube can see it, but the radio listeners can't. So I think it'd be important to describe what was showing while he was talking. Okay. Um, some of you may have noticed, well, you couldn't if you were on the radio, watching on the radio, but um, that was, it showed whales that are entangled in gear, fishing gear. Um other types of gear that's out there. There's even um, ropes that are loose in the ocean and marine, marine animals get caught up in those. And one of the um, uh, entanglement sh slides, they showed the ropes actually cutting into the sides of the whale. You can see uh, bloody flesh on everywhere. You can see the rope. It was cutting into the whale's sides. We've had, um, this wasn't shown on there, but uh, just to throw in, we've had um, amputations. Whales have lost flippers um, from the sawing action of ropes that have been caught on the flippers for years, and they've been unable to, unable or unwilling to be um, um, disentangled. By that, I mean the whales don't know you're their friend. They're terrified. They're starving. They're um, caught up in, this, in the ocean in gear that they can't get out of. And then suddenly uh, you come up in a small boat with every good intention, but the whale doesn't know that. So quite often they get away from entanglements or disentanglements, and then that leads to death. Um, let's see what else. Um, and it looked like there were some whales that were feeding and they were feeding upside down. Yeah, we have a, we have a, um, unnarrated part of that coming up, which I'll, um, I have to be quick with it because it moves fast, but I'll explain a little bit of the whale anatomy that they're looking at that at that time. All right. And you're listening to the voice of Scott Mercer of the Mindanao Whale and Seal Study, bringing you the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. I'm your host today, Leanne Lindsay. Okay, Scott, continue. All right. Thank you. And this is an animation um, showing uh, or an illustration. Um, first of all, only about a third of right whale deaths are documented. And that's because um, the carcasses are way out at sea. They're never found. Uh, they will eventually um, become a whale fall when they drop to the bottom. Um, and that's what this um, illustration is showing is the number of whales that died each year from 2007 that we know of um, to 2023. And the, the known, it's, it's a bar graph, in other words, showing the number of whales that were killed um, or that we know that died during that time. Um, there's been a, a bit of a decline in the deaths of uh, right whales from 1990. Actually, there's a steep incline from 1990 to 2010. And then a drop off to 2020, and um, then maybe because of the fewer whales around, it definitely would be for less whales. Um, but the categories are uh, dead, serious injuries, and sublethal injuries. Uh, dead would be unknown causes; we have no idea what happened to them. They can't. A necropsy cannot be done, which is an autopsy, because of the the body is uh, so far decomposed or in a difficult place to get at. Um, entanglements, vessel strikes, and perinatal deaths, um, which are stillborns, um, serious injuries, entanglements, vessel strikes, and a dependent calf. A dependent calf is a calf that's lost its mother and um, is not old enough yet to survive on its own without her, uh, the milk and uh, nutrition she gets from the mother, the calf gets from the mother. Uh, and sublethal injuries and illnesses, the dependent calf will become a death, uh, sublethal injuries and illness, entanglements, poor body condition, 
uh, poor body condition is generally from an entanglement or a past entanglement. Sometimes the whales actually get themselves out of them, which has happened a few times. There'll be a flyover well offshore where a boat really can't get to, and there's a whale entangled, badly entangled, and another flyover, and the whale is in poor shape but has lost all the gear that was on it. Uh, I'm going to show you a film here at the end, just a, the title of a film. People who want to know more about this, it just recently came out that has a um, uh, some footage of a whale struggling to get out of. Uh, they could, it was too dangerous to get near it with a boat. So videos were taken just showing the struggling they go through trying to get out of these um, ropes that they're caught up in. Uh, injuries of unknown cause. Um, you know, quite often you can't say what happened if a, or, um, I was going to say sometimes you we can't tell if a whale was struck before, if that's what killed the death or if it was struck by a ship after it was dead and floating. But um, there are new techniques now that um, can can pinpoint whether it was uh, dead before or after the strike. Um, injuries of unknown cause in vessel strikes, which are all too well known. Okay, and... And the uh, North Atlantic right whale mortality is by cause of death. This is a sort of another bar graph. Uh, in 2017, there were 17 mortalities. In 2023, that had dropped to um, about two um, that we know of. And the uh, causes here are color-coded. Uh, the two in 2023, one was a vessel strike. The other was a, a, a perinatal death. The um, one of the other ones here, 2017, where there were 17 dead, a uh, vessel strike was a known cause of about five of them. Um, entanglement was four of them. So there's, no, there's nine of them right there, vessel strikes and entanglements. And um, there's an undetermined for about three or, three or four more of them. Now, with only tw uh, 336, Currently, I believe what's thought, we've been saying 350, but 300, 336, I think, is the actual number that the uh, mathematicians have come up with. And there's, there's just a few numbers on this next chart here to to, um, to show you uh, that are really important. Uh, one is, um, well, the approximate number is 336, so I was just measuring, mentioning, mentioning the um, 610 years is the um, the length of the reproduction calving, reproductive calving interval, which is up from three to five years. Um, when I first began working with right whales, it was uh, about three years between a female having a calf, taking care of the calf for a year, and then two years of recovering from taking care of that calf and the pregnancy. Uh, it was three years. And we could we could actually predict how many calves would be born the next year, looking back, looking back three years or two years, uh, or three years, actually. Um, and what that population might be. And uh, that, because of the um, uh, poor nutrition of the whales, they're getting smaller. Um, the feeding is harder to find. They're traveling further to get to food. Their migration has lengthened um, by many, many miles uh, because of the search for food. So now is as much as 10 years um, between calves um, with females. And what's um, even sadder with that is of the 336 known surviving right whales, um, less than 100 are reproductive females. So there's a time scale here where um, the mathematicians we work for have actually come up with a scenario that right whales could be extinct in 25 years. And um, there's, there's a, a possibility of they be, being functionally extinct in 20 years meaning if there aren't enough females left to keep the population recruited. And um, yeah, 86% of the North Atlantic right whales, and we know who they all are. The population is so small. They've all been photographed and cataloged. Um, even if we don't know where they are right now, they're, their mug is in the, uh, in the catalogs. And 86% uh, of them have been previously entangled. And the... The film that Josh Stewart was narrating, I don't know if we could stop that at places, but you could see um, scars all over most of those whales. Uh, very obvious um, propeller marks, rope marks, scraped off skin that's healed over as bright white. And you, it's hard to find a, a right whale. It's hard to find a right whale anyway, but it's very hard to find a right whale that hasn't already been damaged 
by human activity. And okay, this um this is a, fa a photo of a excuse me of a North Atlantic right whale, and it's hard to see what you're looking at here. But the photograph is um, a member of the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies research team on the right. And you can see how you dress for work. If you're on that team, you wear a lacrosse helmet with a GoPro camera and um, uh, personal uh, flotation devices. And you're in a, um, a quick and easy to pack um, inflatable vessel. The long pole that uh, the rescuer is using uh, were invented by the rescuers. They couldn't go to a store and say, I need a whale disentanglement tool. There weren't any. They invented their own through hit or miss, going out and seeing what worked best. So they would have designed and um, built that pole. And you can see the um, hand couplets on it, usually to extend and shorten it. Okay, now the worst part of this photo, of course, is this poor right whale. That's baleen sticking out of the front of its mouth. That's not where baleen goes. Um, baleen should be hanging down from the top jaws, not sticking out of the front of their mouth. This whale traveled from the Gulf of St. Lawrence in uh, far, well, can't, way up in Canada, on the Gulf of St. Lawrence and traveled all the way without being able to eat, being bound up like that with gear to Provincetown where this rescue team was. Uh, we think best in the business. <laughs> that particular team led by Scott Landry and others um, were there. Now, Howie was talking about um, telepathy and so forth. And this whale traveled, almost in, I don't know, say the entire East Coast, but from way up in Mar Maritime Canada down to um, the tip of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And out came coastal studies once the whale was seen. But it's just obscene the condition this whale has been put into by ropes in its mouth, pulling that, just, just joining and pulling that ba baleen out of its mouth like that. Uh, I do know that the whale was rescued. You can see this good team there. The whale was rescued. The rope was cut away. And eventually, from the whale trying to feed and opening its mouth, water pressure and uh, movement finally put uh, replaced the baleen back into where it should be. But this is um this to me is the poster child of a of an entanglement. I'm gonna go back to the video. Yeah. Technical moment. <laughs> Tell them what it is. You're listening to Scott and Tree Mercer of Mindanao Whale and Seal mm -hmm. Study that has uh, been bringing you for five years now this Ocean Life Symposium. I'm host Leanne Lindsay, and we're going to go back now to Scott Mercer. Okay, we'll be right with you. Having a okay, this is a um, animation of a uh, another entanglement video and fishing ropes of a right whale, in particular those used with pots and gill nets I'll be is a major threat to large whales. Scarring from ropes on more than two-thirds of North Atlantic right whales illustrates how frequent these encounters are for this critically endangered species. Restricted mainly to the Northwest Atlantic, these whales have a global population estimated at only 450 individuals. The Consortium for Wildlife Bycatch Reduction is a group of scientists, fishermen, and engineers who have come together to find solutions to this threat. A major challenge we face in achieving our objective is that so little is known about the dynamics of encounters between whales and fishing gear. In the vast ocean, these encounters are rarely observed and never studied. So, with the help of Belquant Engineering, we are developing a virtual whale entanglement simulation model. The computer uses an anatomically precise rendering of a North Atlantic right whale and fishing ropes incorporating accurate engineering principles and properties. And what is happening here, Scott? Oh, this is an animation of a North Atlantic right whale. Real time see the user rope, interaction whale going, with the computer model coming along in its ocean. A game style it's a rope. Allows the rope whales generally marine roll to try to get loose from what's bothering them. And when they roll, designers, they wrap them up more with this gear. You can see a lobster buoy on the whale top. behavior what now. if scenarios. The goal is to use this computer model to simulate the whale behavior. The goal is to use this computer model to help us better understand how whale entanglements occur 
how different gear interacts with whales and allow mitigation strategies to be tested virtually. This virtual whale entanglement simulator represents a collaborative effort by marine mammal scientists, fishermen, fisheries professionals, and engineers to reduce severe entanglements of North Atlantic right whales. Okay, now in that animation, especially toward the end, you can see the whale wrapped up. Uh, a lobster buoy off near the top there was wrapped around the whale's body. And if you, during the animation, you may have noticed an animation or an illustration of a lobster trap on the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, so whales tend to roll. So I was trying to say whales tend to roll. When they collide with something underwater, they tend to move, try to move away from it or roll. And when they roll, if it's ropes like that, it generally is, then they end up wrapping themselves up in it. You know, think of spaghetti on a fork that you're twirling. And um, they, they end up really boxed up in it. And if it gets around the front of their face, like the whale you saw there in the previous slide from Provincetown, then they can't open their mouth to feed. And just because they're big doesn't mean they can snap the ropes, which they can't. They cannot, and they don't. If they could, they would. Okay, some mother and calf. You can see the size of the calf here. This is a newborn down in uh, the southeast coast, Georgia or Florida. It was taken by Florida Fish and Wildlife. And the, the calf is uh, one third of its mother's side, size. So these generally about 15, 45 feet long, and the, mother, the calf is 15 feet and totally dependent on its mother for um, you know, a good uh, three, uh, three quarters of the year, probably. Um, nine months or so after a 12 month gestation these are the callosities along the mother's head uh, you see all the white growths those are thickened skin growths around the mother's face and head down by the nose the nostrils and up right up along the top of the rostrum to the chin and the front of the whale's mouth and these are the identifying marks no other right whale has those callosities in exactly the same spot and that's what meant by getting a good mug shot of a uh, right whale whether it's from the air or horizontally from a boat parallel to the whale, or you're up above the whale looking down as a plane is spinning around and circling over the, over the whale. And you try to get uh, good shots the entire length of the whale's body, but especially where these colossies are placed. And, um, and there's her calf right there, which would have been there after about a 12 month gestation, um, out free here now. And looks at the water that is Georgia or Florida, as you can see there. Okay, and this is a very sad case here, as most are. This is a mother. You can see that calf is a third of her size. Now, as you see, the entire body length the calf is just about lined up with its mother. A uh, newborn like that, usually about 15 feet, as I mentioned, you know, somewhere around that. Like human babies are not all exactly the same size. But um, you can see the rope there coming out of the whale's mouth, going down her body, draping over her body toward her flukes. This was Snow Cone, who we, um, I now presume is dead. She hasn't been seen in, in quite a while. And presumably the calf, maybe that's a dependent calf. Um, if, if the, if the um, um, dependency period had not broken off and had not ended, then that calf would have died too without the support of its mother. Now with a, with a female like that, um, she's not able to recover from the birth because she's wrapped up and that can't feed correctly. Um, they, um, she can't um, provide enough nourishment for the calf because she's producing the milk the calf drinks and she's losing weight herself because her own body weight is um, being diminished uh, because she can't feed herself and she's supporting a calf. So you see um, how that process gets sped up. We have a death of the, uh, the female, of the mother, and then the calf follows. Okay, what is ropeless fishing? We've done a couple of sessions of that here with, with our friend uh, Zach Cliver, who is in Maine and will be speaking this afternoon. I'm not sure exactly on what, but um, it's always good. And he did a whole session here with Rich Ruiz from the state of Washington, who is the um, really the founder of, of good ropeless fishing here. And those of you who can't see the screen here, that's an animation of the ocean, um, uh, a fishing boat on a lobstering boat actually on the 
on, on the surface of the water, a right whale in the water, and down on the bottom, a series of lobster traps. And above that, the rope going up to um, the buoy, marking where the trawl of traps is located. <clears throat> um, the ropeless gear, well, I spent a lot of time with Zach, and I haven't seen it work, but I've certainly heard a lot about it and seen a lot of the animations that Rich Ruiz had. Um, there's a um, button up button up in the lobster boat that sets off a signal. Those of you can see the animation, you can see the four or five lines there, which simulate um, um, <clears throat> uh, electronic pulses, goes down to the lobster trap and causes a flotation device to open. I know every time that Zach has done this, he spent a couple of summers doing this. Back when we were planning um, symposium here number three, um, Zach was uh, living at our house in Maine with us and um, the summer, and he was going out to uh, Kennebunkport uh, with lobstermen and um, testing the gear, and they were 100% successful day after day, trap after trap. The problems have been um, cost, like with anything new, and with um, um, technology. And one of the problems that um, lobstermen know about, um, obviously, is knowing where other people's um, um, ropeless gear is. Because without a buoy up there to mark boundaries, they're likely to lay their gear over each other, uh, which is never a good thing. So um, that can be worked out too with software. But again, it takes a while and it takes money to do. But um, you know, if we can save a species that right now is on the brink of extinction, um, then uh, that's a good thing. And this is a, uh, a radio tag that's um, used to keep track of right whales, or all kinds of whales. In this case, it's a North Atlantic right whale. It's a radio tag that um, sends off signals constantly um, so that um, signals can be received by a receiver on shore and gives you an idea of um, where the whale is all the time. But uh, the, the newer tags also give uh, depth, water temperature, and underwater sounds, and the movement of whales when they're underwater and so forth. They're really uh, quite amazing. And uh, looking at time here. Um, okay, this is a photograph I took a number of years ago in the Bay of Fundy in northern in the very northern Gulf of Maine. We were on the Canadian side here on the Nova Scotia side. And um, I use this so educationally with other groups and other talks than right whales. These were right whales here in this photo. Um, now, this was a group of 25 North Atlantic right whales in a so-called rowdy group. We thought it was a mating group, but we now have other, other questions about what was going on. But um, the uh, there were 20... 22 males and only three females in the group. And the 22 males were all jousting each other for position. And the females are doing everything they could to get away from these guys. You can see the rolling. This one here is on its back rolling. That's a female. What I use the slide for mostly is um, to defend killer whales because we get dozens of reports while we're doing our gray whale work here, um, right across the street really here in, in the uh, Northern California, uh, to people looking from shore when gray whales are migrating. Um, and they see a fluke, like you see there. That's just a that's, that's a whale rolling over, and that's half of its tail fluke. But to many people on shore, they're watching this. They think it's a killer whale, and they see all this rolling going around, and they think uh, it's an attack. They are sure that killer whales are attacking uh, whales. And that's pretty much what it looks like, and I would think the same thing if I um, didn't know. And we get uh, calls every year. Where we get people driving looking for us where we're where we're parked and observing and telling us they're watching an attack and a whale being killed. And um, what they're looking at is actually, it's actually called courtship, which is kind of funny because it looks pretty violent from, from shore. But um, anyway, this was a group of right whales, uh, 22, the, the odds were 22 to three. Now, the reason I say that we don't think that this was um, mating activity is because once we found and verified that calves were being born off of Georgia and Florida in February, it no longer matched up to a 12-month gestation. It was more like 15 or 16 months. And of course, that set off another, um, you know, a lot of debates and figuring and estimating and so forth. So we now think that this may have been preliminaries where females are sorting out the guys they want to eventually have a calf with. And um, 
the actual mating takes some place that we don't know yet in the North Atlantic. Um, and uh, it's completely different than we thought, but that, that happens. I remember landing the plane in Georgia, in Florida, no, Georgia, in 1984. We're all high-fiving each other because we'd found mothers and calves way offshore. And then we stopped to think, well, wait a minute. If they're having calves now, when was mating? Um, okay, and then this is copepods here. This is the uh, tiny bean-sized um, zooplankton or animal plankton that whales feed on. Many whales feed on, in fact, a thousand, maybe more than tens of hundreds of thousands of marine animals feed on these poor little guys. Um, if you're a, if you're a fan of um, SpongeBob um, uh, the square pants, then you've um, you've seen that little wisecracking guy called Copepod with a red dot in his eye, his eye his eyepiece, the red eyepiece. You can see the red there on this. Um, the whales. You know, so small those are. Here's one. Here's a calanus here, typical calanus. And um, can't really point out the red dot there on the screen. Um, this is a uh, now this is a whale feeding on copepods. And we get the picture clearer. Okay, now you're looking at the palate of the mouth. The top of the root whale's mouth, that pink strip, that's the palate. There's the tongue down below, the floor of the mouth and the white tongue. And you can see the baleen hanging down from either side of the mouth, and there's the callosity. Now the whale's closing his mouth, putting the top jaw back into the lower jaw there so it looks like it fits, and they begin rattling the mouth back and forth, the sloshing around to clean off the muck of tens of thousands of uh, copepods that are smushed up inside the baleen. And the, the water goes back out through the baleen plates and gum, the copepods get gummed up on the inside and that's what I was saying. Then the, the right whales have to slosh water around and swallow uh, to get down that mouthful of copepods. The copepods are moving north in the Gulf of Maine, out of the Gulf of Maine, and result in a high mortality of right whales when they began following them. And um, up into Canadian waters when nobody was expecting them, and there was a high degree of ship strike. And um, okay, this is a, a carbon cycle just to show how the um, buildup of carbon dioxide is building up in the <clears throat> environment. Um, I first discovered this in a class I was taking at Stanford last year, and this is readily available off of YouTube. You search around there, there are a number of these carbon pumps, but for um, atmospheric carbon pump, this one. Now watch the sides, on the, uh, the numbers on the sides here are the amount of of the buildup of carbon parts per million of carbon dioxide in the environment. You can see 1979, that's gonna tick up constantly showing the years and you can watch the buildup. And keep an eye on the right-hand side from Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii. You see the last time was, that number was in the 300s parts per million. Okay, and talking through, you can see the line going up. There's two lines there, one is kind of baseline. See the lines going up as the amount of carbon dioxide in the environment builds. So if anybody tells you that's a hoax, that's not happening, you can see it right here. Um, again, it's available on YouTube. Um, this is uh, 300, or we're nearing 360 parts per million. Okay, Mauna Loa in 1989, the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii saw 350 parts per million of carbon dioxide in our environment and our atmosphere for the last time. It's now well up over 350 parts per million. Um, Okay, 19, this is the year 1998, 1999, we were up to 380 parts per million. And uh, 2001, the years ticking by here, it's getting higher and higher, approaching uh, 400 parts per million and over that now by 2005. The foreign department, we started at 336 in 1979. And um, I don't know if that screen sharing sign is everybody's way, but you see it going up to 430 parts per million. And again, in 1979, when we were told it was a hoax, it was th one of the first started of being told it was a hoax, 336 parts per million, and now up to 430 parts per million. And those, you can see this on the screen, this will stop in a moment and this will adjust itself and you'll be able to see during prehistoric times what the um, carbon dioxide level was from uh, core samples taken in ice sheets. Okay, the Mauna Loa, it's gone up to 420. Stop there for this year. Okay, March 1958, we were in 316 parts per million by 79, 336 parts per million. 
the uh, pre-industrial, the pre-industrial, that's before the, um, you know, the technology revolution or industrial revolution, we were at 278 before the industrial revolution. The ice ages, we had 185, and that was probably from the random volcano. We had 185 parts per million, and we're now up to 418, about to cross that threshold of 420, heading to 430, which um, many climate scientists will tell you could be the point of no return. Um, so it's, it is real, and uh, these are some of the causes of it, or results of it. Okay, and then the two films we were talking about, Saving the Right Whale, the Nova production on um, public broadcasting, and another whale, Entangled, which is pretty graphic, which won a lot of awards. And uh, those are two films that um, we highly recommend you look into, see if your library has them, or you can order these directly from PBS and have them in your home library. And uh, they're... Um, they're very educational and they're also very shocking in some ways. You can see the ropes around these whales. All right, thank you all very much. And um, our next speaker will be coming up very quickly. Zach. Mm -hmm. Zach Cliver is going to be our next speaker. Mr. Um, Mr. Ropeless himself. Yes, he is. Scott, thank you so much for your great presentation there and those documentaries too. Entangled and Saving the Right Whale. Uh, from PBS. Uh, they are films that definitely I want to watch. And if you're on YouTube, we're showing all of these things in this presentation live on YouTube, but you can watch it later. I'm Leanne Lindsay, the host today of the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. And we have been listening to Scott Mercer, one of the creators. He and Tree Mercer created the symposium many years ago. And they are now participating in the in the symposium and we just listened to him so right now i'd like to ask scott to come on and tree and uh, uh, discontinue share screen or i can help you do that oh, too okay, yeah. okay. so that will help us go into some questioning that we've got to do here before zach jo joins us he's not here yet Okay. So why don't you guys talk a little bit about our tree, talk a little bit about his presentation just then. I have something to say, though, too, first. SpongeBob SquarePants, those Cocoa Pods. Yeah. yeah, my son was one of the game developers on SpongeBob Tooncast Studio, one of the video games that many video games of SpongeBob. But he watched that so much when he was a kid. So I just thought that was funny that you made that uh, reference. Yeah, I try to bring SpongeBob up in every talk because um, that that show is actually pretty anatomically correct in some ways. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was taken by some uh, crazy marine. That, that was show was dreamed up by some crazy marine biology um, students up at Humboldt. And um, so, anytime your parents tell you stop fooling around with that major or um, with those cartoons, you know, stop and think. <laughs> You could uh, you could have a major show on Cartoon Network. Or... <laughs> so one of the characters, of course, is a cocoa pod, and yeah. cocoa pods are what whales eat. You were saying uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more, um, animal marine animals feed on cocoa pods. Uh, one thing I was kind of rushing through there, but now thank thank you for reminding me. Um, cocoa pods feed very low on the food chain. They're one of the zooplankton that graze on plant plankton, which gives the ocean its green color. And um, Ralph Chami has talked about with plankton, which gives us every other breath, that phytoplankton. Over 50 something percent of our oxygen on the yeah, planet. 50 percent, every other breath. Right. Um, that equivalent. Um, every little cell of plant plankton uh, has an even teenier drop of oil in it so it can stay afloat. And why does it have to stay afloat? So it can photosynthesize and produce that oxygen that we breathe. But you know, it's one great big um, phytoplankton soup out there, and um, copepods are one of the zooplankton or animal plankton members of a community that feed on that. And then along come the very large members, um, the um, right whales, humpbacks, uh, other other animals that might feed um, on copepods um, or on zooplankton come into that the picture right then. But the copepods are extremely important. And when there's an oil spill of any kind, of course, it um, it covers that area so they, they can't photosynthesize. 
Um, so the phytoplankton can't photosynthesize. The copepods, of course, get smothered um, by the petroleum. So oil spills, any kind of toxic waste that gets spilled into the ocean has an effect on that. And if you think, well, I'm not a whale, well, you do have to breathe. And every other breath comes out of the ocean. So we need to think about that. Very, very important. And while we're waiting for Zach Cliver to join us, uh, Tree, do you want to check in with him and see I will. if he's got the correct link to join us on Zoom and YouTube? Uh, we we are listening to Scott Mercer of the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study, who just gave a presentation here on the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium that he and Tree started, uh, what, five years ago, right, Scott, in Mendocino? Yeah, um, you know, right at Point Arena, actually. We dreamed it up back in Maine when we knew we'd spend the winters out here. And winters became winter and early spring. And then eventually, as you know, we, we bought a house here. Um, but we dreamed it up and uh, thought it up, planned it back in, um, I remember, uh, especially one, one winter evening in Maine, um, and what we were going to do and how we were going to go about it. But we weren't familiar that familiar with the area up here. I had, tr I had taught about right whales at U the University of New Hampshire. I uh, know, I'm sorry, you know, I'm confusing them again. Um, gray whales at the University of New Hampshire, but not in great length because at that point we no longer had uh, gray whales on the East Coast. We did it one time hundreds of years ago, but um, so I didn't spend a lot of time on them. But, um, but yeah, you that decided was... to bring a whole bunch of speakers together and your first time was up in the, the village of Mendocino. The first um, annual Ocean Life Symposium. And then the next year we had to go, because of the pandemic, we had to go virtual on radio and YouTube. And we've been doing it ever since. Right and here. Right here. Right here on KGUA in Walala 88.3 FM. It is 11 o'clock, just 11.01 now here on a Friday, October the 6th, 2023. Coming up next, we've got Zach Cliver, who is the director of Miss Decida's consulting group and president of Fluke's International Whale Tours. And Zach is going to be talking to us about reducing whale ship strikes. And also he does data collection technology and building. This is what he's going to be talking about, data co collection technology and building strong maritime partnerships, how they are key. And Zach, thanks so much for joining us today here at KGUA. Welcome. Hey, thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Yes, we're looking forward to your presentation too. And Scott, thank you so much for your presentation. And we'll be back at the end to ask you a bunch of questions. So take it away, Zach. <laughs> you're, you're live on YouTube and on air at 88.3 FM, streaming at kgua.org. And he's just now bringing up his presentation on whale ship strikes, data collection, technology, and building strong maritime partnerships, how they are key. Okay, well, thank you. Can, can you see my presentation? Perfectly. Okay, Looks good. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, it's great to, great to be back and great to be with you today. And um, I'm excited to have a chance to talk about whale ship strikes. And um, this is my uh, contact information here for you. If, um, if anybody wants to reach me about anything, you can at uh, ZachCliver at gmail.com. I'm glad that you brought that up too, Zach, because they can also email us at oceanlifesymposium at gmail.com. So either ZachCliver at gmail.com or for anything, oceanlifesymposium at gmail.com. Thanks a lot, Zach. Super. Okay. Oh, wrong presentation. No, I'm just kidding. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this is where I'd like to start. Is just a little um, background um, first about myself and how I got my, connected to um, this issue of of uh, whale ship strikes. Uh, just to give you a little context as to my connection to this and try to make sense. Um, from, from from that perspective. So um, this is a picture of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro with 
some giraffes. And my parents grew up on opposite coasts. My mom was from the West Coast, my dad uh, from the East Coast, but they both loved animals. And my mom went to Africa to teach school, and my dad went as a wildlife, excuse me, as a wildlife artist. And um, they got married there, and I was born there under the under the shadow of Mount Kilimanjaro. And um, so that really spurred um, my uh, love for for nature and and wildlife came from from them from an early age. Um, when they moved back to the United States, they settled on uh, moving to uh, the wilderness or to a place with a lot of wilderness, and that was um, Eastport, Maine, which was the eastern well is the easternmost city in the United States. And uh, here's some pictures uh, you can see. Um, it's uh, uh, got 20 to 28 foot tides and a uh, rich history of fishing of all different types of fisheries, especially cod, incredible um, ocean environment. And I was very um, fortunate to grow up there and we got involved in the commercial fishing industry very quickly. And um, so I grew up out in nature all the time, fishing, uh, bird watching and um, so really fell in love with the natural world and and set off to go to college and chose to go to a small college on the coast of Maine called College of the Atlantic. Here's a picture of one of the main buildings, a beautiful location on Mount Desert Island where Acadia National Park is. And uh, when I was a, a freshman, um, I saw a flyer on the front door of this building that said that uh, the Natural History Museum was organizing a whale watching trip. Uh, and, and I had only seen whales from a distance growing up um, in Eastport. And uh, at one point when I was young, we had, uh, my family, we were out fishing and we found a, a dead whale and we called, I remember we called Allied Whale, the whale research group here at College of the Atlantic to come and find out why the whale had died. So um, this is where uh, I saw this flyer to go whale watching. And so, so I signed up to go whale watching in, in October of my freshman year in college in 1986. And it was a perfect day. It was flat calm and uh, we went out of Lubeck, we left early in the morning, and it was a remarkable trip. We saw everything. We saw finback whales, humpback whales, minke whales, and then once we got further out, um, we got into an area called the Gramanan Basin. It's a deep water kind of bowl in the, at the entrance to the Bay of Funday that uh, at that time was a uh, very important feeding ground for the North Atlantic right whale. And we saw nine right whales. Uh, we had a, a, a mother and calf swim up to the boat and all around us. And then we had uh, right whales breaching off the bow. And then on the way back, we came into this enormous pod of Atlantic white-sided dolphins. And, and to top it off, at the end of the night, we were coming back and it was dark and there was a full moon on the ocean. And, and that was it. I was, I was hooked. I, I just couldn't believe what I had saw. And so that changed my life, that, that, that single trip. And that made me want to study whales and to learn everything I could about them. So that set me on that course. I wound up working at the Whale Research Group at College of the Atlantic, and they have a whale research uh, island, a station called Mount Desert Rock, which is this little three and a half acre island, 21 miles south of Mount Desert Island. And it sits right on this shelf where there's tremendous upwelling and lots of uh, food, uh, schools of plankton and herring, and just uh, a feeding area for whales. And so the Allied Whale was founded by um, a mutual friend of, of Scott Tree and myself, uh, Dr. Steve Katona, and it, um, it just had its 50th anniversary. 
uh, you can see the the lighthouse, um, and it's used uh, as a research station by sending students up in the tower at sunrise to look out for whales and then to go out and study them. So, so I got put out on this island <laughs> to uh, to study whales, and and again fell further in love with the ocean and with whales. And uh, out of that, um, had this uh, opportunity to start working on the whale watching boats in Bar Harbor. And when I when I first started, the boats were small, and they uh, were slow, and they carried few people, and they were single hull boats with propellers. But over time, we built our business up and and moved toward catamarans, and then built these two beautiful boats. Um, the Friendship Five and the Atlantic Cat, and these are the boats that I've done a lot of whale watching on in the Gulf of Maine, uh, out of Bar Harbor, and uh, so this is all getting to to set the stage for the connection with the issue around ship strikes because one of the things that we did as a company and as a natural, you know, as naturalists on the whale watch boats, and by the way, that that second picture to the right. On the top, um, you can see there's a little glass window on the top of the boat there. That's the naturalist uh, station. So that was my office up there um, from the from the top of the boat. It's a little bubble in the front there above the above the captain to look out and to spot whales and and narrate. And so one of the things that we did was whenever we encountered um, right whales we had to call in the sightings to a hotline number that is managed by NOAA. And, and we reported the, the sighting over the marine radio. Uh, we would call the local Coast Guard base and announce it to them. And then they would put out a, 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 a notice over channel 16, which is the working station that all the ships listen to and they would immediately go broadcast it and make sure that they were aware so we uh served as an early warning system for right whales when we sighted them to alert ships about their presence so that they wouldn't get hit and killed that was the objective because ship strike um is a real concern for the north atlantic right whale it's a it's an endangered animal a beautiful animal you can see here up to 60 feet in length they can weigh nearly 200,000 pounds um, much bigger than an elephant <laughs> and uh they uh they're not um the population um in 2010 reached a, a high water mark of about 490 uh since then it's it's fallen again it it uh, has dropped down to 330 Four. That was the last population estimate. Um, back when Scott first started seeing right whales in the 1980s, um, the population was around 300 at that time. So it made this recovery and now it's fallen again. And um, so this is a species that's very susceptible to ship strike. And it's one of the, one of the real concerns for it. And it was in 2020 that uh, the IUCN uh, announced that they were designating it as not just endangered, but um, critically endangered. And if you're not aware, that is, um, it's not just a, a, um, a, a uh, uh, an adjective, it's, a, it's actually a, an official designation. Uh, so there's there's uh, threatened status, endangered status, and then there's critically endangered status. And uh, it, it was put on the, the IUCN um, critical list along with uh, some species of lemur at that time um, from Madagascar. So um, the right whale um, uh, population is... Um, one that's uh, challenged and um, ship strike is one of the big issues. So this was some data I put together from our whale watching trips um, over 30 years uh, from Bar Harbor Whale Watch Company where I where I worked um, showing um, right whale sightings. And you can see uh, actually they're broken into 
to three separate decades. The red dots are from 89 to 1999. The yellow dots are 2000 to 2009. And then the white dots are 2010 to 2019. And um, there was over 100 days that we had sightings of between one to seven whales. And then the the um, the charts below show that same breakdown uh, by month, uh, but all the sightings, but group by month. Um, so you can see that we did um, wind up um, making a lot of calls uh, to the to NOAA and the Coast Guard to announce um, the presence of right whales to to um, alert ships to be on the lookout to to deviate course to to take action um, to try to protect them and not and and, and not um, unintentionally hit them. Um, if you're not familiar with the right whale uh, so much, the North Atlantic right whale, there is a catalog and the, every individual whale is known. And it's maybe the most studied population of whales on earth. There are, there are many, maybe six, seven or more aerial survey teams that go up in planes and they spend thousands of hours between Canada and Florida flying and photographing them from above. And you can tell the individual right whales apart by this beautiful pattern on top of their head. They have uh, these, these, these rough spots on their head that uh, are kind of found uh, similarly to the same place that human males have hair, you know, on their head, on around, above the eyes, uh, on the chin, and um, these are called colossi patterns, and eat, and they they vary a lot between individuals. So you can use these rough white patches on top of the head uh, that are different to each whale to know individual whales, name them, and track them over their lifetime. And not only do they have a catalog where they keep track of all the individual whales and name them, but the each each whale has a report card that that describes its health on a scale of, I think, A through F. And um, this is a way that they help track the overall population health is through this annual report card and seeing how the population's health is do doing overall. And that's a whole list of criteria based on the, the, the amount of fat that the animal has, the number of scars that it has, um, how often it gives birth, all, all sorts of, um, scientific parameters that they've set for that. But here you can also see that the right whale migrates. It goes into Canada and the, U and, and the Gulf of Maine during the summer um, where we would see them and it comes north to feed. And now a lot of them go up into the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the north of the Bay of Fundy um, up above Nova Scotia. But during the winter, uh, a a bunch of the population, a batch, <laughs> maybe uh, around a third, you know, it's thought, um, generally go down to Florida and Georgia for the winter. And uh, so they migrate and they're migrating along the Eastern seaboard, which is one of the bu busiest shipping lanes in the world. And so it's there that they're more um, exposed to the potential of, of ship strike. And this pop, the, the, the whales that go to Florida, Florida and Georgia, those are primarily females. Um, male, some males will go, but primarily females and primarily females that are going there to give birth. And they generally write whales um, give birth every three to four years, but but more recently that um, time span has increased uh, to as much as eight to 10 years for a lot of the females. And they, they think that's because of stress, because of um, all the environmental stress from climate change to even things like entanglement that can, can, can uh, uh, harm them so that they, uh, don't have the energy to give birth and the the kind of energetics that they need to be fully healthy to 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 um, to be successful. So um, 
they when they're in the southeast, they're they're in uh, at the entrance often of, of very busy shipping lanes from from uh, North Carolina, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and northern Florida. Lots of ship shipping ports there that that where ships are coming and going, and um, the right whales, uh, the females often go closer to shore to give birth, so they're more likely to get hit, the, and they're critically important. So out of that population of 334 or 36, um, it's thought that there's probably only about 70 to 80 females that are viable for, for uh, mating and giving birth. So that's, that's really, um, right, when you think it's not, uh, uh, there's only what's really holding this population, holding the line for this population is the fact that there's there's that 70 to 80 females. So um, part of the work that I also did that relates to ship strikes is, is for 10 years, I worked during the winter months when the right whales were there um, with the right whale observer program. And uh, in that program, um, I was occasionally up in planes, but mostly I was, um, living on ships and um i was hired to go out to sea for typically three or four weeks and the ships that i was stationed on were um under the 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 direction of the army corps of engineers and and these were ships that are privately owned that are hired to dredge uh, which is to dig out the channels for the big shipping ports um like uh charleston and savannah and jacksonville florida so that the ships could travel in and out safely because it's of course very sandy and shallow there so we were in the shipping channels we were often in trying to dig them so that there'd be at least 40 or 50 feet of water but out to the out on the outsides of the channel it might only be 20 20 feet or 30 feet so these constantly have to be tended, and so uh, they hire out this fleet of of ships to that that are designed to dig up the sand and then carry it offshore and dump it. And the ship on the on the in the top there on the left is the McFarland. That was a ship I worked on, and then also the Eagle One. And uh, my my job was uh, both sea turtle and marine and 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 whale. Uh, observer, the sea turtle piece was often they're they're sucking up a lot of material from the seafloor and they kill sea turtles in the process. So once they're done doing the dredging, you have to go check uh, these boxes that screen that filter for sea turtles and see uh, if they if they have um, killed any in the process of dredging. Um, and um, then from sunrise to sunset we'd be stationed on the top. There were typically two observers per ship, and we would be up on top of the boat looking out for right whales. And part of that was to uh, an effort for us to then um, reduce our speed so we were not traveling at night at full speed in that area where right whales were, but a lot of it too also to, to warn the, the Navy ships and submarines that were coming and going and uh, cruise ships and freighters and tankers uh, to slow down. And they would, um, there, is a, there is a seasonal um, uh, uh, active management area there where they would, they would uh, ask the ships to slow down to 10 knots as a way to reduce the chance of ships hitting whales. So uh, that's, what I did for 10 years. And, and I want to tell you one story that relates to that, that, that is a, one of the reasons why personally this issue of ship strikes has, um, well, there's, there's actually, maybe there's two stories here. <laughs> uh, the, the first story is um, when I was stationed on the Eagle One and we were in Northern Florida and we were headed out of the channel. We were, I was up on top of the ship and we were dredging in the channel. And then we picked up and we were traveling at full speed out of the shipping channel to go offshore to dump all the sand that we had put into the middle of the ship. And 
So we got out about a mile or two from where we were, and I, I had been looking with my binoculars all the time, just scanning the ocean, scanning the ocean every direction, right? And uh, I look up, and, and right on the edge of the channel, swimming into the channel, exactly where we were headed was a right whale. I saw it blow, and I saw it come up right on the channel, coming right into the channel. And I leaped off of the top of the ship. Like I was like Spider-Man down onto the bridge wing and uh, ran into the pilot house and, and uh, you know, yelled out that there was a right whale right ahead of us in the channel. And the, the mate driving the ship pulled back on the, on the engines, you know, really quick. So the ship came to an abrupt, you know, um, stop. And uh, well, not stop, but at least slow down quickly, I would say, because it takes a while for ships to slow down. And on board was the owner of the ship, and he happened to be there that day. Uh, he owned about 10, 10 or 12 of these ships. And he came running up to the top of the ship along with um, the captain, and they, we, we, at that point, we, we could, the, the mate had saw the whale in the channel. We had, we had slowed and turned. So we were on the edge of the channel and kind of turned a little bit broadside. And the whale was right there in the middle of the channel, just sitting there and breathing and swimming slowly. And the captain, the owner, the mate, they all, we all looking out together. And the, the, the owner of the company turns to me and he goes, well, I guess that's why you're here. <laughs> and uh, it was a it was a very profound thing for me. I don't know if I saved a whale from being hit by a ship, but I think it's possible. And um, I feel like it was kind of a, a beautiful thing from the universe, almost a gift to have that opportunity to to be part of that and uh, and 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 maybe help save an individual whale. Um, one of my one of my favorite whales. This is the other story. Here is uh, was, was the whale I saw and identified because it was very easy to identify, and that was this right whale named Stumpy. And you can see uh, she had a beautiful tail. It had a piece missing uh, on the right side, and and I don't know how um, that happened. Like what what caused that piece of tail to um, to be removed. But she also had this, this most of most right whale tails are all black, right? And she had this beautiful white circular mark, almost like a UFO on the left side of her fluke, on the underside of the fluke. So a very recognizable tail. And I had photographed her off of Bar Harbor on a trip, submitted my picture and found out who she was. And uh, so I followed her. I always wanted to know where she was and what she was doing. And I, I knew when she, I'd hear occasionally that she had had a calf uh, because she was a mother whale. My, my trip had been in dense fog when, I, when we found her and we followed her for a while and I took pictures and that was, a, it was a, just a beautiful day for me. I think it was back in the early 1990s. So, in 2003, um, I had left the dredging. I had gone back to north to Maine, and I was not down south, but um, it was late winter, and we got the report that that Stumpy had been hit and killed by a ship. She had been swimming down in that uh, area um, off of um, North Carolina, and she had been hit and killed by a ship, and they had brought her ashore. And they did the necropsy, and then the North Carolina Natural History Museum um, put in a petition to NOAA, and they were able to acquire her skeleton. And that picture you see now in the lower um, left corner there is a picture of her skeleton, and that's on display uh, if you want to see it at the at the North Carolina Natural History Museum, and um this the other sad thing about her demise was that at the time she was hit she was pregnant and she had a baby so the baby's skeleton i believe is also on display there so um these are some of the kind of backdrop that um 
or why um, I um, why I'm very passionate about this issue and 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 um, interested in it and want to help make uh, a difference. Um, the last the last piece of this would be that uh, I uh, I also worked with the Great Whale Conservancy through my consulting business and help set up a program that we launched called Strike Maps. And it, the idea with there was basically just to take the whale data of everywhere of, of all the information that we had uh, for especially for the endangered whales like the right whale and blue whale, and and uh, put that into a uh, software system where we could lay out all the sightings and then track with all the ships they have AIS that tracks them. Uh, satellite tracking and um, you can pay to purchase that data and then just overlay all that shipping data and and start um, figuring out um, where there was higher degrees of risk and move in an effort to to consider um, proposals to move shipping lanes and that's that's um uh that that project is no longer um uh work um uh in um uh, in the works we we um we uh, did that for a few years but we really um lacked um find you know larger financial support to put that all in motion but um this uh the these efforts uh to to um uh put da the data of whales and ships together are what has been used a lot in addressing this issue and, and as a solution. So I wanna to talk to you about that. I have some uh, things to share about like what I think the, the, the present, the, the, the past, the present and the future um, are around this issue, but um, I think it's maybe first important to talk a little bit about the the history of this issue, um, how uh, you know maybe the scale of the problem, and then how how this happens, right? Because an important question is how do whales get hit by ships? So uh, apparently the first uh, ship uh, documented ship strike on a whale happened in the 1880s and uh you can see by this uh, graph that um it kind of coincided with the uh, ships getting bigger and faster and the average speed of ships traveling um, across the atlantic was increasing over time and it was at that time in the 1890s when ships started traveling at an average speed of oh, close to 15 knots that uh a uh um that a that a whale i think it was a fin whale was hit by hit by a ship um so there this this issue is uh long standing of course you know there's no no mariner no captain no no shipping industry that that wants to purposefully hit a whale this is incidental it's accidental um and uh it is uh it's not uh, it's not something that they're setting out to do. So let's just you know make that abundantly clear. Um, but it, it uh, sadly, um, whales can be injured severely, and and many of them get killed by by being hit by ships. Um, this was uh, uh, taken from a report that the International Whaling Commission put together. It's online if you want to go look at it, and it's very comprehensive. They've kept an inventory of ship strikes um, that and, and and tried to track it um, globally uh, over time. And they had they, although they're um, you know whaling is in the name of the organization, they have a real commitment to the conservation of whales around the world. Um, and so they have a group of scientists that work on the ship strike issue. And uh, you can see that uh, 
there are places in the ocean where there's more ship strikes, the Atlantic, everywhere the, the, on that map where there's dark color, that's where there's an increase uh, or a higher amount of, of ship strikes. Um, here you can see by ocean, the total ship strikes per ocean on average is 907. And that's that these are documented, you know, uh, uh, ship strikes. That's important to keep in mind because it's scientists believe that a lot of the ship strikes um, that happen um, go unobserved, right? So, um, you can see that the Atlantic Ocean is a real hot spot for ship strikes. And okay, 907 per ocean, but it's the, it's thought that um, that it's probably we're probably looking at hundreds of whales annually um, uh, might might be hit by ships. Now, for example, the North Atlantic right whale that we talked about earlier, uh, of the two things that are most affecting that population, ship strikes are one. And this was a paper that was done um, looking at the, the health uh, effects. And there was also another similar paper done, this one with by Michael Moore and others, a whole team of veterinary scientists and people that do the necropsies. There was also a paper done more recently by Sarah Sharp, uh, looking at 20 years of data, and they looked at all the necropsies, and there they found that 42% uh, in this most recent 20-year assessment were related to ship strikes. 58% uh, were related to entanglement. Um, but 42% is, is high, and um, it's, it's thought that um, in the last um, uh, in the last uh, fifty years since this has been studied, there's been well over a hundred right whales that have been hit and killed by ships. So when you're talking about a population that's so on the edge of survival, um, that can make all the difference in the in the world. Right, the, those those animals. It's really the these these anthropogenic uh, threats of entanglement and uh, ship and ship strike that are, that are really um, at the heart of holding this population down. And one reason we know this is that the average uh, uh, reproductive growth rate in that population um, over um, an over thirty year period, if you look, the the average growth rate was about one to two percent. OK, while in the sub southern hemisphere with the southern right whale, that's a different species, but it's similar and occupies a similar habitat, feeds on the same food. Three populations there, one in Argentina, one in South Africa and one in Australia. Those three populations were growing at five to seven percent annually. And there, uh, those two issues of ship strike and and. Uh, whale entanglement are are not as prevalent. So um, Zach, we know. Zach, I just wanted to jump in and let people know that they're who they're listening to. And this yep. is Zach Cliver. He's the director of Mysticitas Consulting Group and president of Flukes International Whale Tours. And we'll tell more about his background too and uh, after the end of his presentation, but this is KGUA in Wallala, 88.3 FM. And this is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. I just wanted to let people know who was talking. Thanks, Thanks Zach. Thank you. And thank you for the uh, chance to let me have a drink. <laughs> um, here is uh, the North Pacific blue whale. Another population is thought Recent estimates have, have estimated as many as 80 whales are dying annually on the West Coast and in the Pacific. And one again, another population that is 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 um, um, the numbers are low, and uh, every whale counts. And if if just you know, uh, if every year you're taking uh, uh, a certain amount of whales from this population by ship strikes. Uh, you have to remember that 
you know, if the population is only br bringing 20 whales in and 20 are being hit by ships, you're not going to you're not going to do real well <laughs> in recovering this population. So um, this is uh, this is um, what another population that that is really um, prone. And one of the interesting studies that was done in, in, out in California putting lar large volumes and ship sound underwater and, and managing, uh, well, monitoring the whales to see what their behavior was. For the blue whale, when they hear the sound of ships, they go into this interesting behavior where they kind of go just under the surface of the water and they swim near the surface and they stay just under the surface and they go very slow swimming across the top of the water for a long stretch before they come up. And it's not clear where, why or evolutionarily why they would do that, but um, that puts them in, in even more risk of being hit, right? Is by, by this kind of cloaking behavior that they have um, really puts them in more harm's way. So um, the question becomes, how do whales get hit by ships? Um, that That's important, right? So, you know, what? hey, why don't they just hear the sound of the ship and dive down and get out of the way? Um, well, what, what is going on here, if you think about the hull of a ship and how it's designed, the propellers in these very big ships are underneath and behind the ship. So the way that sound travels underwater, it's not like air. It uh, water it travels the faster, um, four to five times faster than air. But the hull of the ship itself blocks the sound from going forward. So there's a lot of noise that goes out from each side of the ship and going behind uh, behind the ship. But um, there is um, Little to no noise that um, go that that is produced underwater in front of the ship. So this means that um, whale, whales may not hear a big ship approaching. Right, or the ship is approaching qu quickly, and and also if you've ever been underwater and listened to noise, if you're underwater and you're listening, it's hard to tell where the noise is coming from exactly. So they may hear noise, but it's it's hard to um, because it's traveling so quickly to know exactly which direction it's coming from. So whales are spending a lot of time, especially near shipping lanes, at the surface feeding, um, and uh, it may be that especially at night, if they're feeding near the surface or resting, and ships are moving quick and they don't know where they are. That um, that this is how they're getting hit. That's 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 the thought. And um, so, what can we what can we do? Well, one thing uh, that's been observed is um, over time is this uh, idea that by but ships traveling faster, there's less chance for whales, less opportunity for them to react and to um, to move out of the way if the ship is going fast. So there's less chance if they, if if the ship is going slower, it, it may give them more of a chance to hear the ship or to get out of the way. And so you can see this graph where there was some, some there's been research done that shows um, the, the, this relationship between um, uh, injuries, and the, the speed of the ship um, showed that the in, increasing ship speed actually resulted in more, um, more, a greater chance of mortality. So one of the, 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 the ideas that's been used in an effort to address this issue is to slow ships down. And, and um, I've talked to the gentleman who was responsible for this, what's called the 10 knot rule that's Kind of broadly used. Um, you can see this graph um, shows, you know, and there, there's been papers that have done that have been done that say, hey, if you're going at eight knots, you can still kill a whale too. But 
somehow they landed on this 10 knots this seemed um reasonable and um and uh this is this the kind of the standard that's used at this point in areas where there are uh, an abundance of whales when they put in seasonal dynamic management closures is to to ask them to go to 10 to 10 knots to slow the ships down so this is one method another uh method that has been very successful in the past this is and and doesn't mean that we want to apply it now in the future but this is something that these are these are um, methods that were um, developed they're basically just taking you know the sightings data and the ships and overlaying them and um and that is just simply to when, when we discover that there's an area where there's a lot of whales and there's a ship traffic lane there is to to move the shipping lane so this was done successfully in the bay of funday you can see this uh graph uh showing that graham and ann uh basin that i was telling you about earlier uh the area i visited when i when I first went whale watching, it's uh, highlighted in green and blue on that chart. And uh, this was uh, uh, research that was done by the New England Aquarium, and then uh, I think added to by the Canadian Whale Institute with, um, with Mo Brown. And that basically the data showed uh, there was a huge number of right whales in this one area, but they were very concentrated and if you can move the shipping the shipping lane went right through an important part of the area well if you can move the shipping lane over about 15 to 20 miles so that the elbow was further you know the ships traveled straight and then turned later and then go right through the Graham and Ann basin that there are a lot of ships that are going up to St. John New Brunswick and this is in the Bay of Funday in the Gulf of Maine and so uh they were able to do that um, Mo Brown met with Irving Oil. Uh, they have an oil refinery where there's a lot of oil tankers and uh, sat down with them, uh, uh, started talking to the shipping industry, uh, working with them, working with Canadian officials. They went to the IMO and uh, they were able uh, relatively quickly to get that shipping lane change, which was really a remarkable, uh, heroic um, thing to do and immediately made a difference they had, had a number of right whales that had been hit and killed by ships in the years leading up to this and as soon as they did this uh that that uh, uh plummeted the, the the number of whales being hit by ships plummeted this was also done by folks in the boston area this is a map of the coast of massachusetts with boston right in that circular where the circle is, that would be Boston Harbor. And here are sightings of right whales um, from largely from whale watch boats, but also research trips. And you can see the color um, where it's red shows a high density of right whales over time. And David Wiley, uh, an amazing scientist at NOAA, um, who's worked in this area for years, um, put this together and was able to show the shipping industry that the shipping lane, which you can see is in solid black lines, the dotted lines are the proposed shipping change, um, but that shipping lane, the way it was created, went right through one of the areas where right whales are most abundant when they're there. And right whales were um were and and still are there in great abundance in the late um late winter and early spring there right off of um, cape cod and in massachusetts bay so that would be um february march april and into may and so they were able to move the shipping lane so this was a a, a very um successful effort in being able to reduce ship strikes here's some of those policy changes that were put in place um, around protecting right whales especially uh, another area was off of roseway basin off nova scotia no, again another area that was important for right whales and they were able to put in a a shipping change lane there to divert the ships around roseway basin off of nova scotia and um, all these things uh made a difference However, uh, more recently, 
right whales have been being hit on the eastern seaboard um, still by some big ships, but but more but more um, is my understanding from what I've read and reading the, some of the reports um, that. Uh, uh, more recreational vehicles, boats that are under 65 feet with propellers that are fast, um, either uh, maybe going for sport fishing or recreation, have been um, as responsible as, as big ships. So there's now a big effort to um, address this with the right whale um, to update those, those plans um, for um how they would uh, uh the, the new new policy changes so here's another thing that was put into place that was very cool this whale alert um it was basically an opportunity for people to uh post uh well any sightings that came in would be posted on this whale alert all the aerial sightings uh, any reports from ships um and likewise excuse me, reports from whale watch boats, and likewise, um, uh, any sightings that people submitted where they submitted a picture and it was confirmed, and this was then available for ship the shipping industry to go see, oh, and along with all the acoustic data, they would have acoustic buoys in real time monitoring, listening for right whales. It was all available there for the ships to see exactly what was happening in real time. So this has been another, um, cool piece of technology that's been used. Now, more, more recently, this incredible program came and I and one of my friends uh, describes this. He worked done a lot of work with the Navy trying to address the whale, um, whale issues. And he said, what the Navy uses is a modality of data. They use layers of information. And this is what the Whale Safe program at the University of Santa Barbara through the Benoff Ocean Initiative did. Uh, there and I think it's this incredible model of of using layers of data. They took all the sightings data from whale watching boats. Of this is for blue whales and whales in the in the Los Angeles Long Beach area off of California, and they put those down. They matched them to all the oceanographic data so they could see when the abundance related to increasing or decreasing water temperatures. Uh, then they put real-time acoustic buoys out there, gliders and, and fixed buoys to collect acoustic signals of whales and to listen in on where the whales were and to know if whales were present. And uh, then they did uh, modeling of the, the environment and, um, and uh, used satellites to do that, to map, model what was happening in the ocean and to show uh, forecast out for the future, and they created a system where they could inform the ships when there was a higher risk of whale being hit of whale ship strikes. So I think this is where we want to go, and there's a lot of additional technology could be applied to this kind of a system, uh, including satellites and infrared. Now is becoming um, a, an amazing technology that ha holds a lot of promise. The idea of using infrared on the bow of ships to locate their heat signatures or their their blows. Um, satellites from space that would be to use satellites to actually find whales. Use drones to fly over the ocean. Use drones in the ocean to listen to them. And it's really this combination of, um, I know I'm getting to the end of my time here, but it's really this combination of data. It's, it's when we can apply layers of data, lots of data, that's how we're gonna address this issue. We don't wanna stop shipping. We need the goods from ships, um, but we, we can use technology to help us in and especially layers of technology. And I'm very excited that uh, the, the Biden administration through the Infrastructure Act just announced $82 million um, to address um, issues around right whales and ship strikes. 20 million is going towards new, um, towards uh, addressing the ship strike issue. Uh, a lot of money towards acoustics and even satellite tagging whales, individual whales and trying to develop that uh, technology, so it's not harming the whales, but could be very informative. That's so, really 
important, Zach, because uh, we just had <laughs> Senator Mike McGuire here, and that was one of our questions. What is the government doing to prevent these ship strikes? And you just pointed out 82 million that Biden has just announced. And it is a combination of all these things. You've got the public chipping in on a whale alert app of all things, how genius that is. And and then the whale safe project and all that that includes. It's really, in you know, um, heartening to see all these different solutions that are coming to the fore. And I know you're right at the end of your presentation. I just wanted to jump in there and then we can uh, talk to you. We've, we've got a lot of questions here. And then we've got coming up Laura Crane. And this is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium here on KGUA. Zach, go ahead and finish up. Okay, great. Well, um, I am I am very excited to be working with a group in New York City. Now, New York, uh, recently it was announced that the New York, New Jersey complex has uh, become the number one shipping port in the United States. And it's been a lot in the news in on the East Coast of the amount of ship, the excuse me, the amount of whales that are, are dying on the East Coast. There's unusual mor mortality events for humpbacks and minkies and right whales. And um, it's not only shipping, but it, it, shipping is at the heart of what's going on there. And uh, this organization I'm working with is called Gotham Whale. It's a New York City-based whale research group. And we are working now uh, to look, meet with the shipping industry, with the offshore wind industry, and develop a partnership with them so that we can reach across the aisle. At the heart of all this, it doesn't matter. You can have all the technology in the world, but if you don't have people coming together, you're not going to get things done. And I'm very excited about the opportunity we have um, to address this um, and work. I think it's really important we work with the industries um, that are have a lot of ships on the water and work with the, the those that are impacted by rules. So um, hopefully, if we do that, this is a view of Mount Everest, and this is a view from it. And that's where we want to be. With this. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has, Margaret Mead. Thank you so much, Zach Cliver. We are so fortunate to have you and Scott Mercer together. What a combination of talent. I'm just going to take a moment to just recap a little bit for our audience. Your background and Scott's, this is an incredible collection of of knowledge and talent. And you've been a Maine-based ocean science education and conservation consultant. You're the director of Mysticetus. Um, I said that wrong, Mysticetus Consulting Group. I've Perfect. been practicing <laughs> uh, the president of Flukes International Whale Tours and a board member, as you just said, of Gotham Whale, New York City's whale research group. And Zach has worked as a whale watch naturalist for over 30 years and led over 3,000 whale and seabird trips with over 700,000 passengers on the Gulf of Maine and co-founded and co-chairs the North Atlantic Whale Watch Naturalist Association. And that includes naturalists from Newfoundland to Virginia. And during the last four years, he has worked extensively with fishermen and gear developers and ropeless fishing gear to improve fisheries and reduce whale entanglement and fishing lines and just looking at those boats that you were on they were enormous whale boats and you were talking about how your office was up above the captains and how when you were looking through your binoculars down at the channel and you saw that right whale and you leapt down to say hey there's a whale out there that was incredible that you did that uh, Zach, and thank you so much for being here. And and I, you know, you and Scott are good friends, but I'm going to wrap it up real quick because we're getting close to the 12 o'clock hour and our next guest. But Scott began studying marine mammals in 1974 in Monterey Bay with extended study of the feeding ecology of sea otters. And then afterwards, he founded New England Whale Watch, Inc. to offer firsthand ocean life education to the public and to also collect data on the whales being observed. And he was recently interviewed for his role as a pioneer 
in Atlantic Coast whale watching by the Nash, National well, NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And as a part of the history of the whale watching industry in New England, I can say more, Scott, but Zach, I'd like you and Scott to talk for a moment. If you could uh, go ahead and end your presentation and let's bring back Scott so we can see you here. And let's see if we can get Scott um, to un... Uh, to start your video, and then I'll put you into gallery. I'm both I'm both host and engineer. All right, so Scott, <laughs> we've got you back. We almost have your audio on. Just turn that on, and then you and Zach, good friends, can chat for just a moment before we enter into Laura Cranes. Well, I would just say that Scott um, and Teresa have been mentors to me. And I'm very uh, honored and privileged to know them and uh, thank them for all that they've done in putting this together and, and just um, being uh, mentors to so many of us in the ocean and whale um, field. You know, thanks, Zach. I was mentioned that you, um, you were interviewed during that same process because you had been in the whale watching industry quite a while. So I guess we know we've been around a long time and we're historical items. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I guess we're on it. Um, <laughs> and you were yeah, born in Nairobi, Kenya. Yep. Yeah, I and I and I also have a sperm whale injury, you know. So I know I'm old because of my sperm whale injury. When did that happen? Uh, on Moby Dick. <laughs> on Moby Dick. <laughs> yeah, <it's> ancient <laughs> yeah <laughs> well thank you zach for joining us today here on the okay. fifth annual ocean life symposium really appreciate thank having you on thank you so much all right thank you scott yeah. for coordinating this with tree mercer and myself as producer and host i'm leanne Lindsay. this is kgua in walala 88.3 fm we are also on youtube so you can go and watch these presentations later you can watch them now you can listen in online at kgua.org it's just now 12 o'clock and it's warm outside it's 77 degrees here on the coast in october and scott that's another thing i wanted to bring up with you and zach but he's gone now but September was the warmest, and maybe Laura Crane, who's just now coming on, can comment on this too, but it's the warmest on record. So climate change does have an impact on all these ocean environments and the life within our oceans. So that was one thing I wanted to bring up, and I'm going to introduce Laura, but I just wondered if you had a comment on that, Scott. Uh, yeah, and we're talking about the migration of um some uh, many species out of the Gulf of Maine up into the Canadian Maritimes. I know Laura knows a lot about this, but one a critical one to the economy of Maine, of course, is the uh, good old lobster. And there was an article in the paper a couple of weeks ago that we got out here in California about um, some lobstermen are switching over, they're hybridizing their industry into growing seaweed. So um, that was something that we, with the ropeless gear, some of the things that we were telling people was, the lobster industry has more to worry about than ropeless gear. Some a big force they can't stop, which is going to be climate change, and everybody better be ready for that. Well, maybe this is a good lead-in to you, Laura, because your topic is crabs on the move, monitoring the range expansion of blue crabs in the Gulf of Maine, and I just want to let our listeners know that. Laura Crane is a marine ecologist and researcher at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve in Maine. And that is part of a network of 30 research reserves located across the country. She received a BS in marine science from Ryder University and an MS in marine biology from the University of Massachusetts, Dartmouth. Laura is involved in a wide range of research projects looking at the impacts of climate change on Maine's coastal ecosystems from shifting plant communities and salt marshes to the spread of invasive species to the range expansion again of the blue crabs into the Gulf of Maine. Welcome to the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium, Laura. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, really an honor to be able to uh, share my research um, all the way from the East Coast <laughs> with people in California. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for joining us and we'll go ahead and uh, leave off of here so you can begin your presentation then we'll join you at the end of it.
Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Let me try sharing my screen. And as she does, I'll remind everybody, this is KGUA in Wallala 88.3 FM. Okay. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me again. Um, presenting all the way from uh, the East Coast in Maine. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the range expansion of blue crab. So as Leanne mentioned, um, climate change is causing waters to get warmer over time, especially the Gulf of Maine in particular is actually one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world. And so we're seeing a lot of change in this system. And one of those is the range expansion of blue crabs into the Gulf of Maine. And now while I'm presenting from the East Coast and the blue crab is an East Coast species, I think there's a lot that can be learned from this range expansion that can actually be applied to things happening on the West Coast. So climate change is a global issue and the range expansion of species is a global issue. Uh, so the thing, I think there's a lot that can be learned from this and applied in other places as well. So crab species are all over the world. There's a huge diversity of crabs uh, that live in all kinds of environments around the world. Uh, crabs, different crab species have different adaptations for living in different environments. Uh, they have adaptations for uh, different environmental conditions like different uh, water temperatures, salinity, dissolved oxygen. Their populations are affected by the presence of other species in the environment, including predators and prey or food items. And they're affected by what habitats are available in those areas. So some species are more adapted to living in sandy habitats, while others prefer rocky intertidal zones, and still others like to live in the deep ocean. Uh, so all these different adaptations mean that we have a wide diversity of different crab species spread out all over the world. But these different species are adapted to very specific locations. Uh, however, with especially recently with a lot of uh, human activity and global climate change, we're seeing a lot of changes in where these species can be found. And so today, uh, my talk is titled Crabs on the Move. Uh, so there's a few different ways that crabs can get around and start moving to different parts of the globe. Uh, one of those ways is through uh, species invasions. So invasive species are species that are actually transplanted from one place to another, typically from human activities. So they're basically being picked up and carried to another location and dropped off. Um, like I mentioned, different species are adapted to different environments, though. So there's a chance they get dropped off in that new environment and the conditions aren't right and they can't survive. But other species, uh, depending on where they get dropped off, are able to survive in that new environment and they're able to thrive. And if their population gets large enough, they are able to have um, impacts on the local ecosystems. So ways that species get transported. One way is uh, a major vector of invasive marine invasive species is through shipping activities. So big ships will pull water up into what's called the ballast. They'll move across the ocean and dump that ballast water out in a new location. The problem with this is that small marine organisms can get sucked up into that ballast water and then transported to a totally different location. And so this can be a really major vector for uh, invasive species. Another way that they could be transported is just hitching a ride on the side of a ship. Uh, so things like barnacles and other things that can attach to surfaces are able to attach to the side of a boat or the hull of a boat. And that's another way that they can be moved to totally different locations. 
This is why uh, if you go boating in lakes, for example, there's often signs that remind you to clean off your boat before going into the lake and when coming out of the lake. And this is because we don't want different species that could be attached to that boat being transported from one lake to another. Another way uh, invasive species can get moved around is through the pet trade. So a uh, lionfish is a, a major example of this. Um, this was uh, a species that was very popular in aquariums. But if you have a pet and you decide you don't want it anymore, some people will just dump it out into the natural environment and figure it's just going to be fine and it'll go live uh, somewhere else. Uh, the problem with this is if that's not that species native range, and it becomes successful in that environment, um, it has the potential to form a population there where there was not a population before. And so then you have the problem of invasive species. A major example of a really notorious invasive species is the European green crab. And you may have heard of this species on the West Coast as well as it's becoming uh, more and more of a concern over there. The European green crab is a crab species that's native to Europe. Uh, however, through primarily through shipping trade, uh, this species has been transported to pretty much every continent in the world at this point, and it is uh, really good at surviving in a lot of different environments. So this has allowed it to be very successful in a lot of different places. In particular, I'm uh, from the Gulf of Maine, and the green crab is a major invasive species and a major problem in the Gulf of Maine right now. So if I throw a trap out in the Webhanna estuary where I work and I pull that trap up the next day, I could end up with hundreds of green crabs in that trap overnight. So this is kind of wreaking havoc on the Gulf of Maine. It has really negative consequences for our local ecosystem, for our local species. Um, for example, uh, the soft shell clam has seen major declines since the arrival of the European green crab, as well as other shellfish that have been affected by this. So green crabs can greatly impact native species as well as the fisheries that depend on those species and in the more while green crabs have been on the east coast for over a hundred years now um, more recently they've started showing up on the west coast as well so there's a lot of research and a lot of programs out there right now that are looking for european green crabs trying to understand how far they've spread and trying to mitigate their impacts Another way that crabs can move to another part of the globe is through what's known as range expansion. So this is different from an invasive species in that a range expanding species was already native to that coastline. However, they are expanding their range along that given coastline. And this is typically due to environmental changes. For example, water temperature. So with climate change, we're seeing warming oceans. And as I mentioned, the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming bodies of water in the world. So while the Gulf of Maine originally would have been too cold for a lot of warmer species to survive up here, as the Gulf of Maine gets warmer, it's becoming more hospitable to those warm water species. And so they're able to expand their ranges northward um, because they're now able to survive up here. And that's been seen, that's happening on other coastlines as well. So the species I'm gonna be focusing on today is the blue crab, Calinectes sapidus. Uh, this is a species of swimming crab that is native to the Western Atlantic Ocean and to the Gulf of Mexico. 
its historic range is considered to go all the way from Massachusetts all the way down to Uruguay. So it's a really big range and it is native to this area. It's not an invasive species. And if we zoom in on the northeast of the United States, uh, we can see that its historic range was considered to go as far north as Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Going back to the 1860s, we have seen a few rare occurrences of blue crabs showing up in the Gulf of Maine, but it was just kind of, you know, a blue crab here and a blue crab there, not really setting up permanent populations. And we typically see these occasional blue crabs after we had some a warmer year of water temperatures. But typically the Gulf of Maine, especially the winter temperatures, were too cold for blue crabs to survive. So they might be able to survive in the summer, but when those cold Maine winters hit, it's just too cold for the blue crabs to survive, and that would knock down any blue crabs that were trying to uh, live up there. However, as I mentioned, the Gulf of Maine is getting warmer. And now the question is, is the Gulf of Maine now warm enough for blue crabs to survive and to set up populations up here? So in the recent past, we've been seeing within the last few years, uh, increasing number of blue crab observations. And it's starting to look like they're setting up populations in the Gulf of Maine, rather than just these rare observations. So the blue crab is a swimming species of crab. It's um, so what makes it a swimming crab is this these unique swimming paddles on uh, the back of, the, of its body. So crabs typically have eight walking legs and two claws, uh, but swimming swimming crabs are special because the backmost pair of walking legs is actually flattened into these little uh, round paddles that allow it to swim through the water instead of just walking around on the sand. And there's actually um, a few species of swimming crabs on the west coast. For example, the Xantus swimming crab, Portuna santusii. Um, so while the blue crab is only on the east coast, there are some swimming crabs on the west coast as well. Um, the Xantus swimming crab like the blue crab is a warm water species. So it's typically found in Southern California going down into Mexico. Um, but because this is a warm water species, you know, there are things we can learn from the range expansion of blue crabs. And maybe we better start keeping an eye on some of the warm water species in California as well. So why do we care about the range expansion of a species? It's already native to that coastline. So is it really a big deal if it starts to expand its range northward? Um, like invasive species, however, range expansions can also have impacts on local ecosystems. Uh, these could be positive impacts, but they could also be negative impacts. So we're focusing on the blue crab today. So whenever I talk to fishermen or, you know, random people at the dock and I tell them I'm researching the range expansion of blue crabs, the big question they always have is, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing that blue crabs are here now? And I have to usually tell them, well, we're not sure. Um, it could be good or it could be bad. Um, so one good outcome that could come out of this is, well, the good thing about blue crabs is they're delicious. <laughs> their name, uh, their scientific name, Kalanectes sapidus, literally means uh, savory and beautiful swimmer. Um, so they really do live up to that name. They're a delicious species of crab, and they form a very lucrative fishery in the Chesapeake Bay, as well as in the Gulf of Mexico. So if populations were to get large enough in the Gulf of Maine, uh, this could become, there's a potential for it to become a new fishery. So that would be good. Uh, we also talked about what a big nuisance the European green crab is in the Gulf of Maine. 
And there are several studies out there that look at the interactions between blue crabs and green crabs that seem to show that blue crabs have the potential to be a new predator of the green crab. So this would be really good for the Gulf of Maine as well, because while the blue crab is not going to eliminate green crabs from the area, it would be really great if they could start to reduce green crab populations. On the other hand, however, uh, like green crabs, blue crabs also love to eat all kinds of shellfish. So we have to think about the impacts they might have on native shellfish populations uh, like clams and mussels. And in particular, lobster is a major fishery in the Gulf of Maine. And so we need to better understand what kind of interactions they might have with lobsters. Um, are they going to compete with them for food and habitat space? Um, I don't think an adult blue crab is going to be able to defeat a large lobster, uh, but what might that blue crab do to a smaller juvenile lobster? So these are the kinds of questions that researchers are starting to look into now to better understand what kind of positive or negative impacts blue crabs could have. So it's really important uh, with either an invasive species or a ran range expanding species that we do monitoring and research to be able to help mitigate the impacts they're going to have. Uh, through monitoring programs, we're able to detect the arrival of these new species early on. It's really important that you detect these arrivals as early as you can, because the sooner you find them, the sooner you can start to do something about it. Monitoring also allows us to better understand their population dynamics and their life history in the new range. And research allows us to understand the impacts that they might have on local ecosystems and local fisheries. On the flip side, uh, research can also help us to explore new fishery opportunities for these new species. So I am a research associate at the Wells Reserve. Um, we're located in Wells, Maine. And as Leanne mentioned, this is we are a net part of a network of 30 research reserves across the country. And the mission of the Wells Reserve is to understand, protect, um, and restore the coastal ecosystems of the Gulf of Maine through a combination of research, stewardship, environmental learning, and community partnerships. So we've got our research team, we've got an education team, we've got a stewardship team, all working together to help to um, understand and protect these coastal ecosystems. The research I'm involved in at the Wells Reserve can kind of fall under uh, two categories, one being long-term monitoring and the other being uh, research on invasive and range expanding species. So the long-term monitoring I'm involved in um, includes looking at long-term changes in our water quality in uh, our local estuaries. We have plankton surveys that have been going on since 2008, looking at long-term shifts in larval fish and larval crab populations in our estuaries. And we have a salt marsh monitoring project looking at long-term changes in our salt marshes, understanding how sea level rise and climate change are impacting salt marsh environments. And all these uh, long-term changes in our estuaries and in these environments are going to affect, again, this type of species that are able to survive there. So the other research I'm involved in is looking at invasive and range expanding species. We have a program called MIMIC, uh, which is an acronym for a really long name, <laughs> um, but it's essentially a citizen science program where volunteers go to different parts of the coastline year after year looking for the arrival of new invasive species. 
I'm also involved in research looking at that invasive European green crab that I mentioned earlier, and more recently monitoring the range expansion of blue crabs into the Gulf of Maine. So it's this last point that I'm going to be focusing on today. So how did the Wells Reserve get involved in uh, trapping blue crabs in the first place? So a little bit of backstory. Uh, the Wells Reserve is involved in research in two estuaries in Wells, Maine, called the Webhannet Estuary and the Little River Estuary, uh, which include these complex systems of tidal creeks and salt marshes and salt marsh pools. And we've been conducting research out there for decades. And so we've literally had boots on the ground uh, for decades. So we're pretty familiar with what is typic what species are typically found out there. In 2019, however, our research director, Jason Goldstein, was walking around the Little River Estuary Marsh and literally uh, stumbled upon a dead adult blue crab that washed up onto the marsh. So this was really surprising. We knew this was not a species that was typically found here, um, but it was the only one we found that year until the following fall in 2020. Uh, when I was doing some just routine annual salt marsh monitoring in the Webhannet estuary. And I look down in a salt marsh pool and I just see seven blue crabs swimming around this marsh pool. So this was really, really shocking and surprising. And so that's really what prompted our trapping surveys. So starting in the fall of 2020, we started deploying blue crab traps into salt marsh pools to better understand uh, what was going on um, and understand the range expansion of the species. So the overall objectives of our blue crab research and monitoring was one, uh, to provide early evidence of this range expansion. Check, I think we can basically say we've, we've done that at this point. Um, and two, we want to describe the spatiotemporal dynamics of blue crabs in this Southern Maine salt marsh habitat. What do I mean by spatiotemporal dynamics? Uh, well, spatio just means where. So spatio is where are we finding these blue crabs? How are they distributed throughout the estuaries? What habitats are they using? And when I say temporal, I'm talking about uh, when do we see these blue crabs? Uh, in what years are we finding blue crabs? And how are their abundances changing with the seasons? We're also interested in understanding their overwintering habits. So as I mentioned earlier, it's likely the winter temperatures that were preventing blue crabs from living in the Gulf of Maine in the past. So we're really interested in understanding when winter hits, where do these blue crabs go and how do they survive a Maine winter? And finally, is this a permanent population? Are they here to stay? Or is this just an ephemeral population that's going to be here for a couple of years and then the water's going to get cold again and they're going to leave? Um, so that's where long-term uh, trapping surveys come in handy to see how long these blue crabs are going to stick around. To answer these questions, uh, we monitor through a, diff a few different ways. Uh, one is the trapping survey that I've already mentioned. Uh, we've also done some acoustic telemetry studies, which allow us to study the fine scale movements of blue crabs throughout our estuaries. And we've also been conducting plankton surveys, as I mentioned, since 2008. So this is a study that's been set up uh, since 2008 to look at changes in larval fish populations, uh, but we're also capturing larval crabs. So we can use that uh, to look at uh, larval crabs as opposed to adults and juveniles. But we can't do this all alone. Our research is really just focusing on uh, estuaries in Wells, Maine, but we are collaborating a lot with other researchers, sharing our protocols with others who are interested in expanding this trapping to other locations. 
Uh, we work a lot with student interns that help to get all this work done. Uh, we have some awesome community volunteers that help out with these research projects. And recently we set up a Gulf of Maine blue crab network that pulls a lot of uh, Gulf of Maine researchers together who are interested in studying this range expansion. And that's really helped to facilitate some great collaborative projects. So the first project I want to focus on today is our trapping surveys. As I mentioned, we've been trapping in the Webb Hannett and Little River estuaries since 2020. We've been deploying blue crab traps uh, primarily in salt marsh pools because that's where we've been finding them a lot. Um, but we also have a few traps out in tidal creeks in the marsh, as well as off of a dock um, kind of in the main channel of the Webb Hannett estuary. So in 2020, we did more of a pilot study. We only deployed three traps from September to December. Uh, but in 2021, we started uh, deploying, we deployed eight traps and we trapped from April through November. Um, and we've deployed about a dozen traps in 2022 and 2023. Um, and we've been trapping, we're trying to trap every year from April through November. Uh, since we're in Maine, we do have to deal with ice and marsh pools freezing over in the winter. So by the end of November, we typically have to pull these traps out of the marsh pools so that they don't just freeze in place. Uh, but as soon as that ice melts off of the pools in April, we're ready to start trapping again. Thankfully, we have some awesome interns and volunteers who make it possible for us to check these traps every single week from April through November. We go out to the traps, we count how many crabs are in there, whether they're blue crabs or green crabs. We have been catching green crabs in these traps as well. Uh, we measure the crabs, uh, make note of whether they're male or female, adults or juveniles. And we're also collecting environmental data in these marsh pools. So we look at water temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and this allows us to look for trends and correlations between environmental data and when and where we're catching these blue crabs. But all that is what happens during the trapping season from April through November but how cold do these pools actually get in the winter? So even though we can't trap in the winter, we can still collect environmental data. So over the last couple winters, we've been deploying temperature loggers attached to bricks that we've been sinking in these marsh pools so that they're sitting near the, the sediment surface at the bottom of the pool. And we come back at the end of the winter, pull them out, and it provides us continuous temperature data from throughout the winter, which is really cool. It does uh, in, mean that I have to go climb down into a marsh pool and waders uh, to deploy and retrieve these things. Uh, but it's really awesome data because it tells us what kind of water temperatures these blue crabs are experiencing over the winter. So how many crabs have we caught so far? Uh, this has been pretty shocking data uh, from this year. Um, we've seen a lot of variation from year to year uh, in terms of number of blue crabs caught. Uh, overall, since 2020, we've caught over 400 blue crabs. Uh, in 2020, we caught about 30 crabs, which actually was pretty impressive considering we only used three traps and trapped for three months in the fall. In 2021, we basically doubled the number of traps and the amount of time we were trapping, but we only caught 48 crabs. And then in 2021, we were really surprised when we deployed even more traps and trapped for about the same amount of time and we only caught 21 blue crabs for the entire year. So that was really surprising. And we thought, oh my goodness, I think these blue crabs are starting to leave. And then this year, um, 
our data is just off the charts because we're not even done trapping yet. We've been trapping for about six months with 12 traps and we've caught already 343 crabs. So way more crabs than we've caught in the last three years combined. So you can see there's a whole lot of variation going on here. Um, but for the next uh, few graphs, I'm really going to be focusing on 2020 through 2022 data, just because it's we're still trapping from 2023. So I don't have, I haven't fully incorporated this year's data into our analyses. Um, but this really just shows um, how many more blue crabs we've been catching this year, which is just really amazing. We've also seen a lot of variation in terms of where we're finding the crabs. So each year we've been finding blue crabs uh, in different marsh pools, as well as uh, the variation between sites. So we're trapping in two different marshes, the Webb Hannett and the Little River. And in 2020 and 2021, and I'd say also in 2023, we've been finding a decent number of crabs in both of these marshes. However, in 2022, we only found one blue crab in the web hannet for the entire year, and the rest of them were found in the Little River. So there's been a lot of variation, not only in what years we're catching them, but also uh, where they're located. And we're also able to look at seasonal trends. So in 2020, we we started trapping in September and we were at, actually able to continue catching crabs through November. But 2021 looked a little different. We threw the traps out there in April and we started catching crabs right away, uh, but we stopped catching blue crabs after September. And then 2022 looked even looked different again. So we put traps out in April, but we didn't catch any until July but we continued to catch those blue crabs through the fall. So there's also a lot of variation going on here uh, between years in terms of the seasonality of crab catches. So that raises the question of how do environmental factors affect blue crab catch? So in particular, we're especially interested in looking at the correlation between water temperature and the number of crabs that we're catching. Because again, this is a warm water species and it's likely the warming Gulf of Maine that has allowed them to move up here in the first place. So I was able to graph um, crab the number of crabs caught per week compared to what the water temperature looked like that week. And in 2021, we saw that at least in the spring, as waters were warming, we started to catch more and more blue crabs. Now, blue crab catch seemed to drop off before the water got much colder in the fall. But then if we look at 2022, we didn't start catching any blue crabs until uh, like mid-July. But then we see this almost a correlation between a decreasing water temperature in the fall and decreasing cap crab catch. So there's likely um, some effect of water temperature on when we're catching these blue crabs, um, but there's also probably some other factors at play here. So that's water temperature during the trapping season, but what about overwintering temperatures? So my hypothesis was that we would catch more blue crabs after a milder winter. So if the temp water temperature of the winter isn't that cold, it's more likely that blue crabs will be able to survive and have larger populations in the following season. So to do this, I downloaded all that temperature data we've been collecting. Um, and I was able to look at number one for each year, what was the coldest temperature that these blue crabs experienced? And number two, how many days during the winter was the temperature below three degrees Celsius? The reason I chose three degrees Celsius is because this is actually considered a physiological threshold for blue crabs. And meaning they just, they don't do so well <laughs> biologically when the temperature is below three degrees. 
And we can compare this overwinter temperature to the crab catch the following season. So each season we were using a different number of traps and trapping for a different amount of time. So I kind of standardize this by making it on average, how many crabs did we catch per trap per month for each of these years? And we can see that in 2020, when I standardize these metrics, we caught way more blue crabs than in 2021 or 2022, with 2022 having the lowest crab catch per trap. And I when I compare that to our winter temperature data, it actually lines up really well. So 2020 was the experience the mildest winter of those three years, and it had the highest crab catch per trap. Meanwhile, 2022 had the coldest winter of those three years, and they had the lowest uh, crab catch per trap. So blue crabs from these three years of data appear to be uh, more abundant after milder winters. However, this is only three years worth of data, so uh, we're going to need a lot more years of data to see if this trend sticks. So the plan going forward is to continue trapping um, and to continue collecting this over overwintering uh, water temperature data. So the trapping surveys allow us to look at abundance of blue crabs and their distribution, but we're really interested in knowing where these blue crabs move and where do they go to overwinter in particular. So in 2022, we conducted an acoustic telemetry study in the Webb Hannett estuary that allowed us to look at the fine scale movements of blue crabs throughout this estuary. So between July and December of 2022, we set up um, this array of underwater hydrophones. And these hydrophones are essentially like little listening stations. And so we set these hydrophones up throughout the Webb Hannett estuary in the main channel, in tidal creeks. We had some in the salt marsh pools where we were already catching blue crabs. And we even had an underwater hydrophone located in the coastal ocean right outside the inlet to this estuary. So we would be able to see not only blue crabs moving within the estuary, but also see if any crabs move out of the estuary into the ocean. In order to track blue crab movements, we took 15 blue crabs and we strapped these little backpacks on them essentially. Um, each of these little backpacks contained an acoustic telemetry tag. And the way this works is kind of like the easy pass in your car. So you can think of the acoustic telemetry tag as being an easy pass tag. And these underwater hydrophones are the toll booth. So whenever a crab uh, with one of these tags moves past one of these hydrophones, it sends off a ping or a signal into the water that is detected by the hydrophone. And just like your easy pass tag, this hydrophone is able to recognize what, uh, which crab this is based on its tag ID. And so using this data, we're able to look at how these crabs move throughout the estuary from July through December. So going from summer all the way into um, as we're approaching winter. And so I'm going to show a few uh, maps that kind of demonstrate the movements of crabs that we were finding. So one example of a blue crab, this is an example of a male blue crab, that he really just kind of hung out within the marsh pools all summer. But as we approach into December, he started to make his way towards the tidal creek. On the other hand, we had other crabs that did a whole lot of moving throughout the summer. So this is a, an adult male crab that was moving all throughout this estuary using basically all the habitats available to him. He even moved out into the coastal ocean and then came back again. And we can see that as we approach uh, winter, as we're moving into December, 
he's starting to head back towards the inlet of this estuary, possibly uh, to head back out into the coastal ocean. Uh, we also had a female crab that similarly was using a lot of different habitats in the estuary. And as uh, December approached, she was heading straight out into the coastal ocean and we were actually able to detect her out in the ocean with that ocean receiver. So this data is showing that these blue crabs are using a wide range of estuary habitats and also utilizing the coastal ocean. So it's possible that these blue crabs could be overwintering in the marsh pools, but there's also a chance that they are moving into the coastal ocean to seek deeper waters so that they have a better chance of surviving uh, a cold main winter. So we demonstrated uh, that these blue crabs uh, will often head towards the coastal ocean to overwinter, but that still uh, leaves the question of whether they can survive a main winter. Um, and we found uh, with one specimen <laughs> this past April, uh, a crab that definitely did survive a main winter. So I'm showing here the picture of a male adult blue crab that was tagged in the summer of 2022. And according to the acoustic telemetry results, this blue crab just hung out in the marsh pools throughout uh, July through December. And then when we put our traps back out there in April, the first time we go to pull traps, this tagged blue crab was in one of our traps, and he was found in the same marsh pool where it was last detected. Um, so that seems to indicate that this blue crab not only survived a main winter, um, but also likely overwintered within that marsh pool. So these blue crabs could be heading out for deeper waters in the coastal ocean uh, for winter. Um, but some of them might actually just be burying themselves in the mud in these marsh pools uh, to stay warm. So those trapping surveys allow us to look at, um, study the distribution of adults and juveniles in the system. But in order to have a sustained population, an established population of blue crabs in the Gulf of Maine, there has to be a source for more blue crabs, right? So we have to have uh, reproduction happening. We have to have the presence of baby blue crabs or um, what are known as larvae um, in the system to sustain that population into the future. So thankfully, we have been conducting plankton surveys in the Webhannet estuary since 2008. This study was primarily designed uh, to look at shifts and in larval fish populations, but we also end up catching crab larvae in those samples as well. So we're able to look back at these samples uh, and especially starting in 2016, we started to make sure we were keeping all of the larval crabs that were in our samples as well. So four times per month in the Webhannet estuary, we deploy a plankton net off of a dock. It's out there for about an hour, and then we bring the samples back to the lab. And we've got a great team of interns and volunteers that have been helping us to separate all these samples out and pull out any larval fish, crabs, and other invertebrates that are in our samples. From there, we're able to identify the fish and crabs down to the species level. And in particular for this project, I'm interested in seeing if we can find any blue crab larvae in those samples. And we have definitely found some blue crab larvae. So even though the adult blue crabs didn't start showing up in our system until 2019, or at least we haven't, we didn't see them before 2019, um, we've actually had blue crab larvae in the Webhannet estuary going back as early as 2016. So, so far, we've been able to find 45 blue crab larvae since 2016. There are quite a few in 2019 in particular, and we're still processing our 2023 samples, so, um, but there's a good chance there's more blue crabs in those as well.
So uh, what have we learned so far from all these projects? One is that we found that at least for the last few years, blue crabs have been persi persisting in Wells, Maine salt marshes. Um, in particular, in 2023, we're seeing much higher abundances of blue crabs. Um, and since 2020, we've found over 400 total adult blue crabs. In addition to that, we've been we've found over 45 blue crab larvae in our plankton samples since 2016, which are only going to help to uh, sustain that population. We also found that there's a lot of variation from year to year and across the seasons in terms of where and when we are finding those sam those blue crabs. And we also uh, were able to show evidence of blue crabs surviving a main winter. There's a good chance that these blue crabs are seeking deeper waters or burying themselves in the mud to try to survive those cold main winters. And it's also likely that a mild, having a milder winter will allow more blue crabs to survive. So, whether you're interested in blue crabs or invasive green crabs or other uh, invasive species or range expanding species, uh, it's really important uh, getting everyone involved looking for these different species. Uh, there's only so much us researchers can do. Um, so citizen science is just a really great tool and is really helpful for finding species in areas that we're not already looking. So how can you get involved in looking for invasive species or range expanding species? Uh, no matter where you live, you can look for local environmental organizations and see if they need volunteers, see if they need some helpers. Uh, if you're out and about, it's really easy to just download an app like iNaturalist onto your phone. Um, I actually use this when I'm out on hikes and I don't know what a species is that I've found. Um, and I, you can use this iNaturalist app to help you identify species when you're outside. And then you can also share your findings on that same app so that researchers and other people um, can see where these different species are located. And learning about invasive or range expanding species that are in your particular area um, is really important so that you can keep an eye out for those particular species. So if you're on the West Coast um, or the East Coast, uh, keeping an eye out for those invasive green crabs um, and then also looking for range expanding swimming crabs. If you're in the northern part of California, for example, uh, posting on iNaturalist if you happen to find a swimming crab in your area. You know, we were just talking with Zach Cliver before you regarding the app, Whale Alert app. So these two apps, Whale Alert and iNaturalist, great for gathering critical information from the public that can just all contribute to this data collection from so many sources that helps the scientists be able to analyze, study, and figure things out. Thank you so much, Laura, for this great presentation. Uh, excellent. Uh, we want everybody to know that if you've got questions, you can send them to Ocean Life Symposium at gmail.com. We are also live on YouTube and it's going to stay on YouTube, this entire Ocean Life Symposium. And you can ask questions there. We are just beginning to answer questions that people have been posting. So thank you very much for all the people posting on YouTube. I'm Leanne Lindsay, host and producer of the symposium, along with Scott and Tree Mercer, who you can see in our recording studio here. I'm going to put everybody back on gallery view. And we're just going to take a few minutes to talk about some things here, too, Laura. Uh, you talked about invasive species. You talked about climate change and the impact. And one thing we've detected here today that has been posted through some Facebook groups that we've discovered, there are some sea lions that have washed ashore because of the bacteria. I want Tree and Scott to talk to this. Mm -hmm. Well, first, and why? What's what's going on? There's four of them that just washed ashore. Laura, thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. 
Really? Thank a, you. Lot of, a lot of information. I, I had no idea about half of things you said yeah. about blue crabs. I really had no idea. I didn't know that they extend all the way down to Uruguay. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. People are always surprised by that one. <laughs> yeah. No, really, it was fantastic. Thank you. That was that was great. The knowledge that is, thank you. I know the knowledge that has gathered here for this symposium just blows my mind. I will let me remind people just for a second because we're on radio as well, and people are in their cars or at home or wherever, and you're listening online too. But Laura is a marine ecologist and researcher at the Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve in Maine. It's part of a network of 30 research reserves located across the country. And she got a BS in marine science from Ryder University and an MS from Mar in marine biology from the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. And she's involved in a wide range of research projects looking at the impacts of climate change on Maine's coastal ecosystems from shifting plant communities and salt marshes to the spread of invasive species to the range expansion of these blue crabs into the Gulf of Maine. And Scott and Tree have a lifetime of studying whales and seals. Why That's don't you good. tell the audience just quickly summary of Mindanoma whale and seal study, what co-producers and the creators of this event, the special mm -hmm. programming that we're doing today. Yes, Scott. Uh -huh. About 10 years ago, when um, we decided to escape the very cold Maine winters and spend, uh, we thought we started at three months out here on the beautiful uh, Northern California coast, uh, Scott said, you know, I, I, we have to do something. We want to contribute and give back in some way. And he discovered that we could see whales from shore here. We didn't need a boat-based uh, operation that we can be shore-based and still uh, observe the behavior and um, count, especially the gray whales. Um, and so we began exactly doing that. We began a gray whale census back in 2014. Uh, we observe uh, and count them uh, depending on the ocean and weather conditions. We do that uh, five to seven hours a day uh, during their migration time. And when the gray whale's not around, we're still out there every day looking at uh, any other marine mammal that might be within our view. Currently, the humpbacks are, are in our neighborhood and they are uh, feeding on anchovies and maybe other small prey fish. Um, so uh, that's how we got started, and um, we were very much inspired by our next speaker, <laughs> which is uh, in her, I think, 39-year uh, census project down in Los Angeles at Point Vicente, and Scott and Elisa uh, communicate almost daily during the gray whale migration. Well, thank you, Tree, and would you either one of you in these last few minutes before the one o'clock hour have some questions for Laura here regarding what she was talking about the blue crabs and the oh the plankton study too no yeah what would you like to discuss before we bring on our next guest Oh, I just learned so much uh, from from your presentation, and um, I, I found it very interesting that they're uh, digging in the mud to uh, stay. Is that for warmth? You said, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we we think that there is, and they do this uh, further south too. Is over winter they'll kind of dig themselves into the mud in order to protect themselves from those freezing temperatures, um, so that they can survive over winter. But we even see them doing it during the summer, which is really funny because they just immediately just dive under the mud and you can't even see them anymore. Um, so it's really pretty impressive behavior. Yeah, that is an <laughs> impressive behavior. And, and, and I guess I said a, a survival one during those uh, very cold, cold temperatures. And definitely. And, and, and interesting that you find the larva and when you do your plankton studies, the larva are there. Yeah, we, I mean, it's just incredible because we've been conducting these studies looking for larval fish. Um, and as soon as you start digging into the samples looking for crabs, you're like, oh, that's a blue crab <laughs> larva. That's not supposed to be here. So we've been able to, uh, yeah, find them all the way back to 2016, which is really interesting. So what are you doing now and where are you headed next? <laughs> um, yeah, so we're going to keep on trapping. Uh, we've got about another month or two before the pools probably start to freeze over and we have to pull our traps out. But uh, I'm really interested to, uh, 
yeah, wrap up this trapping season so we can tie all that data in with uh, previous year's data, because especially with the record number of blue crabs we've been catching this year, uh, I really want to be able to correlate that with temperature data as well. Excellent. Excellent. That's great. Thank you so much, Laura. We really you enlightened us tremendously today. Yeah, I'm so glad we went to that lunch and learn that day for your lecture and discovered you. <laughs> Really well, to find a lecture. That's right. <laughs> I'm glad too. Thank you so much for having me. This has been yeah, so you'll be great. Getting another you'll be getting another t-shirt soon too. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and that's Laura Crane. And she is the research associate at Wells National Estuarine Research Reserve. Her topic today was crabs on the move, monitoring the range expansion of blue crabs into the Gulf of Maine, coming all the way to us from the East Coast. We really appreciate your joining us today on this fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium that Scott and Tree Mercer of the Mindanao Whale and Seal Study started five years ago. <laughs> and we've been doing it on radio now and simulcasting to YouTube for about four years. Mm -hmm. And thank you both for creating this to bring all this talent together on one day for a few hours. We're going to go till 3 p.m. Thank you so much, Laura. We're going to say goodbye to you. From Hi, the thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and hi, Alyssa. Bye. Hi, Alisa. Hi. Hi. Good to have you join us. And this is Alisa Schulman Janiger. Is it Janiger? Yeah. Or Janiger? Okay. Janiger. Janiger. Of the American Cetacean Society in Los Angeles, the chapter uh, there of the American Cetacean Society in Los Angeles, the Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project Director and Coordinator. And Elisa will be discussing the longest running shore based citizen science gray whale project in the world, focusing on gray whale counts and behaviors, the trends over time, the 2019 to 2023 gray whale unusual mortality event, and extraneous species spotted from their observation point at Point Vicente interpretive center there in Rancho Palos Verdes. She's the director and coordinator again of that gray whale census and behavior project. And she's a marine biologist, cetacean researcher and educator. And she's the research associate with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County and co-founder of the California Killer Whale Project and their lead research biologist. She has been photo identifying California killer whales, archiving sightings and studying distribution, natural history and behavior for over 40 years. Alisa has been the director and coordinator of the full season shore-based ACL, ACSLA Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project since, and I have to turn the page, 1984, mm -hmm. operating from Point Vicente Interpretive Center and staffed by citizen science volunteers. You have so much more on your bio here. I'm going to stop there, Alisa, and let you take it away and explain some of the rest. Everybody listening, this is the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. I'm Leanne Lindsay, your host today, along with Scott Entry Mercer of the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study on KGUA Walala. Welcome to the symposium, Alisa, and we're going to change now so that you can be in the speaker mode. I see that you're searching. There we go. Looking for sharing that. All right. Now we're going to get underway with Alisa's presentation for the next hour. And our final speaker of the day is Tessa Foster. She's coming up at two o'clock. Okay, can you see the screen? Yes, and now you want to put it into presentation mode. So you want to start the presentation. All right, I'm trying to find slideshow. that. It's go to slideshow up at the top. Okay, I'm looking for that. Hold very on. top is next to animations, to slideshow up very top. Mm. Up very, very top. My screen is not showing that. This is my first time doing a virtual. Oh, okay. So if you can pull your uh, your whole presentation down a bit, you will see at the top it says home, design, animations, slide. Oh, you know what? There's a thing at the bottom you can use too. I believe it's the icon. And, and 
jump in tree if you've got your mic still on i think there's an icon on the bottom that allows you to just click on that and start the presentation it's on the right lower right of your screen and your monitor there elisa i'm looking for that lower right you're up on the left maybe on the wrong screen here um, mm. well i see the beginning of your presentation it says the gray whale census and behavior project yeah Seasons of citizen science. That's great. Yeah. So, but if you if all else fails, what you can do is just click to the next slide, and it doesn't have to be in presentation mode. It just fills the screen for our YouTube watchers. Okay. Uh, so you're able to see it though. We can see it, and we can okay. see it on YouTube. Okay. Wonderful. And I'm going to say goodbye and allow you to to finish your presentation for the next hour or 50 minutes. Okay. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Yeah, um, I'm the coordinator and director for the American Patient Society's uh, Gray Well Census and Behavior Project. This was a pilot project back in 1979 in Marine Land of the Pacific in Palos Verdes Peninsula in Southern California. And I heard about it and didn't have time to get involved in it. It just ran a couple weeks a year. And then in 1984, I thought it would be great to have a full season census rather than just a few weeks. So that's when I got into it. And this is a picture I took of a gray well right off of the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. And our research patio or observation site is right there, which is about 138 feet above sea level. So we have a great view of northbound and southbound migrating whales, as well as other marine mammals that use the waters here. So we've been doing this every year with a year and a half break for COVID shutdown since 1984 with the uh, American Cetacean Society and uh, also a, a research associate natural history museum. And as you said, with the California Killer Whale Project. So I wish we saw killer whales every day. We don't, but we have had some sightings and I'll go into that too. So we get a lot of visitors who are in a public accessible area. A lot of people come to Point Vicente for uh, just walking around, hiking, visiting the interpretive center, but we're also a well-known group that sits on the patio so we can get to educate the public what we're seeing. We've had public members end up joining our project of citizen scientists, teams of volunteers, trained volunteers who we watch from sunrise to sunset seven days a week. And um, earlier we get there, that's a better chance we have of uh, seeing the whales. This last year was our 39th season. It should have been our 40th except for the COVID enforced breakdown, which everybody lost a big gap in uh, uh, field science because we just couldn't be out there, unfortunately. So longest running full season gray well census using citizen scientists. And this season we were there from December 1st to May 25th for 173 days. And actually we had to close three days due to an extraordinarily high wind event in which our people were being, would have been pushed around is over gale force winds. So we never had to close down before and that was unusual. We average over 12 hours a day, over 9,000 hours in volunteer effort hours. We had 98 trained volunteers this year, citizen scientists who work in teams of basically between three and five people looking in all directions, showing a slide showing a very wide field of view and uh, keeping track of these whales. Out of these 98, eight of us are core volunteers, put in over 200 hours a season. I put in over 300. Those eight people, these anchors, contribute almost 25% of our effort hours. And we have 26 additional volunteers are almost 39% of the effort hours. So most of our team is composed of trained folks who have lots and lots of experience watching the water. A photo during our picnic day, a lot of our core folks and a lot of us, including myself, went through the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium Whale Watch Naturalist Program. I'm now an instructor with that program. So they hear about us there and uh, come out in the project. And a lot of people uh, both come out with us watching from shore as well as on boats. Some people get seasick. And so this is a great opportunity to do wonderful whale science without getting seasick, watching the gray whales migrate along the coast. So history of our gray whale census in the 1970s, just down the street from where I live, we had a couple of volunteers out at the Point Firm and Lighthouse area, which spotted gray whales coming close to shore. 
recorded sightings on chalkboard. Unfortunately, erased all the chalkboard and we don't have a data set of what they saw. But I remember them being there and showing little uh, slideshows and doing a lot of good public education. 1979 started the pilot project that this is part of, Marineland of the Pacific. And here we are watching from Marineland right in front of the pilot whale tank. And we were there until February 11th of 90, 1987 when they unexpectedly uh, closed the park and kicked everybody out. And then we had shifted the year before with a concurrent station at the Point Pisani Interpreter Center, so we continued there. In addition, we had some satellite stations for a couple of seasons out at Santa Catalina Island, about 25 miles off from where we are at Point Pisani, and then out in Santa Cruz Island in 1987. Spotting whales and recording there, we did actually see more whales at Catalina Island than we did uh, shore base going southbound, but that shifted going northbound when we had whales coming close to the shore. And a big surprise at Santa Cruz Island is that uh, we saw over 1,300 gray whales in three weeks, and 40 were mom calf pairs. And a lot of people have thought that they all migrate close to shore, but if you don't know you're going to have a calf right away and you take a shortcut, hit point conception, and take the shortcut toward Baja, and you're out in the Channel Islands, and suddenly you're giving birth out there, uh, those whales were, several of them were tagged by Stephen Schwartz and were seen to kind of go around in circles. So I'm hoping we didn't double count many of those 40 gray whale moms. That was really interesting seeing that. So just a map kind of showing where we are. This is the Santa Monica Bay, Point Dune, Point Vicente where we're located. LA Harbor, Marineland was right here. So we're only half a mile from where we started our project 40 years ago. Catalina Islands West End where we watched right here. Channel Islands are up the coast and Dana Point, just the orientation. Point to Sunny right here. And we have this point that juts out into the water. So we get whales coming from Point Dune across and make a close to shore often passing point here as they go down the coast. And same thing for going north. So it's a fantastic observation site for watching whales, particularly southbound, uh, because we get to watch them so long coming across the bay here. We have a near shore canyon and they come right through there and we get to see lots of other species too. Watching from the patio, looking in different directions, located here right by this cliff. Here, just a view to cross Santa Monica Canyon and looking south. And again, our observers right there. Sometimes we actually hear gray whales before we see them. We stand up and have to look down. We can be so close to shore at times. Gray whale going by southbound with us watching, and a couple of gray whales were located very close to the Point to Sunny Lighthouse. And so that's one of our uh, spots that we'll sail. There's a whale by the lighthouse. We have different landmarks to help point out where the whales are to visitors and to each other. We use binoculars with reticles, which let us know about how far from shore they are, and also compass so we can have the direction which way we look. The west side of the Palos Verdes Peninsula, outer Santa Monica Bay, we could spot blows from over seven miles away. This is from a view from Point Vicente, the our observation patio on the back patio. There's the lighthouse, Catalina Island here, the transect line where whales come closest to shore. So we will record where we first saw whales, when they passed the transect, and when we last saw them. It's 160 degrees here all the way to compass reading 320, wide field of view. We count them once they get about here, we track them because there's some coves they sometimes can go into. View to the south, the waves crashing here, so they come right across the corner. We have only a short time often to see them before they pass our transect, and a view to the north where we can have sometimes two hours before they cross the transect. Our observers on the patio, myself and three of our other team members recording data on sheets and a green note paper for keeping track of behaviors and of the positions of the whales, using spotting scopes, multiple people with uh, binoculars. After COVID shut us down between March 21st to 2020 uh, to the end of the season, and then all of the following season, we have protocols of having a stanchions between us and the public 
and people spaced out with smaller numbers of people out on the patio. We have an informational white board that keeps track of gray whales we've seen, the numbers from the previous year, and the other species that we have spotted for that season. This is what our data sheet looks like. We collect the sighting number, how many whales, were their mothers or calves, which direction are they going, and we do that in, as north and south, even if they're headed east and west, since we have a south-facing beach, because they need to be either part of the northbound or southbound migration. The time we first see them, deg degrees, and what um, the dis approximate distances using the reticle or mills in our binoculars, the transect when they pass the closest point, and our final reading. We keep track of all of our counts here. So if a visitor comes, we could say, okay, we've seen 40 gray whales so far. Our folks sign in here, and we keep track of gray whales and other species sightings here. And the weather, very important on the back side of the sheet to always know what the weather is, what the wind reading is what the visibility is. Is it rainy, foggy? Very often we have fog, clear, and um, the what islands we're able to see. So our protocol is to plot, track, and count them if they pass through our field of view. This is a picture I took from Santa Cruz Island. Looked like only one gray whale at the surface at a time, but there was actually three gray whales in that group. Travel direction, determine if there's any calves, behaviors with other marine mammals, interaction with people like boats and jet skis, which we see every year. Note any unusual markings, scars, deformities. If we see any skinny whales, which has been extremely important in the last five years of our unusual mortality event that I'll talk about later with gray whales. And the environmental conditions twice hourly or if they change with visibility, wind conditions, and basic weather conditions. So this is a shot I, I grabbed uh, last year. Fog is present, or this season was present during 58 of our 173 observation days. So it's usually between 55 and 65 days a year. We have at least a couple of hours in which fog has reduced our visibility. And you just can't count, you can't see beautiful visibility here and low lying fog along the coast there. It's really frustrating when you hear gray whales blowing and then you can't see them. We are also out there with high winds and rain. Uh, we don't use those particular counts when we're doing assessments like uh, the timing of the migration over the season, like papers I've done with NOAA, but we do raw counts with the public. Um, wind was blowing very, very hard, blew my weatherproof umbrella inside out. And this particular day on March 1st, there was a festival that was canceled due to the very high winds and rain expected, and we had almost a white squall out there. And we counted at least 101 gray whales that day. We find that sometimes the gray whales will come closer to shore. They seem to coordinated with the uh, first rains of the season in particular. Very, lots of white caps can impede visibility for us trying to track the whales. Rain of course can too, and we get bonus of rainbows, beautiful weather out here. So with our gray whales, there's the Eastern North Pacific population, which is, Almost all the gray whales we count are from this population. Unfortunately, the, the current count now is the lowest it has been um, in memory. It's just over 14,000 gray whales as estimated in February of this year. And that's extremely low from the mortality event that's been going on. They've been protected since 1972, were removed from the endangered species list in 1994. There's a, pop, a portion of gray whales that feed off of Russia. And there's estimated 220 to 270 of them as of 2020. This is over twice the estimates from the early 2000s. So that's a really great recovery story. Several were satellite tagged and all were found. Everyone was found across the Pacific and actually go down the coast. And when that was found several years ago, Russian gray whale experts looked at gray whale photographs from Baja San uh, Lagoons and recognized several Russian whales, which was super interesting. So one of the things I do is I take photos when the whales come close to shore and then share them with researchers and see if we can make any matches. The Eastern Pacific gray whales have migration route that's close to shore here. Primarily in the summer, they're up in the Arctic and Chukchi seas very cold waters, lots more food available there. There is a portion, about 230 or so, that are called the Pacific Coast Feeding Group or PCFG, 
gray whales that feed along from Northern California up into British Columbia, this area here. And we definitely have several matches with those particular whales. And there's a study going on right now to see if, well, they, they seem to have a little different body proportions and see if their diet might have affected their um, survival ability. So some really interesting stuff going on right now. Gray whale migratory pass through our area. Primarily, um, we, what we see, of course, is close to shore, but the primary path is actually offshore through the Channel Islands. That's where most of the gray whales go through, which makes sense because they're doing a shortcut to Mexico. The secondary path is the coastal path, which is what we get. And the third path is mid-channel, which uh, fewer gray whales use. The typical pattern for diving is three to five blows, diving three to five minutes. The longest recorded dive was of a female in San Ignacio Lagoon, who was not being harassed at all with a gray whale mom, and she stayed down 25 minutes. So that's the record dive, and undoubtedly they could stay down longer. I've actually seen them stay down for 18 minutes at Catalina a few times. Uh, definitely down that long and came up in blue 18 to 20 times. Super interesting. So we keep track of, we have different uh, people on our team. Someone will keep track of sighting number one and call it out whenever that sighting comes up and someone else for sighting number two. So we could keep track and not mix these up because we might have gray whales at the same time as perhaps humpbacks or fin whales coming through. And we want to make sure we're keeping track of the right species of whale, and there might be a whale that's a low profile that pops up that we hadn't seen originally. So it can get uh, pretty interesting sometimes, particularly when the northbound and southbound migrations are crossing in February. So gray whales classically have a heart-shaped blow, not always, but seen from the back, that's what we would love to see. We identify individuals by their pigmentation pattern on the side. That's actually how gray whales are identified. And that helps us keep track of how many whales are in a group. One gray whale might be all black. One might have a spot on it. One might have orange lice on it. One might have uh, be very pale in color. So you might only see two at the surface, but you actually can identify four different whales over time. So that's really important. A lot of them fluke or raise their tail when they dive, but not all of them. And many of them do have killer whale tooth breaks on the edges of the tail. There's a high mortality of gray whale calves, particularly of northbound gray whale calves, and some spots that gray whales have I've seen attacks are uh, in the Monterey Bay area, where I go for field season every April and May. We've only seen one documented attack in 39 years off of Point Vicente, which is really surprising. And so well, some of them have deformities, very odd looking whales. This was a rather famous whale named Quasimoda that I saw back in the early 1980s, and she was seen in Mid-February without a calf, a couple days later with the calf, we saw her May 2nd off of uh, the Palos Reyes Peninsula with the calf. That was the first time a gray whale was ever tracked over distance without using a satellite tag, just by using photographs. Photo identification is so important. So although gray whales classically have that heart shape low, these pictures I all took from Point Vicente. Here is one with the heart shape, often one side stronger than the other. This is a southbound gray whale who met up with three northbound grays. They all turned together and four of them surfed on a wave right next to our cliff. And then the southbound went southbound and the northbound went northbound. We never seen that before. Here is a very skinny juvenile this year going around the cliff. And here is a mom with a newborn calf and the moms often have very faint blows and they're tough to spot in the track. So this was super interesting. The very last, the 83rd gray whale mom, cow calf bear, and took a photograph and posted it. A Russian researcher contacted me and she actually recognized this whale. This is a photo I took from shore. She recognized it as a gray whale that's been seen a couple of times in Russia since I think 2011. So it was extremely exciting and they didn't know she was a female and here she definitely had a calf with her. It's the last photo I took, so it's really exciting. The gray whale photo ID catalog, I was on uh, one of my NOAA cruises. We we're out photographing gray whales at Pacific Coast feeding group, gray whales all the way from British Columbia down the coast and put together a catalog. And this is what we look for uh, is the pigmentation pattern right and left side and the shape of the knuckles, these bumps, these ridges on the back they have instead of a dorsal fin. 
So one good example is a Pacific Coast feeding group female known as Scarback, documented over time. She has had calves in many different years, 1995, 2001, 2004, 2008, 2014, 16, 20. Some years she wasn't seen off. This is off of Depot Bay, Oregon. She's gone up to up British Columbia, so we most likely has had more calves. She has a massive scar that could have been caused by an exploded uh, harpoon from Russian whalers, or it could have been caused by a ship strike. There's differing opinions on how she got it, but it doesn't heal. She's easily recognizable. I've seen her several times myself. For example, she was photographed off of Depot Bay, Oregon in 2017. Then I photographed her at Point Vicente in December 2017, just a few months later. Dana Point, uh, early the next year, with her big scar on the right side, you could see it more clearly, Oregon, six months later. Then off of Point Vicente, our area photographed her again, December 2019. Then COVID shut down, one of our observers, Greg Gentry, photographed her in April of 2020, and she had a calf with her, and we were actually closed down at that time, and the calf is really small. So this is extremely late season gray whale calf, which is very interesting. It looks like a newborn. They're headed north, though, uh, and you'd expect to see a couple months earlier with the southbound whale. Depot Bay, August 2021, and back in Depot Bay of June 2022. Good example of tracking gray whales using photo identification. This is a photo I took from shore this year of a whale that I was just going to photograph the below, and it came up and breached twice. So that was very exciting, a quarter mile offshore. My favorite breach picture from shore. That's our favorite behavior. This is another picture I took from Point Vicente of a gray whale breaching as a boat. It suddenly, a uh, speedboat came by not very far away. This gray whale juvenile came out of the water in one massive breach. I'm sure it was a response to the speeding boat. Did that once. Sometimes belly flops, and if that seems to be connected more with looking at the way, um, like navigation or checking what's going on, back breaches, uh, spy hopping, we've seen that, rarely seen, but we see it in our kelp beds. If you're entangled in fishing gear, you would not be stunted. Milling or circling. In a way that isn't entangled. In order to make the population more resilient, it would be and, uh, we could reduce or eliminate. I don't know. I'm hearing something else here. I don't know what that is going on. It's definitely different. Okay. Can you hear me okay? I hope so. Yes, you're fine. We can hear okay. you. You're yeah, fine. some other video popped up in the background. No problem. So we see milling and circling, kelping, playing in the kelp, and they can actually be feeding in the kelp on amphipods and sea slugs. They, their feeding strategies, they're called um, bottom feeder or mud grabber here, mud sucker but they actually have different strategies. They're generalists and they have short baiting that they're able to use different strategies and feed on over 85 different types of prey. So I've seen them feed skimming. This is a photo I took in Monterey Bay, skimming feeding on krill in April, another from the same day, a gray whale lunge feeding. Gray whales aren't supposed to lunge feed, but tell it to this gray whale who was lunge feeding on massive amounts of schooling krill. And then photo that uh, wish was mine, but a gray whale feeding on its side. Most gray whales feed on their right side. They, we have seen them feed right in front of us, seen them come up with mud in their mouth as well as kelp in their mouth, and they make big pits on the bottom. We've had gray whales lingering in the port of Los Angeles for the last five years. A good thing that we saw this year was not many gray whales seen, and none of them lingered for more than a day. In the past previous four years, we've had gray whales up to a dozen gray whales in the port of Los Angeles feeding for weeks. And these were very, very skinny or emaciated gray whales, which is a sign of what's going on with the gray whale population with this big mortality event, mud feeding, and that becomes a danger for possible ship strikes there. And they have different types of prey. Amphipods is their preferred prey that live in the mud, but they can also particularly like off Oregon, for example, feed on schooling surface groups of mycid shrimp, also krill on the top midwater or lower down. Krill can be down 400 feet. Zoea crab larva, megalops crab larva, and in Puget Sound, there's a group of whales that call the sounders. They're specializing feeding in very shallow water, sometimes almost stranding on ghost shrimp. 
we've actually documented a parent feeding on ghost shrimp off, not right off Point Vicente, but north of us off Marina del Rey, a whale sticking around for a couple of days and a friend of mine went diving there and there were pits and ghost shrimp there. And what we think might be happening in over the last few years, gray whales have been coming later down to migrate and leaving earlier going north, except for this year, they didn't appear to go north earlier, but what they might be doing is shifting from primarily feeding on the bottom of the amphipods to feeding near the surface on krill, going up further north to feed, perhaps because of the water temperature rises, climate change in the Arctic that's lingering and Amphipods are particularly susceptible to warmer temperatures. They have big die-offs. The gray whales may be struggling to find enough amphipods and may be heading further north, which they've been documented, and switching to krill. So instead of bottom-up feeders, they're top-down feeders. And because they're generalists and they could feed on many kinds of prey, uh, they should be able to survive where other species might struggle. But it's super interesting shift that we're starting to see here. Behaviors seen include mating and include courtship. We see gray whale mating and courtship activity all year long, but they actually females ovulate in November, December, and that's where most conceptions happen. They're, they're pregnant for about 13 and a half months and generally nurse for seven to nine months. So these are some photos of courtship and mating activity. This is a gray whale that was I saw that was so small, it didn't even know how to swim. Mom was holding it up and its flukes are all still folded up. We've actually seen one gray whale birth from Point Vicente. Unfortunately, it was before sunrise, so I couldn't photograph it, but there were dolphins jumping all around and a gray whale was throwing her flukes and we watched through spotting scope and then saw what looked like a big dolphin next to her and it was a calf and its flukes were folding and unfolding and it took five hours to pass us. It was super exciting. We saw 35 southbound gray whale calves this year. Every year we see southbound gray whale calves. That's not unusual. In some years, we think that there could be 40% of gray whales could be born north of Carmel. Uh, it's difficult to track the newborns because they're typically low profile. Mom doesn't want to be seen, has very quiet uh, blows usually. You just can't even see the blow. Here's a mom and calf near the kelp bed. Two cow-calf pairs traveling together right off Point Vicente. We see very large groups sometimes, 10, 15 or more gray whales. Our biggest group we ever saw, I was called, told it was sperm whales. And so I raced on a boat to go see the 20 plus sperm whales. It turned out to be the biggest group of gray whales I've ever seen. It was spotted first at the census, 23 minimum. I got flukes of 19 different gray whales. And this is one of them. I had called a friend of mine in San Diego and she was on the lookout and they spotted over 20 whales the next day, 18 hours later, she got flu pictures of the same whale. And I was going to talk about it at our Whale Watch Naturalist class when I went by um, a friend's, Diane Elk's uh, photograph of the same whale that she took in San Ignacio Lagoon. So these were matches from the same whale, which was super interesting just from flu pattern, which we typically don't do with gray whales, but in this case, it really paid off. Threats to gray whales include being hit by boats or behavior changing due to boat activity and also jet skis that harass them. This year we documented 15 boat and five uh, jet ski interactions. And we also um, look for scars like this on whales. This whale has killer whale tooth rakes here, boat strike, propeller strike here, and very strange alien from outer space. We don't know what this is. No one can identify what it is. Looks like a little shrimp dipped its feet in white paint and crawled all over the whale. We sent it to people all over the place. I've seen now three whales that have those little markings on it. And a harpoon wound, the whale I photographed off of Point Vicente from a boat has what's been confirmed as a harpoon wound probably from off of Russia. Killer whale tooth rapes. We, again, have only seen one attack. This is a female named Emma, who's well known in Monterey, particularly with two notches in her fin, going after a gray whale calf up in Monterey in 2009. She was actually seen with her family last week off the Channel Islands, and they were caught a couple of a common dolphin um, and were feeding on them. Threats of entanglement. We are on an MPA, Marine Protected Area. No fishermen are supposed to be fishing in front of us but sometimes they do. We try to 
call and enforcement's really difficult for them to get to us and do anything about it. We've got a line of lobster traps. Lobster fishermen put these little traps all the way across, all the way to two miles out. I've always been afraid of a gray whale getting caught. This year, there actually was a brief entanglement, not this whale, but another whale came up and uh, hit the buoy line and wrapped in a, in a lobster buoy briefly and freed itself. So no deaths there, as far as we know. We actually did see a gray whale caught in a gill net from the census back in March of 1985. Two gray whales went down, one came up. Uh, we had reported that and our observations of where gray whales are helped inform the people who make the rules about gill nets so that they changed gill net regulations so they cannot be put within three miles of shore because that's where we see most of the gray whales. This is one that was documented up and down the coast wearing who knows what from some kind of mare culture probably went down in the mud to get something and got its head stuck. And we, nobody could figure out how in the heck to try to get it off the whale. This one had been entangled. Mm -hmm. We've seen it a couple of times with really deep notches, got out and did not lose its flute. And that's this is the gray whale that I told you about that got caught in a gill net and then surfaced uh, a couple of days later in the gill net. So if you see an entanglement, you do not want to cut the gray whale loose. You call for the large whale entanglement response team I'm a member of that team. I'm part of the notification and uh, follow up and, and connect the observers with the people who are going to go out and rescue the whale. Stay with it, take photos, and call the no entanglement hotline, 1-877-SOS-WHALE, and report that. Stay with the whale, photo document it, take videos, but if it has a buoy trailing from it, don't cut it off because we need that line attached to that, which is helps us be able to um, have gear and be able to check out how the whale is tangled, maybe put a satellite buoy on it. But if people cut off anything visible, then the whale could still have net in its mouth, for example, and can die of starvation. We actually saw a calf this year, gray whale calf that had an entanglement in its mouth and was trying to nurse from its mom and milk kept coming out. And we didn't notice that until a video was put up a couple hours after we had seen it from a boat and we were not able to relocate it. We have some flukeless whales that have been seen over the year. And these are probably due to entanglements that so constricted the base of the flutes that the tail rotted off. We don't have any long-term photograph of over many years of a flukeless whale being able to survive. This is one I saw back in 1984. They can definitely survive over many months because we have documented that over many months along our coast. So this is an example of what our whiteboard looks like for public education. 292 gray whales we counted this year. Southbound, which is our lowest count in 39 seasons, compared to last year was 313, which was one of our lowest counts. 755 northbound compared to 814. These are on the low side, which isn't unexpected due to the uh, gray whale mortality events going on. Cow calf pairs, 35 uh, southbound, which is really great um, for southbound, and 83 northbound, which is a great big jump. We also saw fin, blue, minky, humpback, orcas, common dolphin, bottlenose dolphin, resource dolphin, false killer whales, elephant seals, stellar sea lion, and then we keep track of interesting birds too. So how does this season compare to past seasons? Well, compared to the eight of the um, 10 past seasons, we can't count the UME, the unusual mortality event years. We are definitely below the average of the eight, a good reason for that is that the population has plummeted due to this staff mortality event. So this year, our southbound was a record low. Our northbound count was the 10th highest for calves. Northbound whale count was seventh lowest and 18th lowest calf count, which sounds low, but is actually fantastic because uh, it's much higher than the previous several years. It's a good sign. So if you compare this last year to previous years, you could see it's still below the 10-year average. And the year before that, we had to stop because of, well, we were closed. The year before that, we had to stop because of COVID. And if you go back five years, you could see we're running well above it. So we've had big change happen in the last five years. Looking at our changes over time for our counts for northbound and southbound, the blue is southbound gray whales. We see fewer of them, partly because we're watching for fewer hours a day, but mostly because the majority of whales travel offshore. So you can see great big plummet with an unusual mortality event, northbound and southbound. This was last season, and this is this season, very similar to last season. 
for the cow, calf count for the southbound and northbound. Here's the southbound calves, which kind of mirrors the northbound in the peaks and valleys. But you can see right here was a great year, and then it plummeted with the unusual mortality event. Skinny whales can't do well giving birth to babies. And then the counts went uh, up just a, a bit for southbound, and it really jumped up for northbound, which is, again, a really good sign. How does this compare to past season? This season is in red here, and it's uh, really much higher than last season, but lower than the average. And for this is the most important thing is the percent of calves is much higher than it's been in the last eight years. So our total gray whale count was low, the calf percentage was high. This is how our counts are compared to NOAA's counts. And we have similar trends, although not the exact same numbers. In the lagoons in Baja, San Ignacio Lagoon, the last five years, lower mothers and calves, but the red is this past season. And again, the news is good higher numbers of moms and calves, and they look in better condition. Last year, first time ever, they saw a, um, killer whales in the lagoons and were thought to have killed the gray whale calf, so that's pretty scary. So the gray whale counts have plummeted. 2000, this year it's 14,000. Uh, 2016 was about uh, 26,000, almost 27,000. So this really dropped quite a bit using this NOAA graph and same thing with the calf counts. But again, this year there's some promising signs. Looking at the mortality, 2019, the first year of unusual mortality event, very high mortality, less the next year, less the next year, less the next year. And this last year was the lowest it's been in five years, which is again, a very good sign. And there were uh, 682 gray whale carcasses washed ashore, which sounds awful, but it is less than it was the last five years. Here's a gray whale that I actually photographed in the LA Harbor, one of the feeding groups of whales there. And then it was came up dead in Point Reyes. It was the healthiest looking of the skinny gray whales here, but it was considered to be emaciated up there. So we had another unusual mortality event in 98-2000. Uh, the gray whales rebounded from that. We do believe they're going to rebound from this too. A couple pictures of skinny whales. From shore, take photos and look for signs of a whale being skinny. This is where there should be a lot of fat or blubber. Uh, this whale is in good condition with a big fat pad looking from the side. This whale's got its scapula or shoulder blade showing, so it's considered in fair condition, but doesn't have a big dip. So we document the whales with a, with a big postcranial dip here and uh, consider that skinny. And we had a fair number of skinny whales this year, but not a lot more than the last several years. In Mexico and other areas, they use drones. We're not allowed to use drones from our site where they could document gray whale body condition. They're doing that again this year. So basic take home points about this Mortality event is the southbound migrations have been later, probably due to them staying up north longer, earlier northbound migration, but not this year, likely to get an earlier start on feeding season, more skinny uh, or emaciated whales, but fewer this year. This season's update, fewer skinny whales, lowest southbound count ever, and later northbound migration than before. And in the Baja Lagoons, similar kinds of things. Good news is more calves, and they've had their most, uh, cap, that, this is our most calf count, highest cow calf count since 1917, 18, which is really good. So to go quickly to some other species that we see uh, from Point Vicente, all of these can be seen off of California. So I'm gonna run through the typically encountered lens, common dolphin, which we see almost every day, bottlenose dolphin, which we see many days, white-sided dolphins, less often, and that really changes a lot year to year. Minky whales, not often, but not so much because they're not here. It's because they're hard to spot. Killer whales, humpback whales, not as much this year and some other years. Fin whales, a lot this year. Rhesus dolphin, a few this year. Our biggest year was 1987 when we had a lot of squid, their primary prey. We saw more rhesus dolphin than any other dolphin and blue whales. We might also see sperm whales. There were some sperm whales seen just this past week off the peninsula. Pilot whales, which you used to see regularly, but not so much now, northern right whale dolphin, false killer whales, and false porpoise. Also, we see California sea lions, stellar sea lion, harbor seal, uh, northern fur seal, northern elephant seal, and sea otter occasionally. Sometimes we see gray whales interacting with other species like this white-sided dolphin. And here's a fin whale who swam really close to where we had some false killer whales. So common dolphin, we actually saw them on 149 days out of 152. 
they can be in groups of over 10,000. That's our most often seen dolphin. For the uh, bottlenose dolphin, we had them on 141 days. Last year was 150. We see them both inshore and offshore. And we actually had a birth in front of our station a couple of years back. There is one that we have seen as called Patches, is a leukistic, has white patches on it, a bottlenose dolphin, very unusual. White-sided dolphin, we saw them 12 days uh, compared to 23 last year, prefer the colder water. Rhesus dolphin, we had them on five days this year, six days last year. They were seen further offshore this year beyond what we could see. Very odd looking with these scratches on their bodies. Uh, blue whale, right off Point Vicente, off of our site. Fin whale, right close to shore. This year we had blue whale seven days, no doc, uh, confirmed days last year. Fin whales, 83 days, sometimes a dozen a day, uh, 66 last year. An interesting thing this year is we had one unusual blue whale with a, a cranial deformity that had one global that didn't open, confirmed by boats. I saw her out there myself, matched to a female from three years ago, and she was confirmed on several days. She only has blow coming out of one blowhole, very unusual. We had this particular fin whale called Fluky. Fin whales don't fluke, but Fluky does. Very few do fluke, and we saw her several times. Uh, we can see Brutus whales or say whales. They are very uh, rarely seen, hard to confirm from shore. They've been seen right now at, uh, offshore here and they're tropical whales coming up from Baja, not unexpected because of the warmer waters. Humpback whale, 27 days this year. Biggest year was about five years ago. We had them 77 days. Back when I spotted this humpback off of the port of Los Angeles, nobody even knew what it was. It was so rare. People were guessing all kinds of species uh, in 1990, and that's not true today. There's very uh, distinctive markings. We could send those into a group called Happy Whale as they fluke up. They want everybody's photos. People around the world are sending, sending them in, and it's the biggest citizen science whale project in the world. They'll match your photos, and you'll get an email telling you where your whale has been seen. And if it's had kids, tracking them everywhere. Here's a couple of examples of humpback whales I've seen. So. I've taken photos from shore and actually identified a few humpbacks from shore. Minky whale, only one to three days. Again, very hard to spot. Small, don't travel in a group and don't really have a visible blow, but they're out there. Sperm whales, several times in recent years. This is a sperm whale we used to see in the 1980s. Every year from 1982 to 1991, we called Double Scoop, who was feeding, well, came in as close as half a mile from shore. We have near shore canyons that come close to shore, which allows us to be able to see whales like this that forage for squid along the canyon drop off. The last several years, we had a whale named Mango till 2013, and he was tagged off the Channel Islands, and the tag stopped working by the equator off the Lopovus. And now we've got a whale who was seen just this past week or so named Papaya, who uh, was seen with a couple of other male sperm whales foraging for squid along our coast. False killer whales, very rarely, northern right whale dolphin, pilot whales, and doll's porpoise. Killer whales is another huge project I'm involved in. Always been interested in killer whales, knowing who's who and what they're doing and where they're going. We have actually four kinds of killer whales, including three ecotypes of uh, killer whales. Killer whales aren't all the same. They belong to different groups. They're separate culturally. They're separate what they eat. They're separate genetically, vocalizing. So we have seen a group I named the LA pod. It was the only killer whale that we actually saw between 1982 off our coast until 1990. They were last seen December 1997, headed south off La Jolla. Nobody knows where they went. Uh, they, one of them killed a great white shark in October 1997, known as the whale that ate jaws. Eastern tropical Pacific killer whales come up from Mexico. There have been a couple of sightings in the last month. Uh, off San Diego of some of these. We've seen them off Point Vicente. Offshore killer whales, our first ones we saw were 1985. I saw the first offshore killer whale ever in California back in 1992 off of Monterey. Big killer whales are the mammal eaters, the most common ones that we see today. Southern resident killer whales, highly endangered. We haven't seen them south of Monterey, so we're not going to see them. We're working on updating our um, killer whale catalog, California Killer Whale Project, catalog we put out in 1997, constantly updating this. This shows the overlap of different kinds of killer whales off our area. 
ETPs from Mexico that specialize in eating dolphin off Southern California area, transients which eat uh, dolphin and gray whales, and offshore killer whales which eat the uh, mahi mahi and they um, eat large fish but specialize in eating sharks. So just quickly, the, they look different. The residents have a rounded tip fin with a flat edge on the back. We're not going to see them here. Transients more pointy and travel in small groups and ambush their prey. Offshore killer whales have rounded tip fins are really, really, really small. And they uh, can, we saw them in a group over 100, feeding on shark, foraging together off here. Pelagic sperm whale killers, uh, hunters, we call them. They're mammal specialists that are offshore that don't seem to intermix with our normal mammal hunting whales. Eastern Tropical Pacific killer whales, this one was uh, seen off of uh, Mexico way back in 1982. And this one here is an LA pod whale, which we haven't seen since 1997. This is back in 84 when I saw my first killer whales in our first month of uh, looking, counting gray whales from Point Vicente, and it was the LA pod. Very odd looking, some of them with small saddles, many of them with messed up fins. This one's eating a shark. This is the one that ate jaws. She's got a birthmark here, really unusual, traveling right off Point Vicente area. And this is the only killer whale attack we've documented. I was called because there's killer whale seen, went out in a boat, was approaching, everybody's all excited, and then they got very upset because uh, killer whales went and ambushed a gray whale calf and killed it and dragged it out to sea. And that's the only one we've seen, the only tack, although we have seen other killer whales. This is the group we most often see. This is CA-51 star, well-known killer whale to Monterey, extremely boat-friendly whales. She's brought her family here and other whales here. Here she is by hopping with her daughter, Comet. Back in 2013, I didn't know they had a, uh, they killed a common dolphin, was hanging out there. Here's her son, Bumper, who loves to closely approach boats. And I named him Bumper because he likes to bump boats. He's bumped my boat four different days. So that's his name for that characteristic coming close to shore, very curious, right off our oil islands. And this one is just a few years ago with the family. So they will attack and have different roles, different whales in different roles. There's Emma, someone will drown, someone will try to separate. And humpback whales have come in right off of uh, Channel Islands this week. 20 humpback whales came in and were chasing killer whales. We don't know what all that was about. We've never heard of so many doing that. We have one white cap in our population that was seen. Uh, it's the only killer whale sighting this year off Point Vicente. We named it Frosty, a uh, very unusual calf from the uh, CA216 group. And just winding it up here, a quick look at offshore killer whales coming off here in uh, 20, in 1995. We saw over 100 out here eating shark. There's a blue shark. She nursed her calf off here and there's a blue shark hanging over a flipper. The Eastern Tropical Pacific killer whales. This one right here, E163, has been seen at least a couple times this year. And this is fake news about this whale is helping this dolphin uh, get away from white sharks. No, it killed it, eating it for lunch. <laughs> Great whales coming off our area. We're looking forward to starting season number 40 on December 1st. Yes. <laughs> and sunsets are one of the perks of being out in this beautiful, beautiful area, staying until often watching gray whales right into the sunset. Census sunset still counting whales after all these years <laughs> and into the future with dedicated group of citizen scientists. And if you want to contact me, have any questions, any sightings of killer whales, any questions about gray whales, my contact is janiger at cox.net. Thank you so much for that, Elisa. That was Elisa Shulman Janiger. She is the director and coordinator for the Gray Whale Census and Behavior Project of the Los Angeles chapter of the American Cetacean Society. She is a marine biologist, cetacean researcher, and educator, and a research associate with the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. The list goes on. You're a co-founder of the California Killer Whale Project, which you were just talking about, and lead research biologist. And you've been photo identifying, archiving, and just, you know, studying killer whales and a lot of these behaviors for over four decades. And you are the director and coordinator of the full season shore-based gray whale census and behavior project since 1984 so you have like 21 years that you taught 
Marine Biology, Advanced Marine Science and Biology in San Pedro High School, and then 10 years as a marine biologist for the Sea Education Afloat Program, and you are on NOAA's Stranding Response Team and Large Whale Entanglement Response Team, and you have authored and co-authored many uh, many peer-reviewed papers on killer whales, gray whales, humpback whales, and pilot whales, and co-authored uh, different photo ID catalogs on killer whales and gray whales. Thank you so much, Elisa, for all that you have been talking to us about today on the fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. And again, I'm the host, Leanne Lindsay, and producer. And sitting with me is Roberta Chan, who does a lot of help with sightings of washed ashore sea life. In fact, we've had four today that have been reported here on our coast uh, near the South Mendocino coast. And we might talk about that in a second. I'd like to pull in Scott and Tree Mercer. Uh, if you want to end your uh, your screen share there, Alisa, then we can sit here and talk with you on YouTube. We're on 88.3 FM. We are on line at kgua.org. We're on YouTube. You can watch this anytime. So there's Scott and Tree Mercer, who are the co-producers and creators of this event of the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study. So Scott, Tree, what are your questions? What would you like to talk to Elise about in these last few minutes? And we've got Roberta here who helps with strandings and other. Uh, why don't you explain what you do, Roberta, before they get jump in? Um, I'm just a community scientist, just like everybody uh, out here on the coast. Um, and I help with the Marine Mammals Center with strandings of marine mammals. Um, also with Cal Academy of Sciences, uh, with collecting data on dead marine mammals out here and uh, uh, various different uh, uh, rescue and community science uh, endeavors out here. And she's a volunteer here at KGUA. So Scott and Tree, what would you like to ask or even Roberta of Elisa that we've got her here these last few minutes? Well, Lisa, how how optimistic are you that the gray whale population will uh, begin to increase again? Well, this is the first year in the last five years that we've seen some positive signs because we've gone, as we were talking about, anywhere from basically 27,000 to 14,500 gray whales. So some positive, some positive things to look at are 20 years ago, there was a big drop in the population, about one third of the gray whales died. And over the next 20 years, they all recovered. Uh, there wasn't such a sustained kind of heat wave going on in the feeding area as we are having now. Right. Gray whales are highly adaptable and they're known to be able to exploit food in different areas. Personally, I don't feel there's a ceiling on what the gray whales can eat because they feed all along the coast, as you well know. They're yes. not limited to one particular area. You're a great example. You thought maybe the gray whale pop, uh, migration started early, but it was actually foraging gray whales off your area, which no one had known before. And that was super cool. Um, because the gray whales can switch and they are seen this last couple of years, they're seen to be foraging in areas where krill is very abundant. The question is going to be if they are able to find dense enough schools of krill to be able to, uh, sub to support them. Because it's one thing if you're growing crops in a field, and you are harvesting those crops and you know you go out and corn is there and wheat is there and peaches are there, you know where to go to get them and they're not gonna be moving. Krill doesn't sit there. Amphipods sit in the, on the mud substrate. So with the krill, the swarms move around. They can move up and down and up and all over the place. So it's gonna require a lot more moving around of gray whales. Uh, personally, I, I think that blue whales may signify to other blue whales that they found a lot of krill. There's a reason why you have one blue whale seen one day feeding on krill, three the next day, the same area, and 15 the next day. And same thing with humpbacks. They, I think they must give off some kind of a yum yum call, like, ooh, this is really tasty, because that's going to benefit everybody. If they're fat and sassy, they have a better chance of being in good shape and being able to produce cats. So it makes sense to me that if a gray whale found a good feeding area, uh, it, they want to share that information. It's, it's benefit for the species. So if that can happen, I'm quite optimistic. And the signs of optimism for this year are for us, you know, more calves. So they right. definitely got more this last season. They were able to 
maintain some pregnancies. And it could be a lot of whales weren't able to have pregnancies, were able to do that this year because they've gone several fallow years. And that uh, the, we didn't have as many, quite as many skinny whales, although I was uh, tenacious about trying to get these pictures. I sure can't take pictures of whales further offshore or at night, but there didn't seem to be as many, there weren't as many strandings and the gray whales didn't leave early like they have the last four years. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced they, you leave, you come late and you leave early because you're hungry. Yeah. And if they uh, did not leave early, that's a good sign. So I think they will, that I think they've had periods in time in the past that before we documented this, that there's been ups and downs with the climate and also with gray whale food abundance. And I think that they will bounce back from this. It may take a while, certainly right. won't be in a year, but I think they will come back from it. That makes excellent sense. Thank you very much. You know, and it's extra warm talking about the heat. It was the warmest September on record, as they were announcing last night. Today here on the North Coast, it's up in, near 80. It was over 80 yesterday. It's just, uh, it may have been contributing to this bacteria. I don't know, but the bacteria is the cause for the strandings that they are finding today. The leptospirosis with the uh, California sea lions, a lot of them uh, ill uh, or dead washing ashore. Um, and about whales, uh, so last night off Pebble Beach, I observed three whales. Um, it appears to be uh, one calf uh, and a mother uh, because there was two blows next to each other and one was smaller blow than the other blow. Uh, so what's happening out, out there um, uh, today these days? Now, is that, that, that Beach in the Sea Ranch? Yes, the Sea Ranch. So Sea Ranch on the North Sonoma Coast, there's a uh, part of Sea Ranch that's called Pebble Beach. Yeah, somebody was asking me about that because there was a stranding. I was, just came back from Monterey last night mm. and there was a gray whale stranding that was being called a calf. 23 feet long. Okay, gray whales are born, most of them, like 85% of them are born between December and February. And they most wean, we think, in about seven months. So a whale, gray whale seen now is not going to likely be, unless it stays with its mother longer than typical, is not going to be dependent upon the mom. It's weaned. It's feeding on other things. So it's not like it's all by itself. And if there is a adult with a smaller whale, it's, it could be a calf, but it could very well be a juvenile. Because mm -hmm. the juvenile gray whales right now will be probably in the 23, 25 foot range. And a juvenile of anybody could be traveling with an adult whale. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it cause for concern. Every year we do see uh, people contact me, what's wrong with the gray whales? They're not supposed to be here. Every year we see them in October and November off Southern California. I'm sure off Central California and Northern too. We think a lot of younger whales may not migrate all the way to Alaska. Why go all the way up there and you've got less mass? You could find food nice places like, you know, Point Arena, for example, why go all the way up there and just stay along the California coast? So whales that stayed along the California coast or Oregon are more likely to be seen at this time of year. So it's no, no concern and nobody should be thinking what's wrong. Why does she have a baby now? There won't be any babies now. It mm. would be like a, a small juvenile. You are amazing, Elisa, it, but it is two o'clock now. <laughs> I wanted to add one more thing. Okay, sure, go ahead. Yeah, one more thing. I forgot to put on my presentation too. If you do get killer whale uh, photos, also um, can contact me at California at killer whale project at gmail.com. Send your sightings and send your photos to us and our team will match them up and let you know who you see. So wanted to make sure I had that in there too. Very good. And you can also email oceanlifesymposium at gmail.com too. So if you forget any of the other speakers or hers, uh, send it to us. Tree will take care of it. And thank you so much, Elisa. You're amazing. Your knowledge is just mind blowing. It's <laughs> you have such a you know a grasp on what you're talking about. And all the people today, thank you so much, Scott and Tree, for bringing everybody together. The knowledge is just we're very fortunate to have everyone today on this show. Thank you very much, Elisa. I appreciate them. I'm like you said, I'm contacting them all the time. What are you seeing? What are we seeing? Yeah. <laughs> and we've got Tessa to. Foster here too. Have you ever talked to Tessa? Because she's now a research assistant with the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study too. And uh, Tessa, this is Elisa uh, Janiger. I'll be talking to you. Tulman Janiger. Janiger. <laughs> And uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's been an incredible day here at the Ocean Life Symposium. And now we're going to move on. We're on. Okay. Bye, Lisa. Thank you. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.
and uh, everybody can watch these shows at any time. It's going to be one long show on YouTube. We may get to the point where we can cut them up, but right now you can you can zip through and find the ones that you want. You can also uh, listen in at KGUA. 88.3 FM on the in the car in your home. You can also listen online at kgua.org. Just click listen live at the top of the page. I'm Leanne Lindsay, producer and host today, along with Scott and Tree Mercer and Roberta Chan, who is uh, helping so much along our coast here with strandings and so many other things regarding wildlife, birds mm-hmm. with Diane Hitchwa of the Sea Ranch. And anything else you want to add to that, Roberta? No. <laughs> okay. And then we're going to get on into Tessa Foster. Welcome to the symposium. You made it, and we love seeing you. How are you doing? I'm good. Really well, happy let... to be back. Thank Great. you for having me. Well, I'm going to tell everybody just a little bit about what you're doing. You're going to talk about the uh, deep diving marine mammals. And you are our final speaker of the day, and you are now a research assistant for the Mindanoma Whale and Seal Study. You received a BS degree in environmental science with minors in biology and also human animal studies from the University of Redlands. And in 2020, you joined us here for the first annual Ocean Life Symposium, the virtual one that is, Mm -hmm. and you've been discussing observed effects of rising ocean temps on marine mammals, something we were just talking about up here in Northern California, but you've been studying Southern California, and currently you are in Northern California employed in the oncology clinical trials field, but uh, you've taken off today to talk about deep diving beaked whales. Thank you, Tessa. Yeah, so haven't been in the field in a little bit, unfortunately. Um, But I've been in love with marine mammals and cetaceans for years now. And um, we love the photo behind behind you too. (laughs) I think I've got another over here who's uh, signed by Uko Gorta. one of my prized possessions. <laughs> um, we love it. I, uh, well, we're going to step out now and we're going to give you the platform to show your presentation and we will jump back in towards the end of your presentation as well. And I'm going to put you on a view here of speaker. Okay. There you go. So you're the main one and we're going to say goodbye. <laughs> For now. <laughs> For now. Okay, <laughs> let me see. I've got presenter mode, and now sharing my screen. How are we doing? We can see the slide beautifully, Tessa. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. (laughs) So um, I'll admit that I'm especially partial to humpbacks and gray whales, but it has been so cool doing this deep dive into deep diving marine mammals. So none of this is my original research, um, but I'm doing a knowledge review um, because I learned so much and I'm really grateful I got to do this. Um, So in general, beaked whales are way less well known to most everybody. Um, especially the current scientific record. Um, So with that, I'll start with a disclaimer um, that because we see them so little, uh, there's not a lot of data and therefore it's difficult to uh, make generalizations about a group when it's a very small data set. a lot of what we know about these species have been discovered through necropsies of deceased individuals that have washed up on shores. Um, so essentially just keep in mind that the information I present today um, could end up telling a different story later on as our knowledge of these animals grow. Um, but that's science and I think that's pretty neat if you think about it. Oops. Oh, oops, there we go. Um, So here we go, beaked whales. Um, I do end up shortening them to BW on my slides because it's kind of a lot to write. Um, 
So beaked whales are part of the suborder Odontoceti, which usually you hear about um, mysticetes and odontocetes. You have the whales with baleen, and then odontocetes are toothed whales with just one blowhole and the ability to echolocate. Um, beaked whales are taxonomically classified under the family you see here, Zephyidae, um, and there are 19 species. I've circled some significant ones here. Um, it looks like there's a lot, but really they're showing family groups in terms of you've got a male and a female and a calf, if we're lucky to know what their appearance looks like. Um, so in the middle under the title, there's a Cuvier's beaked whale, which is kind of the star of my presentation because of its um, famous diving records and um, the fact that it's the most commonly sighted of all beaked whales. Um, in the top right, there's the Baird's beaked whale, which is the largest beaked whale species. Um, it gets up to 36 feet in length and weighs over 26,000 pounds, um, which is likely why it's the second most sighted species. And then top left the, of the Cuviers, um, there's the northern bottlenose whale. Um, I've circled it because it's got diving records that are in league with the Cuviers. Um, and then at the bottom left, I've highlighted Blaineville's beaked whales because it's the widest ranging of the beaked whales aside from the Cuviers. And it has a really distinctive jawline, which you can't see here on this tiny slide, but you'll get to see it in this next slide. Um, so the teeth situation um, is actually pretty interesting with beaked whales. Um, because even though they're considered toothed whales, um, all except for one of those 19 species has zero to just one or two teeth. Um, females generally have none that are visible. They might have vestigial teeth that you don't protrude above the jawline. Um, and then most whales, excuse me, most males um, have one to two functional large teeth on their lower jaw called tusks. Um, and they're thought to be used to fight other males during mating efforts. And then back to those Blainville's beaked whales, you can see them at the top on the top right of the image. Um, they have this really extreme protruding jawline, um, which helps them be identified. But um, Actually, at the bottom of that image, or the illustration, is a male strap-toothed beaked whale, which I'm not going to talk much about, but because um, they're still very rarely seen. Um, but they're actually the easiest species for scientists to accurately identify because of those really extreme tusks that wrap up and over the top jaw, the upper jaw. And it ends up making it impossible for their mouths to open more than just a couple of inches. And I wish we knew more about why the heck that is. Um, and I will get back to you if we ever find out why that is something that's helpful to the species. And um, then considering their lack of teeth, uh, researchers believe that beaked whales suck prey into their mouths. Um, no teeth to chew. And um, there actually might be certain throat grooves, grooves that assist in that sucking process. Um, and it might one day be a classifying feature of all beaked whales, but we're kind of pending on the data there to make that um, generalization. And um, a few more general and cool facts. Um, Something significant about beaked whales is that this family has the second highest membership uh, behind family Delphinidae, and there are new members that are still joining. When there's so little known about a group, um, it means there's still loads to learn and discover, um, including entirely new species. And um, to illustrate that point, we still, um, uh, there are still species out of the 19 that have never been seen alive before. They, we've only seen them as carcasses that have washed up. And then sometimes those carcasses are incomplete. 
uh, because they've degraded or um, decayed. And so the scientists who, or the people who discovered them and the scientists who process them um, actually have no way of knowing what the physical um, external appearance is of that species. Uh, we know they're out there, but we have no idea what they really look like. And um, this map shows just how widely distributed QBAs are, which pretty much shows they're in absolutely every ocean. Um, and uh, in general, beaked whales are found in every ocean on the planet. They're very widely distributed. Um, and the other thing that I thought was very interesting is that beaked whales are more closely related to sperm whales than they are to any dolphin species, despite the fact that there's the size difference or the size similarity. Um, so in terms of diving so deeply, uh, what are some of the potential advantages of doing that? Um, likely it's having access to this really unexploited niche and habitat. So there'd be less competition down there. And along those lines, um, being out of reach of most predators really. Um, then back to the Cuviers, uh, just because I wanted to make another disclaimer about how a lot of the characteristics that I'm going to be talking about are based on data collected on Cuviers. Um, so it, we can't necessarily assume that every single species is exactly the same, um, but we're doing the best with what we've got. Um, they also have the uh, extreme records out of all mammals in terms of the dive time, which was recently broken again in 2020, where a male cuvier that was tagged um, has, was found to be diving for three hours and 42 minutes, which is nearly four hours on one breath hold. And um, I believe the depth record was set at a different time by a different individual, but it was nearly two miles down. So there are some unique challenges that come with diving so deeply. There's the depth, there's the pressure that comes along with it. There's how long you're down there and how long it takes to get down there. Um, and being mammals, the big whales have to deal with um, extending their use of their oxygen and also the fact that it's entirely dark. Um, and I wanted to point out that uh, currently outer space seems easier to explore than the depths of the ocean. I mean, the ocean covers 71% of our planet. And yet Noah said in 2021 that 95% of it is still unexplored. And um, along those lines, there are some more detailed maps of other planets like Mars. Um, then there are maps of the ocean floor. Um, so generally knowing what the beaked whales are doing and how they're doing it, we can't even get down there to, to see what the conditions are like. Um, so there's a lot of unknowns there. Um, so with the darkness challenge, um, back to being a uh, Odontocetes, they use echolocation, generally natural sonar that um, gives these animals a pretty unique view of their environment um, without needing any light, <laughs> which is important when you're down in the dark. Um, and they're especially used to locate prey. And um, if you watched Finding Dory by Pixar, they called echolocation the, the world's most powerful pair of glasses. And um, you can see in this little uh, illustration, you know, bats use it, beaked whales and odontocetes use it. And this is also how humans do it with submarines. And um, another challenge 
just going to be a challenge throughout many slides here is um, oxygen consumption and the fact that they need to not they need to stretch oxygen over potentially almost four hours. Um, so beaked whales actually have indentations on their sides, like pockets, where they can kind of tuck their um, pectoral fins into, um, which makes their bodies a lot more streamlined with a torpedo-like shape. So just to do a really big contrast, you can see this uh, humpback whale on the right with their you know, um, large wings uh, for pectoral for both fins. And um, over here, the sperm whale, who is absolutely enormous, um, with those little tiny, little tiny fins that will tuck in and they look almost like a submarine. Um, and like I just said, they, uh, humans design submarines in the same shape to be just as streamlined. And um, as a general rule for, oxygen dependent animals, using less energy means using less oxygen, which is really essential when you're diving for so long. So um, then we have the challenge of the pressure, which I mean, the deep pressure would, it collapses any airspace, um, which naturally our lungs are full of air are full of air. With um, submarines, the way we um, get around this issue is just by making it, making it in a layer almost that's so very, very strong um, that it, it can resist the pressure and you keep the people happy and breathing inside in a controlled environment. Um, but beaked whales don't have this option and um, their lungs, it's believed based on necropsies that their lungs are designed to collapse and deal with that pressure by collapsing. Um, they can also reduce their heart rate. Again, a lot of this is, um, hi is hypotheses. Um, it's hard to learn things physiologically, um, if the individual is deceased. So just letting you know, you know, we're, we're still extrapolating, um, but I'll sound like I definitely know what I'm saying. <laughs> and, um, so they can slow down their heart rate and which helps with stopping blood flow. And they can even shut off blood flow like entirely to what areas of their body might be unnecessary for the dive at the time, like their kidneys and their liver. Um, and then there's the issue of the bends that you might heard of, may have heard of, which is to do with um, dissolved gases that end up in the bloodstream. And then when you hear of scuba divers, uh, if you don't want to come up too fast because the air will then expand, those bubbles in the bloodstream will expand, and that nitrogen that's forced in there, um, the bends is deadly. And um, to combat this, beaked whales, we believe, um, have their lungs collapse in a way that forces air away from their alveoli. Those are those tiny air sacs that kind of look like broccoli that are responsible for uh, transferring gases into the bloodstream. So we're trying to keep as much gas out of the system as, as possible. Um, so in terms of making that oxygen last longer, um, something really cool about beaked whales is that they can pack 10 to 20 times more hemoglobin and myoglobin in their cells than humans can. Um, you may have heard of hemoglobin. Um, it's basically the oxygen carrier um, to the cells. So by having so much of this, um, they're able to store oxygen directly in their blood and their muscles rather than in their lungs, which have been collapsed. Um, and this is actually what makes whale muscle and blood such a dark red, it's almost black in color. Um, 
There are actually studies being conducted on what allows beaked whales to fit so much myoglobin in their cells um, in an effort to actually make synthetic blood for human transfusions in the case of trauma and um, when there are uh, when there's a lack of blood in blood banks and things of that sort. So um, they've been studying actually sperm whale blood and um, it seems so far that what allows them to have so much of this myoglobin in, those, in their cells is to do with how rigid the protein itself is. And if you wanna read the article, it's really cool and just email me and I'll send it to you. But I'm not a biochemist, so I, I don't think I will go into it much further. Um, so as if the physiological challenges that we just discussed weren't enough, um, beaked whales also need to adapt to avoid predation. Uh, there's evidence that beaked whales get attacked by sharks, but by far their main predator is the orca or killer whale. And um, orcas do have the um, capability to dive deep to an extent, because um, there have been some individuals recorded at over a thousand meters in depth, um, but they then seem to face a really significant recovery time before they can dive again. Um, so it doesn't seem to be entirely built into their nature. So generally orcas are observed in shallower depths compared to beaked whales. Um, so then as co-members with orcas um, of the suborder Odontoceti, uh, excuse me, so since orcas and beaked whales are in both echolocate to find their prey, um, it can be an issue for the beaked whales because they actually produce the same click. They produce a click that's in a frequency that's detectable by orcas, by their predator. There are some species um, of odontocetes who have developed um, higher frequencies that they use um, so that they cannot be heard, but sea whales are not part of those. Um, so a relatively new study was actually published in 2020 that shows um, that they had tagged Cuvier's and Blainville's beak whales. Um, and it showed that typically on these deep dives, they would gather together, descend completely silently and continue on to foraging and looking for food using echolocation to locate that food. Um, but they only do this and they only use their echolocation and make noise at the deepest part of their dives. Um, they actually found that the group that's diving, their vocal time, like the time they were vocalizing, um, overlapped by 98%, despite the fact that generally their foraging activity is a, is a solo endeavor. Um, but then the beak whales would regroup again at that same depth, finding each other, using the echolocation to find each other. And um, then they would start ascending slowly and again silently, all together as a group, um, actually in what seems like a random direction. It might turn out that it's very intentional, but it looks random to us to end up surfacing on average a kilometer or a bit over a half mile away from where they lost, they made their last um, vocalization to make it more difficult for the orcas to find them. And the study calculated that these tactics reduce um, potential acoustic detection by orcas to less than 25%, um, which is a significant amount, especially because they're putting, um, they're taking away the time that they would be finding food in order to organize like this. So it really needs to be worth it. Um, because in general, this behavior is different for that beak whales do is different um, compared to other deep diving marine animals, uh, marine mammals like um, sperm whales or even elephant seals. And they tend to head to the surface just 
straight up vertically and as quickly as possible in order to maximize that foraging time. Um, and the difference could be entirely due to predation avoidance like this um, uh, study suggests. Um, but there is another hypothesis that the technique also mitigates um, the chance of getting decompression sickness and also to reduce the effects of that lactic acid buildup in their muscles. Um, I mean, no scientific data has actually been collected so far that supports that hypothesis that it's physiological. Um, but uh, as a scuba diver myself, I'm inclined to think that there would be a physiological reason um, because it's been so ingrained into my own diving training to ascend slowly to prevent getting the bends. Um, and uh, so that's, those are my thoughts. Obviously, and unfortunately, I'm not a whale though. So I'll just have to wait and see what we actually learn about this. Um, and I just wanted to interject here a little bit. I too am a, was a scuba diver, Tess. So I understand too about rising slowly to avoid the bends. Exactly, and we're supposed to have divers insurance so they can get us to the nearest uh, decompression chamber and- um, Right. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so you'd think, I'm not really sure how those other species get away with just jetting it up so, so fast, but that would be another really interesting discovery if we figured out how they did that. And maybe there'd be hope for us not having to worry about it either. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> right, we could learn from them. Okay, well, what's next on your presentation here? So uh, next, slightly sad, I wanted to touch on the um, general threats to beaked whales. Um, so as users of echolocation um, and sonar, they're very sensitive to sonar used by the Navy or the oil and gas exploration um, industry. Uh, I didn't want to include photos uh, just of, of mass strandings, uh, which after doing necropsies, it, it was found that the um, beaked whales did have the bends. Uh, they found the dissolved nitrogen in their blood, it was too much. And possibly what made the beaked whales uh, go to the surface so quickly uh, was due to that disruption and possibly confusion um, from the sonar. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm jumping back in just for a moment because yeah. we had some people talk about this on YouTube uh, for the Ocean Life Symposium. In the chat, there's one question why not use sonar? Well, here's the reason. You just explained it so mm -hmm. so well. Exactly. I mean, so the ocean is such an acoustic environment. It reflects and echoes uh, sound waves so well. Um, so it would seem really, really loud. I'm not entirely sure what the solution might be in terms of doing oil and gas exploration like that. Uh, because as I said earlier, these whale, these beaked whales are in every single ocean. Um, so hopefully we can come up with different technologies that bypass sound waves entirely. Um, and along those lines, there've actually been seen um, mass strandings of beaked whales after major earthquakes like the one that we saw um, that affected Tonga very recently. Um, and it messed with the transatlantic, those the, not power lines, but like the phone lines and all those cords. Uh, but when, but these whales are so close to the uh, bottom of the ocean. And I mean, I kind of assume that earthquakes would make a loud noise with all that earth moving. Um, so they're affected by natural phenomena as well. Um, beaked whales are also threatened by uh, ghost nets 
and entanglement in abandoned fishing gear, along with the long line, um, the long line fishing gear, which I know is a problem right now over in Maine for the right whale and, um, and with the lobster traps and things of that sort. Um, and I mean, they're go going up and down the entire column. I feel like they go, they live vertically rather than a lot of these other um, cetaceans who live horizontally and migrate and travel long distances. Um, well, beaked whales go long distances, just up and down. So, um, and they're at the bottom of the ocean where we can't see or get to or really study. And um, we talk about the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, and a lot of that sinks. There have been, uh, there have been um, necropsies done on cuvies that have found plastic in their stomachs and were possibly the cause of their death. Um, so we are affecting species that we, we don't even, we know hardly anything about them yet. There might be species who come and go before we've even discovered them. Um, I mean, they say space is the final frontier in, you know, some geeky circles, but um, possibly for us, the um, deep ocean is the final frontier. And, and I mean, that they find a lot of new species in Australia all the time, but for um, the ocean, we were, all the time we're finding new species um, in those depth, depths that we usually can't get to. Um, but generally there's been a lot of advances in technology that gets us more, um, more data than we ever did before. So we're able to, um, we're able to find the beaked whales much more easily because they dive deep for hours and then they come up for a few breaths and it's really hard to um, collect data on them or find them. It used to be just sheer luck that we came across them. Um, but now with technologies that would take a whole nother presentation to go into to explain, um, we're able to anticipate when they're gonna come up. And I mean, we know that since they like depths, uh, the Marianas Trench and various um, other ocean trenches will see uh, beak whales surfacing around there. So we're starting to collect way more data than we ever did before. So we're gonna be able to make, I mean, um, gather a lot more accurate knowledge. And um, I mean, if we're gonna, it's, it's really hard to know the, like the population status and um, how threatened they are by these, um, excuse me, uh, how threatened they are by um, these, these threats that I've just named. Um, but the technology is going to help us, uh, I guess, since we don't know how much conservation they need, probably a decent amount if they're like any other cetacean, um, we'll finally be able to figure out how we can make that difference, how we can make a difference with the sonar exploration and how we can make it not impact them. Um, it's, it's hard to devise solutions without knowing the baseline content to begin with. And um, so there's so much to learn and it is so exciting, really. I've had such a great time looking into this topic um, and I hope you've enjoyed and learned some things maybe. Uh, and I'm, yeah, of course, very thankful to all of my references, of which there are many more. <laughs> um, 
And thank you. Thank, thank you, you so listening. much, Tessa. You're doing a lot of work here. Oh, yeah. And we're looking, <laughs> we're looking at all your references here that you're listening and our, also our listeners online or in the car, wherever you are. Just go to YouTube and type in KGUA. You're going to see this Ocean Life Symposium. It's been going on since 9 a.m. today. And it's ending now with uh, Tessa's presentation that you've done so beautifully. It's yeah. such a joy to listen to your voice in the first place, the way you <laughs> articulate the words. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for all your research. Oh, my goodness. Scott and Tree, I want you to join us here, too. And I'm going to switch yes. it to gallery view here so that we're all be together. And you've um, given us so much information. It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> <laughs> a ton, a ton of information you just put on the screens. I'm trying to think of a question. Um, what I found very fascinating, Tessa, was the the, the pockets on the side of the whale for their uh, fin the flippers to go into makes them more streamlined. I had not, I did not know that about the anatomy of the beaked whales. They all have them. They do, and sperm ah. whales. Interesting. And, and what was it? The, oh, go ahead, Tree. Oh, I'm sorry. It just makes so much sense that, uh, you know, to streamline themselves because they do have to dive so deeply. Uh, I, I just thought that was quite a fascinating um, uh, uh, part of their anatomy. So I thank you. Well, speaking of anatomy, what is it that has the broccoli shape that you were saying earlier? The, um, I think it's alveoli. I'll have to bring up a picture. You all, I think we saw it in health class way back in the day of mm -hmm. seeing, you know, when you breathe in and these little round sacs that kind of look like broccoli will expand and then come back in again. You kind of see them as branches when you, mm -hmm. there are some really cool art pieces that show lungs as trees. And um, yes. Yeah. Oh, I know all about those alveoli having taught biology. So in humans, I guess in any mammal, that is the actual site of where oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged uh, between our lungs and our blood. So the little air sacs, the alveoli, are covered in these tiny little blood vessels called capillaries that are only mm -hmm. one cell thick. And it allows oxygen molecules to diffuse out of the lungs into our blood. And CO2, which is a waste product, diffuses into those air sacs, and then we exhale them out. Yes. You, yes, you clearly know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's exactly what the beaked whales are trying to not do. Yeah. They're trying to stop any of, you know, as much of that gas as possible um, from diffusing into their blood and being affected by the pressure changes. What what exactly are you studying right now and what do you want to study next? In terms of marine mammal topics? Yes. And work with the Mindanoma whale and seal study. Yeah, so this has been my big project. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'd love to talk to them about whether we want to continue it further. Um, maybe I do a follow up to talk about new technology or whenever there's new information available or another species pops up. Mm -hmm. um, what would I like to do next? I mean, mm. following the, um, the theme of deep ocean, I, I nearly did this presentation on whale falls. Um, which is when the carcass of a whale sinks all the way down to the bottom of the ocean and um, very slowly over years gets consumed by a myriad of species. Um, I think you can also look up on YouTube. They have somehow they've got um, cameras that show um, they've discovered new species because they've come upon this gold mine of food that is often so sparse at the bottom of the ocean. And um, I am into ecosystems and how everything works together and recycles and um, everything gets used. So I think it's really fascinating. Um, I mean, how much difference whales make in life and also in death. 
and how much they sequester the exchange. Right, yes. exactly. Sequester yes. carbon. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, back when you were, um, well, you were listening to podcasts a while back when you were doing that salmon work. I think you keep them going mad. <laughs> and um, you had told me at the time that you listened to um, one on what the subject you just touched on here now, did an in-depth study on what now, and also the uh, whale falls. And so I was glad to see that you carried through with those. One thing to be interesting with the whale falls is to get a list of the organisms that are feeding on those carcasses because they do them in phases, as I'm yes. sure you know. Uh -huh. And to, to get a list in a niche of exactly what they do until it's just dust on the, the ocean floor, if even that. And another one might be, I started a, I was going to do a talk at the lighthouse once, which we never got around to, on um, the uh, on a sonar that was being used for the um, uh, oil and gas exploration. And then we found that wasn't going to be done here, but I got quite a ways into it because it was going to be done off the East Coast. So I got interested in some lectures I heard there or from there. And then but I'd like to continue that if that's something that might interest you. Is yeah. it, it was the, um, we found at, at that time that it, it um, even destroys plankton. They run those huge arrays of um, guns off the back of the, of the barges and the, or the ships that are hauling the guns and they're blasting every few seconds. And for an animal, it's like having a, a cannon going off in your bedroom every few seconds. And, uh, but it was even killing, they found out in work in New Zealand that it's even um, slaughtering plankton in big sheets. So I, I stopped that because we never, I don't know if it was COVID or what, but for some reason, uh, the talk that we were planning on doing never happened. Just like the sea auto one I'm doing in December, three years late. Um, so yeah, if, if you would like to dig into that at all, that would be great. Yeah, let's talk mm -hmm. about that more. Sure, and I'm sure and let everybody know about the salmon work you did. I know you were loving that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, uh... I love my marine mammals more, but um, <laughs> these salmon populations are uh, essential to all kinds of things like our orcas in the Pacific right. Northwest. So um, do you want me to actually talk about all of it? I mean, not all of it, but like generally what it was about. Oh, the salmon work? Yeah. yeah. Oh, if you want to. Yeah, I was just kidding, but yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was the, uh, the ocean salmon project. And essentially at the hatcheries, the salmon would receive a, um, ooh, the name is escaping me, um, a certain tag. It's actually just a piece of wire yeah. that has a, a six digit code on it. Then they go and they live their lives out in the ocean and then they um, get caught. And then if they have this tag, they come back to the lab I was in I get to find the tag, I get to read it under a microscope, and it helps us keep track of that whole population and how the um, hatcheries are doing. Hmm. And um, yeah, generally important work, just yeah. not I wanted to, I also thank you for that too, mm -hmm. for all the work you did with the salmon in the ocean. Uh, I'd like to circle back to the noise in the ocean. That is a real essential problem that's disrupting the communication that these these uh, creatures of the sea have used for millennia and now the noise has increased to such a volume in the ocean and we were talking about how if you know some of the ships could even convert to electric that that would cut down some of the noise uh, I, I just wondered if anybody had a, a moment to address something along those lines of how we can eliminate some of the noise in the ocean in our all of our oceans mm -hmm. I mean, I was going to mention that there's two different issues. There's the um, the abrupt sonar and the oil exploration type noise. And then like you were saying, the uh, I think it's referred to as noise pollution from uh, all of the vessels that are out making noise all the time, the constant buzzing and like you said, it really messes with echolocation. And, and you brought up one I didn't even think about, but earthquakes. You know they're 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 incredibly loud. Yeah, up here, yeah, I can't imagine what they'd be like down there, right by the actual cracks. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Boy, that would be intense, wouldn't it? Reducing reducing ocean noise. The first thing that comes to my mind is um, to do with uh, being a conscious consumer and supporting things like uh, cruise lines that are going electric and um, things of that sort, you know, having power with where we put our money. Um, I'm not sure if there are any other more individual ways that you guys can think of to reduce ocean noise other than not not using them. sonar <laughs> yeah well but buying local you know we we you know anytime you probably place an order on amazon you know that what you receive is probably coming over here perhaps on a big cargo ship so if we could buy many more of uh, the products that we need locally um, I think that that might help. I, I think it was I learned today from one of our speakers, I believe it was Zach, that uh, shipping has increased by 300 uh, percent, you know, in, in this in this century. And, and can you imagine what that, that um, you know, sounds like to uh, mammals in the ocean, even fish? Uh, it, it's just incredibly uh, disruptive to their ability to navigate, to, to find prey, to communicate with one another. Uh, I think that ocean noise is indeed um, a real serious threat. Leanne, uh, isn't Cynthia Abbott working on a documentary now about that? It is. Uh, Three Ocean Advocates was her documentary film that appeared last year in the Sebastopol Film Festival. She won a regional Academy Award for it as well. And the next part of it, of Three Ocean Advocates is the component to deal with sound. Oh, so looking forward to seeing if she has a chance to talk to Michael Stalker, isn't it? He yes. the expert in ocean noises, right? He absolutely is. Yeah. He was here on the Ocean Life Symposium on the first year, and he came back, I believe, the second year that we were doing it virtual. Mm -hmm. Well, I would also want to point out another thing that Zach was saying that really caught my attention was solutions when it comes to ship strikes with whales and how changing the lanes by studying the pattern of the whale traffic and they could route around it or through it in a way that it was not as uh, potential to come upon a striking a whale. And there are other methods that they are doing, like slowing down the ships, which increases the chance of not striking these whales. And what were, there was another one, Scott, do you remember what that was? I'm not sure. The one you were just mentioning, um, that was in the Bay of Fundy between yes. um, Eastport, Maine and, Maine and Nova, Nova Scotia. Nova. And the, um, the original, um, the original uh, shipping lane went right through the right whale's feeding grounds, right in the middle of it, in the um, Ramanan Basin. And so that had to be changed, and it took years to convince them and to finally get it settled. And then you know what the whales did. <laughs> they started feeding somewhere else. And um, that went on for a few years, and now because of climate change, the, the, the right whales have vacated the area and heading up toward Quebec. And that's where there was a great uh, kill-off that went on because nobody was expecting those right whales to show up there. Mm. And they got they were getting nailed by ships. So the thirteen died that year mm -hmm. out of a population of three hundred three hundred and thirty. So, um, yeah, it's, it's constant problems with this. Um, um, Michael Moore, who uh, from Woods Hole, Cal Woods Hole um, Oceanographic Institute. Michael J. Moore. Michael J. Yeah. Uh, J. Period is his middle initial. Mm -hmm. So it's different from the filmmaker Michael Moore. Right. Oh, that, yeah, that right. Michael Moore. Um, he wrote a paper several years ago that people were skeptical about, but it made perfect sense. Uh, he studied all of the uh, ship strikes that we knew of and entanglements and compared it to um, a whaling industry. If we had a whaling industry in the United States still, if the International Whaling Commission approved an X, X number of whales for the United States to take, it wouldn't be as many as we're killing, incidentally, in nets and uh, in um, ship strikes. And that's all by our consumerism. The nets are from the fishing activity, um, different types of uh, marine animals we catch, and then the, the big cargo ships coming over. We see them all the time when we're out on the 
Every day around the point in the peninsula, see these huge ships heading in and out of San Francisco. There's um, yeah. also issues so, of, sorry. You know, Michael wrote a book about it after he put the paper out called We Are All Whalers. Mm. I don't know how many of those I bought because people asked me to buy them and get them to them. Yeah, you know, we gave those, a lot of those books away. It's excellent. We are all whalers. We all are responsible for what's happening and threatening the survival of these various whale species. And they are our built-in climate change prevention. Mm -hmm. They've been here for a long time, like we were just talking, Tessa, about sequestering carbon. Mm -hmm. You know, they're one of our best tools for doing that, if you want to look at it in that way, because of what Ralph Chami said that first virtual conference, he said they can sequester over the lifetime of a large whale, one of the largest whales that they can sequester about what 1200 tweet trees, 1500 mm -hmm. trees, what they do over their lifetime. So that is exponentially large uh, volume of what we've got right here in our oceans. Plus they're feeding the plankton, with their poo so then that's feeding our oxygen keeping us breathing so you study you were saying the whole cycle tessa mm -hmm. so this yeah. just fits right in with that now yes yeah, so if you want to look up there's actually it was um it was our second one here but our third third right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> it was um with the year we had 20 speakers here stretched out over four days and uh, everybody had an hour like you did today and ralph chami was on the international Mon monetary fund spoke for an hour on the value of a whale which we're going to mm -hmm. try to replicate in a couple of weeks at the point arena lighthouse in our talk, right. our next talk. and um you know ralph showed that uh, he proved that one whale one large whale is equivalent to 1500 trees and then he and then he went on and on about um um how to hold governments responsible for every whale they kill. Exactly. To enact some laws and uh, structure around that, correct? Yeah. And when you get your podcast going, I'm going to have Ralph on here again. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I was actually going to briefly mention that part of the issue is enforcement. Mm -hmm. As if, if boats actually did do the speed limit, how they should be or slowing down like the Marine Mammal Protection Act says they should be, um, it would really prevent um, prevent a lot of deaths. But that's I think one of the things he was talking small. about. Right. That's an excellent point. It's enforcement. And also um, I, the, the mandatory speeds for these ships, they have to be um, just that. It can't be voluntarily to slow down. It has to be made a, a regulation, a law to slow down these ships. I believe on the East Coast, they, I'm not sure which organization is giving out these. They actually give report cards to various um, cargo company, uh, shipping companies. They get a report card as to how well they do by not harming whales. Uh, and, and it actually means something to them. They proudly display that in their advertising. We, we This year we received a grade of A+. Plus. We, we, our ships did not uh, you know, uh, strike any whales or, or other marine mammals. And uh, I, I, I really, maybe it's my teacher background, but I like that idea of a report card and um, you know, a, a anything that we can do to make a difference. If it saves one whale, it is so worth it. That would sway my consumer decisions. Yes, Those exactly. Report cards? Yeah, report card. Yes, let me see. I'd support them. Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, do we know if that's done on the West Coast yet? I don't know. They've been talking about yeah. it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think it's come a long way. Is in 1984 or five when I was working down in the coast of Florida with right whales with the New England Aquarium. One of the team members and I went into a shipping company. It was Amy Knowlton. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, this is pointless. They're just going to laugh us out because I've been in the boating business and for quite a while. And sure enough, right. we walked in and gave the proposal of ship, slowing the ships down. And they all laughed and really didn't get anywhere. But at least put the idea in their heads. 
And now in out of the Brunswick, Georgia area, which is where we were, um, in the St. Mary's River, they have dredge and they are, they are slowing the ships down now. I mean, it's a long time ago, but it finally, finally sunk in. So it just takes a while. Well, we're coming towards the end of our fifth annual Ocean Life Symposium. Can you believe it? It's been it's hard to believe. It's been almost six hours now that we've been on this marathon talk with all these different speakers on. Uh, Tessa Foster, our last speaker here. Tessa, uh, you've got such an incredible background too already. is such a young woman. You, you got a BS degree in environmental science with a minors in biology and also human animal studies from the University, University of Redlands. And then in 2020, you were with us for the first Ocean Life Symposium, talking about the effects of rising ocean temps on marine mammals in Southern California. And we have a lot of warm weather going on mm -hmm. today. It's been not in the eighties quite yet today, but it was eighties yesterday. And this is uh, unusual. Here. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, and, by, I'm and, near to Spastopol when you mentioned that. So, so um, not far from us, just down the coast, a little inland, right? Just a little inland. Look at the, the rise in temperature. It's 95. And it was the warmest record, uh, warmest September on record. Mm -hmm. and there, I don't know if there's an exact connection, but the bacteria is out there in the ocean, and that's affecting some of the sea life here along mm -hmm. our coast. There's been a, about four sea lions that washed up today. That, um, the demoic acid? Wanna, yeah, uh, demoic acid too, yeah. but we, they were thinking this, these uh, deaths may have been caused by uh, leptospirosis. Right. Oh, really? Mm. Right. So there's a lot of things that affect our ocean that affects us in, as you know pe people that want to live on this planet. I think that you've done a terrific job, Tree and, and Scott, bringing everybody together today for this event. Thank you so much for producing this and, and bring it to me to help bring it together too. <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. This could not take place without your skills and your talent and patience. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm kind of a jack of all trades and a techie and uh, I can do I can juggle a lot of balls at one time. <laughs> but it's just uh, you guys are expert, serious experts in your field. And I I so admire you. And and it's been an honor to have you all on today uh, here at KGUA in Wallala. Thank you, Leanne. And thank, thank you, Tessa. Yeah, thank you, Tessa. Excellent, outstanding, thank you, Tessa. <laughs> outstanding presentation. Thank you. All right, we're going to say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye. What a great day it was today. Goodbye to everybody on YouTube as well. You can watch it anytime on YouTube. Just go to KGUA's YouTube channel. You guys take care.